good Friday, they say. Yes, indeed. From the island of Guam. On the west, or is it the east? <laughs> Eastward to the Caribbean and the U.S. Virgin Islands, south into South America, north all the way to the Pole, and worldwide on the Internet. This is Coast to Coast AM. Good evening, victims. That's what you all are, is victims. Right? There is no question in my mind, nor has there been for years, about the existence of ghosts. I know there are ghosts. And I think most of you, the majority of you actually, know there are ghosts too. So, every now and then we stop what we're doing, whatever that is. What is it we do here anyway? Anyway, we, we, we every now and then stop and we do what we call ghost to ghost instead of coast to coast. Actually, it's the same thing, just new name. And we tell ghost stories all night long. Now, you may hear it in my voice, but if you would like to see it in my face as well, then you're going to want to be enjoy absolutely certain you check out tonight's webcam photo, which I took just a very few moments ago. And I'll show you. I'll, that'll, that was, it'll absolutely demonstrate to you what my mood is like. You'll be able to see my mood like that. It's my webcam shot. You know, you go to my uh, web page. Go to program. No, no. You don't go to program. How the hell do you get there? Let's see. Go. Now I can't even operate my own computer. Here we go. Program and Art Bell Studio Cam. <laughs> yes, indeed. Took that a few minutes ago. That'll set the mood for you, all right. I would like to welcome WTSLAM in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Or is it New Hampshire? No, it's New Hampshire. Technically, it's probably New Hampshire, right? 1,400 on the dial there. Yo to Sean Baker, the PD. Little do you know what you're in for, Sean. It's going to get a little rough. <laughs> it always does on these nights. All we do is tell real ghost stories. And, you know, there, there are a few rules to what we're going to do tonight. Let me lay those down now, all right? Only serious, interesting, scary ghost stories need apply. They're all by phone. Unless you consider yourself to have, because there's as many of you out there as there are, there are ghosts and a million ghost stories in the night. So only the premium ghost stories need apply. I mean, they've got to be good. So that's rule one. Rule two is, for God's sakes, turn down your radio. Okay? But that's always a rule. Then there's rules about... Boy, we have a lot of rules, huh? <laughs> ghost photos. Yes, we will accept ghost photographs. As I think now, we have probably... I think we have the best collection of ghost photographs on the web. If not, then we're certainly getting close, you know, to the best. And that's thanks to all of you. The same ones that are going to provide the quality ghost stories tonight... I would like to provide, uh, have provide quality ghost photos as well. So only the good goat, ghost photos need apply. Now, what does that mean? That means any obvious cigarette smoke ghost photos are out. They've got to be better than that. That means a ghost photo with a camera strap blurring the front doesn't count either. 
Oh, occasionally we get the real thing. You know, last night, or the, was it? No, the night before. That was, that was the night before. Uh, somebody led me to, I think it's the fifth page uh, in the gallery. A ghost photos, a fifth page, I think. And that there's this picture of this God almighty, there's an arm coming right out of the television, and it looks, you know, if it's a fake, it's a really, really, really good fake. If it's not a fake, it's everybody's nightmare. I mean, it's just everybody's nightmare. You look at that picture, some caller led me there, and, you know, I slowly, plot, plottingly made my way there on my own website, and I got to that one. And I, oh, my God, look at that. I had, and I'd never seen it. I guess it's been up there for a while. But I hadn't seen that particular one. That's, that's a real heart stopper. Absolutely no question about it. So um, we want only quality ghost photos sent to webmaster at artbell.com. That's Keith. He is standing by to review and judge your photograph. And if it's up to par, if it's really scary, we're going to put it up t tonight. In fact, uh, we've already got new ghost photos up there for you right now. As the collection continues to grow, I, I mean, there is no doubt, there is simply no doubt in my mind about the fact that ghosts are real. They are. They're as real as, as we are. There may be questions about what a ghost is. Whether it's a human soul trapped here, surely sometimes it, it is, right? Human souls do apparently for at least a period, if not longer, <laughs> get trapped here on Earth. And then there may be the memory, the, the sort of... What, what, I don't even know what the right phrase would be. The, the, the memory, the, the uh, I don't know what it is that's left of a person when their soul has departed. But something that seems to stick around, maybe that means we, you know, we have more components than we thought we had. I mean, soul goes this way. The lingering memory of the person goes that away. I don't know. We ha we, uh, have you ever thought about that? We may have more components than you thought. Oh, this is really good for any program you do up here. This, this way of coming back into the show. It's good for any program you do. All right, so you know what we're going to do tonight? It's going to be ghosts all night long. Shall we experiment? You always got to get warmed up in this biz, so let's see. All we're taking are ghost stories tonight. That's it. You got one to tell? Good one? Fine. All other matters are verboten. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Art. Hi. Calling from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Canada, yes, sir. See you on CJ. will be here. Right. Anyways, I don't know if I met a ghost or a time traveler, but this is one freaky tale, let me tell you. Well, just sort of lay it out for me uh, real quickly, if you can, and I'll try and make a judgment. Every summer I go and I live in a tent in a campground. One night I'm sitting there listening to a football game, this guy rides up in an old Indian motorcycle. Mm -hmm. He had uh, skin that looked like leather. He had Texas plates on his bike. Uh, yeah, a lot of them in Texas look like that. <laughs> he had uh, two stickers on the fender skirts. One said, America, land of the free, as long as you do what you're told. The other one had a, <laughs> the other one had a picture of uh, Mount Rushmore and a picture of Reagan smiling with a, with a tooth that was sparkling. And it said, don't believe any of them. Anyways, we're sitting there talking. I gave the guy supper. If you're going to give me this kind of detail all the way through, uh, we don't have enough show to do this. Okay, anyways, <laughs> we get talking and uh, comparing countries, this and that. 
told me that uh, they never really did land on the moon. Americans never landed on the moon? He said that. Uh-huh. He said, he said uh, not only that, he said Apollo 13 didn't happen the way it said. There was no accident in space. I asked him why this would happen. They said, uh, he said the country's morale was down, Vietnam War. He said, if you look at when they, when they came back to the planet, the whole world stopped, sat on their seat, on the edge of their seat, and held their breath. Mm -hmm. He said uh, they done it for financing, and they done it for the morale of the country. Anyways, he went on and on. I asked him what he done. He told me he was a history teacher, and he kind of grinned and uh, huh. gave a belly laugh. He started telling me all these tales. And sometime I, I got up, I went to use the outhouse. I was about 200 feet from my tent. I came back. He was gone. I never heard the bike. I asked my neighbor beside me. He never seen the guy all night. Nobody in the campground seen this guy. So you think that he was the ghost of America? Really? I, I, I mean, don't know I, you know, teaching you, teaching you history the way it really was versus the present matrix that we all live in, right? I don't know if he was a ghost or a time traveler or what he was. I went well, to what, yeah, see, it's close enough. I, I, I'll accept that. That's a... That's a fair medium call. Ghost or time traveler, who knows? Matrix traveler, how about that? <laughs> West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Yes, sir. Oh, man, I'm glad I made it here. Um, yeah, I'd like to be uh, Mr. Art Bell. This is Mr. Art Bell. Hi, sir. How are you? What can I do for you? Do you have a ghost story? Yes, I do. <laughs> Uh, I guess it was back in, uh, 93, I was, I was standing, I was in a 7-Eleven, there was just three people in the 7-Eleven store, me and two people, two people came in front of me and they were going through the yard, you know, with the, the milk and the soda pops out. Yes, and, um, I mean, generally, yes, anyway, well, up against the wall, usually. But anyway, these two people looked kind of... They were dressed in right clothes, and they were just a few feet in front of me, and all of a sudden uh, I heard this voice out of nowhere. It says, only fools pay. <laughs> and I was just looking around, and there was nobody there that said that. And Maybe I, it was a voice in your own head. Yeah, only fools that's pay. Right. It was only fools pay. Trying to talk you into copping a soda pop or God knows what else, see? Could have been your own inner voice tempting you. You know, the, the little guy that sits over on the... Is, does he sit on the bad one, sit on the right or the left? Then there's a good one. But the good one doesn't get to speak up that much. That sounds like the bad one. Only fools pay in 7-Eleven. Take it, bud, and run. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Mr. Art. This is Frank. I'm calling from Orlando, and I'm listening to you on the Internet. Yes, Frank. Um, this is uh, quite a few years ago. I was actually pretty young, about six years old, <laughs> six or seven. I lived in Long Island at the time, and uh, <clears throat> I had an appearance of some type of apparition in uh, my bedroom window. Um, stays with me today. I remember it as, uh, as just like it happened yesterday. What do you rem what do you remember it looked like? It was a uh, definite female, a woman that appeared to be in her 30s. Mm. Um, I remember that it was generally all one color, um, like a, a greenish or grayish color. <clears throat> and the best description that I can give of her, I could actually see an emotion on her face. It appeared that she looked at me with compassion. Um, if I was to see it today, I wouldn't be frightened. But then I, I ran out of my room screaming. <laughs> mm. And uh, um, I, I never told anybody about this until about the age of 25. I was mentioning it to my sister. At that point, she told me that she had also seen the same, the same thing in our house. Oh, no kidding. So no kidding. whatever it was then was um, in the area of your house. And not just visiting you in particular, but... I, I would imagine, you know, it was um, <clears throat> not something that I saw all the time. It was just a, a one-time deal. My parents never mentioned anything of it. 
Um, but we did move out of that house about a year afterwards, and the people who purchased the house from us um, moved out about two months afterwards. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's related or not. But I don't suppose uh, when you sold that house that you disclosed to this happy little honeymooning couple that was going to get it next uh, that <laughs> there was an entity in there that would tend to show up by your, by, by your bed at, in your window at night. <laughs> well, at the time, I wasn't old enough to to have that kind of contact to give them that information but uh you mean you didn't I, say mommy daddy no. you've got to tell them <laughs> um well actually um i have a grandmother who was babysitting that that evening and she does remember me running out of my room screaming <laughs> but uh oh, yes, yes. yeah all right um i appreciate your call sir thank, thank you, you and uh, uh take care yes an entity well what do we know about this? We know that ghosts, particularly those produced by suicides, especially su suicides, and that, that is worrisome, seem to hang around the place where they committed suicide, where they took their own life. So I suppose had you had a chance to, you know, check into it a little bit, you might have found that uh, somebody may have done themselves in on that property somewhere. These days, you've got to disclose that kind of thing when you sell a house. But you and I all know, we, we, we both know, don't we, that you would never disclose that, would you? <laughs> and oh, by the way, you're buying uh, an entity as well. It's in the house here. No, you're not likely to say that, are you? So... I wonder how frequently such a thing is invoked. I suppose when there's an official prior history of haunting. Now, how, how would you establish that? Well, newspaper articles, perhaps? I can see an attorney using that. Uh, you see, there was publicity about this house. Everybody knows there was something wrong, very, very wrong in this house. A newspaper story like that. So who would want to have one about their house, right? Nobody. Then you couldn't sell it without disclosing what was really going on inside. I'm Art Bell. This is <laughs> Ghost to Ghost AM. The devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal. He was in a bind because he was way behind and he was willing to make a deal. When he came across this young man sewing on a fiddle and playing it hot, and the devil jumped up on a hickory thumb and said, Boy, let me tell you what. I guess you didn't know it, but I am a fiddle player too. And if you care to take a dare, I'll make a bet with you. Now, you play pretty good fiddle, boy, but give the devil his due. I bet a fiddle of gold against your soul because I think I'm better than you. The boy said, my name's John. Yes, Jenny was sweet, but was she human? I have a way of knowing things, and I know this. If you have a really good ghost story, and you don't try to get through tonight, something really awful is going to happen to you. This has burdened you long enough. This is your opportunity for release by telling your story. And if you don't, it's not my responsibility. You've been warned. On the first time caller line, you're on the air. How you doing, Art? Well, so far, so good. Before I tell you, can I ask you a question? Uh, possibly. Do you know what lineage the Vikings were? No. I don't either, so I guess um, it's not going to help. But, but anyway, I don't really believe in ghost art, but I do believe in demonic manifestations. 
I believe there's familiar spirits which pose as people that we've known, which are actually demonic manifestations. That is a really conservative religious viewpoint, isn't it? Right. Mm -hmm. And I believe there's non-specific demonic manifestations. And, and you, you believe there are everything that uh, would be that explains the th millions of stories we can get on this program and elsewhere, and photographs, all of it is explained by the devil. Well, yes, because uh, the Bible points it out about familiar spirits and, of course... And so, all right, fine. We'll, we'll go with what you believe your category to be. But, the, but that uh, doesn't mean... But I also believe that it... I'm not going to argue it with you. You believe it. I'm, I have no... Right. You know, fine, but, uh, believe it. Just tell me, have you had uh, an encounter with an evil, demonic oh, absolutely. spirit? Absolutely. But let me just say that I believe that they could be interdimensional be beings, too. That doesn't... Uh, because that, that's, that's separate entities. So you're a little open-minded. Yeah, sure. <laughs> right, sure. Go ahead, uh, tell your story. Now, this, this, this comes with a parallel, too. Uh, me, and, me and a friend both had this same experience at different times. It's pretty, pretty wild. Uh, not only did we have the same experience, we had been friends for several years, and then all of a sudden we found out while he was retracing his roots, roots that we had the same grandfather in Ireland, the same great-great-great-great-great-grandfather in Ireland, mm -hmm. which was very weird because we're both from different areas of the country, mm -hmm. and we met each other through work. But anyway, uh, what happened one night is, is, I'll get right to the story, I woke up, and what I saw was really, really scary. There was a big entity in, in my room at the foot of my bed, and it was huge, and it had horns, great, huge horns on its head. And I'll, I'll get to the, the clincher of this in a minute. But it had great horns on its head, and it had red eyes, bright red eyes. And it was just standing there in my doorway. Heat red eyes. Heat red eyes. Right. Well, what I did is I said, of course, uh, and, and I'm not, I'm not uh, really, I, I believe in, in the Bible, and I believe in Christianity, but I'm not a, you know, I'm not a big practicing Christian. But nevertheless, I said, in the name of Jesus, be gone. And the entity walked back through the door and faded away. All right. You know, the, and I've heard this a million times. Well, here's the I thing. Mean, oh, I'm sorry. There's, a, there's more? Oh, there's, it's much more to this. I, I was just going to say, though, and this will argue a little bit with your belief system, I know. But uh, you might as well have said, in the name of Art Bell, the paranormal talk show host, be gone. Well, that might have scared him, too. <laughs> it, 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 it might have, and it w certainly would have told us a lot. Now, somebody out there should try. Now, I'm not going to be responsible for any lawsuit, for any bloody pulps uh, uh, just sort of lingering uh, and soaking into the bed that are left after this is tried. But there, there's, a great, there's a great other part of this story, though. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, me and my friend, we practice coffee drinking at restaurants late at night and talking about things, including your show. Yes. We like to talk about your show over coffee, but anyway... I told him about that experience one night. I told him, and, he's, and I, he says, well, I had the same experience, the same thing. Yeah. And I said, did it have horns on its head? He said, yeah. And I said, well, something similar to you said, and it backed down the hallway. I didn't tell him one point of this. I said, well, tell me what it looked like. He said, well, the horns weren't really horns. It was like a Viking cap. Mm -hmm. And I looked at my friend and said, ah, the I, didn't tell, I did not tell you this part about it. Yeah, the I lineage said, but that's question. What it, that's what it was. It was a Viking cap. I didn't tell him that. We both had the same experiences. He both said something similar, and his, instead of, you know, just out of the room, his was in the hallway, and it walked down the hallway and disappeared. But it was like a huge Viking. I'm, I'm with you all the way, and uh, I, I can't think of anything that I would less like to see than something with glowing red eyes. That creeps me out. That always creeps me out. Glowing red eyes I know are bad. Very bad. No matter what else, what other form the creature has, the glowing red eyes, oh, they're very bad. And by the way, just so there's no mistake about it, if I ever encountered one of these things and I had to invoke a name to get it gone, you can bet your bottom dollar it wouldn't be my name. <laughs> you all want to try that, you go right ahead. <laughs> Wild Card Line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Hi. This is Robert, a KFI in Los Angeles. Yes, sir, the mighty KFI. Uh, I have been haunted by the ghost of a dead cheerleader. Whoa. Oh, not, not, as, not as bad as, uh, as, as a lot I hear about, sir. <laughs> oh, yes. She died quite recently. Uh, she, uh, she was uh, murdered by a photographer, and a photographer was sentenced and convicted for uh, uh, murdering her. 
Yes. You remember this story? N no, but, but uh, well, let's see, do I? I do remember. Well, anyway, it's not important. Go right ahead. All right. Dead well, cheerleader. Let's see. I had met her uh, five, five years previously, but I was haunted by her in 1973 when I was in the Air Force. I uh, would be in formation. There would be several thousand of us in formation going to tech school. And all of a sudden, the entire formation was called to a halt while all the big NCOs and officers came up to look at me. And I'm standing there wearing a cute little cheerleader outfit with pom-poms in my hand, and my airman behind me is rubbing my behind. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, after that, my life was a living heck, and I couldn't understand it. Uh, anyway. Well, uh, I, I remember uh, boot camp real well. And people like you, uh, if you were really in that outfit, you know, it's like you went home the next day. You were, yeah. that, that was a ticket home. So there can't possibly be more to this story. Oh, there's plenty. Uh, well, there can't be, except, except to say that uh, uh, in boot camp, a lot of us in our mind's eye saw cheerleaders. Mm-hmm. Every, every day, in fact. Uh-huh. Well, they, they, everybody saw one. And there wasn't a woman around to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, my commanding officer's commanding officer, former commanding officer, was uh, Brigadier General Chuck Yeager. Uh, shortly after that, he came down to interview me. Why? Because my commanding officer was uh, as friends with a Yeager, and Yeager came to interview because he heard about it. This oh, is about the time on. of the comet. This is about the time of the comet in 1973, and about the time Colonel Fox of Case it, ne it never, State. it never got that weird, sir. Never. Chuck Yeager had a lot of things to do with his time, but interviewing people who had donned cheerleading uniforms and basic training while getting fondled, uh, that would not have been high on his list. I don't buy it, Monk. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Mr. Bell. Yes. Oh, yes, sorry about that. A little slow on the trigger here. I'm not a Canadian, so <laughs> I really enjoy. It. So it must be Air Force night tonight. I'm uh, retired Air Force. Are you? I was stationed at F.E. Warren Air Force Base the last few months I was in, and since I went retired on active duty, they gave me a position babysitting in the dormitories. Uh, the buildings at F.E. Warren are extremely old. They're from about after the, after the Civil War. And I worked very late at night. That and, really is old. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a nice base. But as I was sitting there, must have been about 3 in the morning, I had a Buffalo soldier report in. And A, a Buffalo soldier? Yeah, full regalia, uh, buckskins, the hat, the pistols. Just terrified me. You mean just came right up to you? He came into my office. To Full my form, dad. not wispy or anything like a ghost, but just solid human? No, he was, he was solid to me, I, and then he left. He, he just disappeared. Vaporized, I guess, would be the best word for it. In front of your eyes? In front of my eyes. Uh, about five minutes after, everybody in the dormitory knew I'd seen him, <laughs> because it, it did scare me. Well, there are two types after an experience like that. One is, like you... Can't keep your mouth shut. Going to have to tell everybody in sight just to feel better about it. And the other is, I'm never telling anybody about this. Ooh. I'm going to go have a little nap, and I'm going to see if I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, lived uh, across the field from General Blackjack's old house, Blackjack Pershing. Yes. And there were reports of lights and stuff in that building, his old house. And I had never believed anything until that soldier reported to me. And well, here's... That was amazing. Here's something that I... Uh, I've thought an awful lot about, and that is bat battlefields. Uh, I, too, was in the Air Force uh, to pile on here. And um, during Vietnam, and a lot of people died. And, you know, there are a lot of ghosts on battlefields. And I, I've been, if, if, if a ghost is really a human soul still here on Earth, then there would be, in my mind, zero righteousness in the world and a very unfair God uh, to take any soldier who had died in defense of his country and keep him trapped, keep his soul trapped on earth? Yes. How ultimately unfair would that be? That would be a terrible, terrible afterlife. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Thank you very much. Uh, terrible indeed. So why then are battlefields littered with ghosts?
Hmm? What sort of God would allow that to occur? Uh, the only answer you can really hope for here is that, indeed, it is not the soul, but uh, some other component of what's left of you when your body is gone. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. Um, Hi. This is Anita from Harrisburg, Oregon. Hi there, Anita. Hi. Um, I have a kind of a freaky story to tell that happened to me. Um, actually, we've had several things happen to us in this house. Um, and anyway, we had, my husband and I had just watched a movie. It was the Amityville Horror. And we're getting ready for bed and went, went and got in. And I started getting this really icky feeling, like something evil was in the room with me. Yes. And my husband had gone to sleep. And we had our one-year-old son in the, in the same room. And he started fussing and fussing and went and settled down. And I was starting to doze off. Every time I doze off, I jump awake like something kept bothering me or you know and i had this real evil feeling and about three o'clock in the morning i had dozed off and i jumped awake again because it felt like something had taken a finger and run across my feet at the end of the bed and i heard a hiss it was a hiss <laughs> and you don't have cats no <laughs> we didn't have any cats hisses are really bad yeah but um, I had the light on all night. I was laying there on my back, you know, so I could see all around the sides of me. And, and uh, anyway, I was so scared. I didn't know what to do. So I said, you know, I said a quick prayer. And that feeling went away. And uh, was finally my And son, whatever it was went, yeah, went away. It, yeah, it did. And my son settled down, and I settled down, and we slept the rest of the night. And Well, you know, I guess we, we've got to ask, is, it, yeah. is that really... The power of God is the prayer, know. the uh, invocation of uh, the Lord's name. Yeah, but if Jesus, you know. uh, does, it, does that really drive these things away, or is it just the command, your yeah. command, yeah. Uh, your mental command, to be gone? Yeah, but before that, my husband had seen a big figure in our doorway of the bedroom. He just saw the, the form of it, and oh. uh, this was like probably a couple months before my experience. And then it went away, and then a couple nights later, he woke up, and it was right in his face. Uh -huh. And he's, he goes, what do you want? And it says, I want you. And he just laid there. He was just frozen. And then I woke up, too, and he was just drenched in sweat. My God, you mean you both saw <laughs> it? You both saw him? Or, or you, you, I when, when you woke, it, you saw him drenched in sweat, huh? Yeah, he was just, and he was all freaked out. And, and I, I... I that's interesting because I've never heard of anybody coming back from I want you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, <laughs> we moved into this house. Um, we had to clean it out, and upstairs there were stacks and stacks of witchcraft books, and we kind of think that had something to do with it. We do had... you know anything about the uh, former tenants? Um, not really, just that um, um, they were... Um, they weren't very clean. <laughs> we had to clean up the whole house. And they obviously had an, a big interest in witchcraft. Oh, yeah, big interest. And even my kids, when they were little, they slept up in that room where we cleaned the books out of. And my oldest son said he would see, well, he described them as white ladies dancing in the closet. And uh, he said that they made kind of a growling sound. Growling? Yeah. Yeah, so we've had a lot of weird stuff happen here, but... That's another thing that would be uh, really upsetting to me, would be a female growling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's, and my older daughter had seen him, too, at the same time. So I knew that they, you know, and they were totally serious. That's, they, that's even more serious. When you have, like, two people, two witnesses, two family members who see the same thing at the same time, if that really happens, time to move out. Well, actually, we had a house fire, and it burned the whole upstairs. You're it kidding. You're it. Kid. Did it really? <laughs> yeah, and so well, my husband remodeled the whole house, and we tore the whole top of the house off completely. And ever since then, we have not had anything happen here in this house. Well, so I wonder, yeah, but what does that say? I don't know. I don't uh, know. That's really, you know, that's another thing that I found really strange because, you know, after the house fire... We rebuild the house, and then nothing happens again. 
So you burned the ghost out, or <laughs> the ghost burned itself out. And uh, what, what caused the fire, do you know? Well, they think it was a, an extension cord, oh, yeah, but they're yeah. not sure. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's almost as good as swamp gas yeah, for UFOs. This house was built in 1940, so, you know, lots of things could have happened here. <laughs> but see, that sort of seems to say that whatever it was, was locked into that physical place, that physical uh, building. Uh -huh. And so what in the world do you suppose happened to it when it burned? I don't know. That's what I've always wondered. That had me puzzled because, you know, we were having so many weird things happen here and then all of a sudden it's gone. <laughs> well, a lot of people in the audience scoff at this kind of thing and they say, ah, baloney. Stories, made no. up stories, not made up, is it? No, no, none of it. I appreciate your call. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. No, not made up. Unfortunately, these things are real. I, I just, I wish that we understood more about them. And try as we might, it seems nearly impossible to achieve that. Once again, you might uh, take a glance at my webcam photo tonight when you get a chance. <laughs> it was my in-the-mood photo. Uh, well, let's see what lurks upon the wild card line. You're on the air. Hi. Hi. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Extinguish your radio. I did. Do you have a ghost story for us? I certainly do, sir. Let her I read. have. Okay. So uh, I was in my house in... Uh, Plymouth, New Hampshire, where I actually rented the apartment above an accounting office, and uh, at one night, at about 10 o'clock at night, all of a sudden I heard some loud noise, which sounded like somebody was down there slamming one of the doors, Then I heard what sounded like somebody going into a, a file cabinet and just ripping through the uh, files, like you could just hear papers yep. flying through, yep. and then... Uh, and I was scared. I said, well, I'm, I, I yelled down to it. I said, who's down there? And I said, I have a gun up here. And uh, no response. Just started tearing through me even more. So I went and I called the local police. They showed up in three minutes. The noise stopped pretty much right as they showed up. I went out and, uh, you know, gre greeted them. And they were like, well, what's going on? And they went and they checked all the doors to make sure nobody had broken in. And, uh... And then, you know, sure enough, they said, oh, there's nobody in there. They shine their lights in there, whatever, and they left. Mm. Well, the next morning, um, I, or later that night, I heard nothing more. Um, but then, then, you know, the next, the next morning, the accountant came in and said, I went down there and said to her, this was my landlord. I said, you know, I thought, I have to tell you, I called the police last night. Um, I thought, uh someone had broken in and been going through your files she's like well nothing's out of order and she's like that's really weird because i couldn't tell it felt like somebody was holding the door when i tried to come in this morning oh really is this our bell yo of course it is yes yes okay well, like somebody was holding the door and she couldn't get in yes sir while all this was obviously going on huh yes and then she went around the front unlocked it and went in and uh went back to that back door and that door was unlocked and no one was there. And I was looking out every window in that house to uh, make sure that uh, you know nobody came running out of there because it is a gotcha. college town. I've got to. I've got to go at that point. Thank you. This is Ghost to Ghost AM. Do you? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm Art Bell, and tonight we're telling only ghost stories. That's all we're doing. Ghost stories. If you don't have a ghost story, don't call. And it better be a good one, too. And we're only taking quality ghost photographs sent to my esteemed webmaster. If you have a ghost photograph that just won't quit, not smoke, not, you know, camera straps or anything like that, we want the real McCoy. Send it to webmaster at artbell.com, and we will post it tonight during the program. You can go look at them. By the way, I've got my own webcam. Remember when you were a kid? Well, wait till you see what the results are with me earlier tonight on my webcam. <laughs> it says volumes about my mood.
you know, I look at my own webcam picture and it scares me. <laughs> I did that myself. And I look at that and I go, oh my God, what's in me? You know? Maybe that's a good question. What's in me? You take a look at that. Do I have my evil side? <laughs> God, I look terrible. Absolutely terrible. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Glad to have you back, Art. Uh, thank you. And um, my name is An Andrew. I'm uh, in Castro Valley, California. Oh, yes. Um, listen, I uh, have a story that took place in 1980. I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, I don't know if you know where the town of Auburn, California is. I or... do indeed. Oh, yes. Well, I went to high school in Auburn there. Um, the high school was previously a university that my father attended. Just about a half a mile away, there was the Auburn Courthouse, very famous building, um, huge, and it had been abandoned for at least 40 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Right after the war, they stopped using it and moved the courthouses to a more modern building. And I was an aspiring filmmaker in those days in high school, and so I managed to get permission from the county clerk to, uh, to go in and, and do an amateur film in there, and I got the keys, and I went into the place with uh, two or three friends of mine. This was going to be what, just some histo historical film? No, no, this was just going to be kind of, a, kind of a romp, you know, kind of a fantasy little thing. I, I didn't quite have it worked out. It, we were kind of winging it as far as the film goes. Yeah. But it was just an interesting background once I got in there. I, I had no idea what I was in for. Um, as far as the story goes, and, and the architecture, too, was pretty amazing. Uh, we got inside the place. Um, if you can imagine, just a huge box, basically, made of stone, uh, three stories high. And then on top of that was a giant rotund, uh, much like a, a Capitol building rotund. Oh, yes. And on top of that was a, a little miniature rotund where you could get up a, kind, yep. Of a, yep. kind, of, kind of the crow's nest. No, I, I can picture it. I've seen the buildings. Okay. Well, um, we got in there, and, and the whole downstairs was all marble. I think it had been redone in the 20s in kind of Art Deco style. And there was dust and cobwebs everywhere. And uh, we, we started setting up our equipment and looking around. And uh, mostly we were using the film as an excuse to, to goof off because it was just such a tremendously interesting playground. You know, and to have the keys to this place, I felt like I was getting away with something. Um, but we started hearing uh, banging noises coming from the upper floors, and we hadn't been up there yet, so we didn't know if anyone was in the building or not. Mm -hmm. And so we went up and checked it out. Two of us did, and uh, we had our girlfriends there. They stayed downstairs. Uh, they didn't want to go up, and uh, there was no one there. So we came back down. Uh, we looked in all the courtrooms. And believe me, the courtrooms were, were lavish, you know, dark, varnished wood. Oh, even yeah, even modern courtrooms are that way. And, and all through the South, they stay that way. I mean, they're really old, as you point out, um, heavy wood, carved wood. You, you really have the feeling of old, sure. Oh, yeah it, yeah, it was beautiful. And in the downstairs, there were safes. There were these enormous uh, safes with brass and steel and iron. And uh, they were just open, several of them. And so we filmed some footage down there, and and uh, this banging continued. And so then we, after having found out that no one was in the building, the banging persisted, and we started really getting nervous. And and yet at the same time we were intrigued. We wanted to see something almost. You know, we wanted to go up and and have some experience. I guess at that age. Mm -hmm. And so we we uh, kind of sneaked up there and looked around and there was again no one there nothing there uh the electricity was on so we could work the lights and uh, we came back downstairs and i noticed that uh, all my papers my script in my little folder was not on the bench where i left it and i was looking around for it maybe i left it over where the safes are or somewhere else and so i searched for it couldn't find it and then um went back upstairs carrying all the equipment with us and i noticed that of all things my camera strap was gone someone had actually taken the camera strap unsnapped it off the camera the movie <laughs> camera and it was missing yes so we carried everything up into this uh, gigantic courtroom and 
lo and behold, on top of the, the bench, on top of the, the judge's table or desk, there was my book and the camera strap neatly folded across it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there was, there was only four of us. The girls were really reluctant to come upstairs at all. And so there was me and my friend, and I would have noticed if either of us had been carrying the book or the camera strap. And um, I went back down and asked the girls, you know, how did the camera strap get off of the camera? And they said, oh, we don't know. We, we've just been sitting here the whole time. They were down there, you know, having sodas and eating food or whatever. And so I'm like, okay. So we went back upstairs. And we had turned off all the lights because we wanted to see uh, if we could do f filming in the dark, you know, with the, the present light coming in through the windows. Only the young and stupid. Well, you know. I mean, after all this, you're turning off the lights. All right. right. All right, go ahead. Okay, so we, we go back upstairs, and, and uh, the light in the one courtroom is on. Now, I, I didn't think anything of it because, who knows, my, my friend could have gone back up there and turned it on, whatever. Sure. So we're in the courtroom, the light is on, uh, I'm filming a little footage, and then the banging happens again. <laughs> so all of us go downstairs, hmm. and, and the girls want to leave. They, they don't want any part of it now. They're, they're scared, because we've already told them there's no one here. Proving again, girls are smarter than boys. <laughs> pretty, pretty much true. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, adventure kicks in, and, and so we really wanted to know what was happening. What, what you call adventure is actually... Stupidity. Uh, stupidity and youthful testosterone running out sure. of control. Anyway, so sure. fine, you, you go. Um, well, the girls decided to go, and, and it was, you know, the lunch hour that we had, and that was pretty much over. So being studious individuals, they went back to school, and, and we stayed there, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, on, the, on the downstairs floor, there were cells, holding cells. Ah, uh, made of, that's right. Know, there would be cells, wouldn't there, in a in a uh, old courthouse? Well, sure. there sure were, and um, a couple of them had doors at both ends. They were like long, narrow cells with a door at one end, iron bar grates, and a gotcha. door at the other end. Gotcha. Well, we went inside one of these cells, made sure that it couldn't lock. There was no lock on it, and the other end was wide open. We walked in. The door behind us slammed shut. <laughs> for no apparent reason. <laughs> yes, I've and seen so that. our instant reaction was to run like the Dickens and go out the other end. Yep. Before it slammed shut. I mean, we were terrified at that point. And so you made a dash for the other side. We made a dash for the other side. We got out oh. and entered into a different part of, of the courthouse, and circled back around to where we'd started, and it was open as if it had never happened. Uh -huh. So let me guess. You went back in. Well, no, we didn't go back into the cell. At this point, it was it had become like a game. You know, we were just waiting to see what the next thing was that was going to happen. And we couldn't let it go. I mean, <laughs> we weren't seeing anything. We weren't hearing voices or anything. It, it, we were just convinced that somebody's playing with us. Yeah, well, they, these kind of games in the movies end up with dismembered bodies. Anyway, anything else? Well, there was one final punctuation that, that made us all never go back. And that happened right outside the building in broad daylight, probably 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Up on top of the building, there were four statues. And they were the, the typical statue of justice holding right. the scales and the right. sword. Gotcha. Uh, except they weren't blindfolded. They just had their eyes closed. Right. Four women on the, the cardinal points of the compass gotcha. on top. Um, we were approaching the building just the two of us, my friend Aaron and myself. Mm -hmm. We looked up. We were just about to go in the front door. I had the keys in my hand. We looked up at the statue, and her eyes were open. <laughs> and then they closed. <laughs> and they closed while you watched? They closed while we watched. <laughs> and uh... we looked at each other, and we literally did a double take. We looked back up at the statue because yep. we both recognized that yep. we both had seen it. Yep. And we looked back up, and, and... her eyes were shut. Uh-huh. And that was it. We turned around thank, and went right thank back God. to school. The first smart move you made. <laughs> uh, that's some story, all right. Thank you very much. Okay, all right. Yeah, take care. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, when you look up at a statue and the eye opens and then closes, it's really time to go. I, I, I bought the whole thing, and uh, the only thing that could have caused me to reject that entire story would be 
if they'd have, you know, climbed up to investigate the statue or gone in the house, that would have been too much for me. But I'll, I'll buy what he gave. That wasn't bad. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. 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 Hello, are you talking to me? Yes, I'm talking to you. Oh, there you go. Where are you? I'm on. I'm on um, uh, Long Island. All right. New York. Uh, this is Russ. This is my first time call. And uh, I, have, uh, I have something that happened to me when I was four. I'm 47 now. Okay. And um, what happened was I was running around the house after my sister. My sister was eight. I was four. And I couldn't, I couldn't catch up to her. And she ran down the basement stairs. I ran down there after her. And she's running around the basement, and she's laughing, and I'm trying to catch up to her. And as I was trying, as I was trying to get her, um, the basement, I saw the basement door open. And so I, I said, down the heck with it, you know, and I ran up the basement steps to go outside. And when I got to the top of the steps, I noticed my sister was in the backyard playing. And I looked down the stairs, and I said, well, she's out there playing, then... Who's laughing downstairs? But, you know, at four years old, you know, who really, you know, thinks of anything scary? So, yeah, of course not. You don't. You know, so then I just went outside and I, um, I continued to play. Uh, that was the first thing that happened. Um, and as I, as I got older, uh, my father um, would yell up the stairs at me and wake me up around 2 o'clock in the morning and say, What are you doing up there? Get to sleep. So I said, you just woke me up. So, um, so something was going on around you. He said you he here. heard walking around. He says, you're walking around up there. I said, I'm not walking around. I said, you just woke me up. So now years go by, and I'm in the kitchen, and he's in bed sleeping, and my brother is upstairs sleeping now in that room. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and I heard walking around. And I, I went by the stairs, and I says, Jimmy, what are you doing what are you doing? You know, so I went upstairs, and my brother was sound asleep. So I, I got a chill one up my back, and I says, geez, this is what my father's been hearing all these years, you know? There you are. And, uh, and so that, that's been going on for, you know, that happened. That, that went on for quite a few years. Have you ever seen anything? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Scared the hell out of me, too. I was, um, oh, I was around 15, I, I would think. And we had a whole, um, we, had a, we had company over the house. It was a party for some reason. I don't know what it was. But anyway, there was a lot of people in the house. And I was coming out of the bathroom. And directly across from the bathroom is my mother's bedroom, mm -hmm. you know, my parents' bedroom. And um, so as, as, a, you know, as I opened the door to, to come out, I saw a uh, woman standing in the uh, bedroom at the edge of the bed in a long white gown. Um, I couldn't make the face out, but she was, um, it was, it was just beautiful. I, that's all I can remember. It was just beautiful. And I went into the kitchen and I said to my mother, I says, um, oh, who's the lady inside in the bedroom with a long white gown on? This and sometimes she, could be a really bad thing to go tell mom. Well, <laughs> well, she <laughs> any, said, any, anyway, I'm, yeah, yeah, well, she said, uh, I know what you're saying to bride and all that stuff, but no, um. Yeah, she, she says, no, there's nobody here, and there's no one in the house with a long white gown on. So I says, I'm telling you, there's someone in your bedroom there. She's standing there at the edge of the bed, and she's looking out towards the hallway. And uh, so we went in there, and, of course, there was nobody in there. And, I, and from that point, whenever, every, whenever I went past her door, I would never look in. Thank you. But, um, you know, because I did not want to see that woman again. Um, then there was one time where I came home from work pretty late and I walked in the house and I it was dark and um, I said ma I said you home because I heard the TV on in the den and she always kept the lights out she just kept the den lights on and sure you know with the TV on so she goes uh, she goes I'm home so I said okay I walked inside and I walked in the den and there was no damn TV on and there was n n nobody home so I flew out the door. I mean, I, I got these chills that went crazy. I, I just, like, shot out that door. Um, then, then I was sleeping, uh, and, and I woke up. We don't have a lot of time now, so. Okay. All right. Um, I, was, uh, I was sleeping in my room, and, and the whole light was on. This is when I was just a kid, and um, I looked over towards the doorway, 
and there were two dark figures standing out my doorway. Uh, I don't know what they were, but they had these, like, they were shadows. And they were, they had hats on, and they were about, I would say, about three feet tall. Oh, well, we know what they are. And, uh... Um, we know what they are. Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you something, Art. They were standing outside my door, and then I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I said, I'm fully awake here. Uh, is, you know, I was rubbing my eyes. I said, what the heck is that? And I looked over again, and now they were in the door. They were about a foot inside the door. So, um, I just... Laid down straight, I could not believe what I was seeing. I just wouldn't, uh, you know, I just would not believe that there was something in the room. And with that, something grabbed my feet, and I shot up through the covers, and I went for the light, and I put it on, and there was nothing in the room. Yeah, so physically grabbing your feet. That's something a, that's grabbed a, my feet. Now, that would scare the hell out of you. I, I agree with you. Thank you very much. Bad enough to see things hear things walking about and then and then see things but the line is drawn at the grabbing of the feet if something physically yanks on you that means it's strong enough to have manifested itself physically in this world and if it wants you it's going to have you east to the rockies you're on the air hello Art? yes hi uh, i'm india from indiana i'm uh private in the uh, U.S. military army, Oh. and uh, okay. my sister had a story quite like the uh, females uh, before, um, but, you know, I had just a little bit to add to that myself because I had one of the experiences somewhat in the same time, and we were young living in an army base out in Fort Meade, Maryland, and uh, my sister was up all night frequently, and she was always scared, and she was always running to the bathroom, and we just thought she was having bad dreams. Well, what the young lady had described earlier was exactly what my sister was talking to us about and still continues to talk to us to this day. Something was literally scratching at her feet and grabbing at her feet, and she would run into the bathroom, shut the door, and just cry her eyes out. Now, during that time, I was also uh, having things waking me up by breathing up in my face, and it would scare me so much that it would wake me up. Right in your face? Right in my face, and it would just scare me completely, and Mom did not know what was going on with her kids. Now... At one time, I had felt something actually grab me, and, and I thought I was sleeping. I thought it was a dream, and to this day, it still feels like a dream, but I don't know. You tell me, uh, but it almost felt like I was lifting up out of my bed um, and floating down the hallway, but it, it still, to me, it seems like a dream. But it might have been an out-of-body, but when things physically grab at you, um, it's getting real serious, because if they want you, they got you. I hear the drums that go in tonight She hears only whispers of some quiet conversation She's coming in 12.30 flight The moonlit wings reflect the stars that guide me toward Ghost to Ghost AM, actually. Only ghost stories all night long, and they're all from you. And they better be good ones. Ghost photographs to be directed to webmaster at artbell.com. Travis in Belfair, Washington asks, Art, have you ever considered doing a show in a haunted house for an episode of Ghost to Ghost? I never dream that I... Um, you know... <laughs> I might... And I might not. I, I don't know. If I did it, I would want to go to a real haunted house. And there really are haunted houses. But then I have to ask myself, it would be in the middle of the night, like now, and would I really actually want to do a show from there? And the real actual answer might be no. <laughs> I'm not so sure I would. I might... I know, I know one thing for damn sure, I wouldn't do it alone. So my wife, at the very least, would have to come along. I think I heard, I don't think so, from the other room or something even worse. So would I do it alone? Uh, no, 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 I wouldn't. Into the unknown night once again. West of the Rockies, you're on Ghost to Ghost AM. Cheers.
Art, cheers. Yes. How you doing? I'm doing okay, sir. I'm calling you from San Diego, listening to you on KOGO. That'd be the one. Yeah, Padres won tonight. Go Padres. Go Padres. But, uh, yeah, I'm J.D., and um, I, I talked to you uh, uh, one time before, I think. Um, uh, I'm the guy with, uh, I'm really into the Somewhere in Time thing, too. I'm trying to uh, bring it to stage, but... Uh, before I get into the ghost story... Um, now, you got it. Go, got to go right to the ghost story. Well, this has to do with the ghost, um, because uh, did you know Somewhere in Time was really not um, that Mackinac Hotel? That yes, it was, it was actually down near you. Yeah, Hotel yes, I know all about that. And that's a, that's a haunted hotel. They have a room shut down. But that's not my story. Um, I am from Hollywood originally, and when I was about 20, I'm 34 now. Um, this... <laughs> Uh, a girlfriend of mine was had a very successful father who bought a mansion up in the Hollywood Hills, and it had been empty for about um, I don't know eight to ten years or so, whatever. And the first night he bought it, uh, he was very excited. He told his daughter, and we went to go check it out, and it had a pool. And I'm a swimmer guy, you know, from Hollywood. <laughs> sure. Anyway, it was a really creepy pool because all the plants and everything had kind of overgrown, and it was a black bottom pool. Uh. And but it was nighttime, and I I took a dive in, and I'm really a, I, yeah, I'm a great swimmer. It was a hot summer night. It was in August. And Young and stupid, and in Hollywood. Yeah, I was. And uh, it gets worse. But um, so I dive in, and when I was under the water, I just got this panic feeling that something was wrong. And I got up and I got right out of the pool, and I said, Something's weird about that pool. So time passes. The, the gentleman whose uh, house it was moved in, and he went away. He, he's, a, uh, he's got schools in London and Hollywood and New York. So he went away, and he didn't like me seeing his daughter. So I was not allowed at the house or... Anyway, he was in London for two weeks, supposedly. So I good, went over. Good time to see Don. Yeah. So I went over yeah. and I um, brought my Ouija board, which I'd been messing around with. with great uh, idea. I know. So we ouija there and we got a hold of... Uh, and I'd been familiar with it. Um, but she wasn't that familiar and she thought was being pushed, but it was these two little boys called Seth and Steve. You mean that we're giving you uh, messages on the Ouija board? Yeah, for real. Now, and let me guess. Uh, the Ouija board probably said, Come on in, the water is great. No, that was Art Bell on uh, East and West of the Rockies. No, <laughs> uh, 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 uh. no, they were four years old and seven, and the four-year-old absolutely despised me. He didn't even know how to spell. Um, he knew how to say, like, a few curse words. I, like, I got you. But anyway, moving on. Um, this four-year-old, I mean, really, despite, and my, you know, my hair was standing on by my arms. And I was like, I don't like, I don't like this. This is weird. So there were these two boys, and they, they, the older one, who was seven years old, explained that they, when somebody lived there about 12 years ago, they were not supposed to be hanging out there. But there was a very high wall on the other side of the pool. And they went, and the little four-year-old fell. And the, the seven-year-old jumped in to save him. And dr the four-year-old dragged him under. They both drowned. So they told us this on the Ouija board. So the next day, the girl's sister came over to the house to hang out by the pool. And we were all out by the pool. She wasn't going to tell her dad either. And um, she said... Hey, Amy, did you know that um, two little boys drowned in this pool? And that's why it stood vacant for so long. And we looked at each other. We did. I mean, we didn't tell her. So then here, I've never broken a bone in my body or ever once, and I still haven't to this day. But the dad, all of a sudden, the next day, comes home from his, you know, London trip <laughs> 13 days early. It's like he went there and turned around. Yeah. And... He shows up and found me there, and we were up in his master bedroom. Just, you know, oh, it was not pretty. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> threw me out, but I was going out, and I ran out the back, and I was, like, in underwear and a T-shirt, and I went, oh, no, 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 the Ouija board, the Ouija board, if he finds the 
Ouija board. It was under the bed. So I ran back up and I got the Ouija board. And as I was running out, something tripped me. I mean, there was nothing there. I was running down the... But I broke my foot. And I ne I've never broken anything. But I know that little brat, that little four-year-old, uh, had tripped me. I mean, uh, it was a panic uh, situation. Uh, no, this is really real. Uh, and, uh, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, well, it's ghost night. So, hey, I listen to you every night. You're the best, uh, Art. All right, thank you. All thank right, you, you have much. a good one. Take care. Uh, that would be terrifying uh, in more ways than one, wouldn't it? Really, really terrifying to be caught like that. <laughs> Uh, whether it was a ghost or daddy, both were uh, no doubt life-threatening situations. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Okay. Um, just wanted to say here, um, I currently live in a house that uh, has a couple of things in it since we've lived here. Now? You live yep. there now? Yep, currently. Yeah, but it's always, it's always been here. Um, house is about 20 years old, so it was built new. We moved in new. Nothing's ever happened, but something's always here. What do you uh, mean? What what kind of something? Um, it, I guess it has to be a uh, spirit of some kind, because like we've seen things moving in the house. Everybody um, who is here, you know, we've always seen something. What do you mean moving? Um, whether it's objects. Um, moving in what way? Uh, like physically moving an object and playing games with it. Like now, do you mean like? sort of moving across a table? Do you mean something in the air? What do you mean? Yep, yep. Well, we've seen, I've seen it myself move. Um, I felt it, um, like, when I, um, actually wake me up at nighttime. Um, it's rather unusual. Like, I've seen it move objects. In uh, what way? Well, like, just from side to side or up or down, and then it'll just drop it. Uh-huh. Um... It's actually taken objects, uh, and then they've disappeared, and then they'll re reappear like a few weeks later. You know, that sounds a lot like a poltergeist. <laughs> Lovely. Well, you know what else it's done? Um, one time when my brother, this was before he moved out, my older brother, he's reading a book, and all of a sudden he calls me upstairs, and he's like, Matt, he's like, something happened. I'm like, well, what do you mean? I smelled this awful smell, yeah. and... Uh, it started burning his hair. What? <laughs> like, seriously, went in the room, and you know that disgusting smell when hair's been burned? I certainly do. Yeah, well, that was the smell in the room, and I'm saying, well, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, I was reading b b uh, my book, and all of a sudden my hair started catching on fire. So he Oh, that's a strong clue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the strong clue to move out. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so it, it's it's... Always, um, it's something now, every could day. You, could you see anything? Was his hair singed? Was oh, actually... yeah, 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 right at the top of it. Not a lot of it, but it's definitely enough to... Good Friday, they say. Yes, indeed. From the island of Guam. On the west, or is it the east? <laughs> Eastward to the Caribbean and the U.S. Virgin Islands, south into South America, north all the way to the pole, and worldwide on the Internet. This is Coast to Coast AM. Good evening, victims. That's what you all are, is victims. Right? There is no question in my mind, nor has there been for years, about the existence of ghosts. I know there are ghosts. And I think most of you, the majority of you actually, know there are ghosts too. So every now and then we stop what we're doing, whatever that is. What is it we do here anyway? Anyway, we, we every now and then stop and we do what we call ghost to ghost instead of coast to coast. Actually, it's the same thing, just new name. And we tell ghost stories all night long. Now, you may hear it in my voice, but if you would like to see it in my face as well, then you're going to want to be absolutely certain you check out tonight's webcam photo, which I took 
just a very few moments ago. And I'll show you. I'll, that'll, that was, it'll absolutely demonstrate to you what my mood is like. You'll be able to see my mood like that. It's my webcam shot. You know, you go to my uh, web page, go to program. No, no. You don't go to program. How the hell do you get there? Let's see. Good. Now I can't even operate my own computer. Here we go. Program and Art Bell Studio Cam. <laughs> yes, indeed. Took that a few minutes ago. That'll set the mood for you, all right. I would like to welcome WTSLAM in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Or is it New Hampshire? No, it's New Hampshire. Technically, it's probably New Hampshire, right? 1,400 on the dial there. Yo to Sean Baker, the PD. Little do you know what you're in for, Sean. It's going to get a little rough. <laughs> it always does on these nights. All we do is tell real ghost stories. And, you know, there, there are a few rules to what we're going to do tonight. Let me lay those down now, all right? Only serious, interesting, scary ghost stories need apply. They're all by phone. Unless you consider yourself to have, because there's as many of you out there as there are, there are ghosts and a million ghost stories in the night. So only the premium ghost stories need apply. I mean, they've got to be good. So that's rule one. Rule two is, for God's sakes, turn down your radio. Okay? But that's always a rule. Then there's rules about... Boy, we have a lot of rules, huh? <laughs> ghost photos. Yes, we will accept ghost photographs. As I think now, we have probably... I think we have the best collection of ghost photographs on the web. If not, then we're certainly getting close, you know, to the best. And that's thanks to all of you. The same ones that are going to provide the quality ghost stories tonight, I would like to provide, uh, have provide quality ghost photos as well. So only the good goat, ghost photos need apply. Now, what does that mean? That means... Any obvious cigarette smoke ghost photos are out. They've got to be better than that. That means a ghost photo with a camera strap blurring the front doesn't count either. Occasionally we get the real thing. You know, last night, or the, was it? No, the night before. That was, that was the night before. Uh, somebody led me to, I think it's the fifth page uh, in the gallery. A ghost photos, a fifth page, I think. And that there's this picture of this, God, maybe there's an arm coming right out of the television. And it looks, you know, if it's a fake, it's a really, really, really good fake. If it's not a fake, it's everybody's nightmare. I mean, it's just everybody's nightmare. You look at that picture. Some caller led me there. And, you know, I slowly, plot, plottingly made my way there on my own website, and I got to that one. And I went, oh, my God, look at that. I had, and I'd never seen it. I guess it's been up there for a while. But I hadn't seen that particular one. That's, that's a real heart stopper. Absolutely no question about it. So um, we want only quality ghost photos sent to webmaster at artbell.com. That's Keith. He is standing by to review and judge your photograph. And if it's up to par, if it's really scary... We're going to put it up t tonight. In fact, uh, we've already got new ghost photos up there for you right now. 
as the collection continues to grow. I, I mean, there is no doubt. There is simply no doubt in my mind about the fact that ghosts are real. They are. They're as real as, as we are. There may be questions about what a ghost is. Whether it's a human soul trapped here, surely sometimes it, it is, right? Human souls do apparently for at least a period, if not longer, <laughs> get trapped here on Earth. And then there may be the memory, the, the sort of... What, what, I don't even know what the right phrase would be. The, the, the memory, the, the uh, I don't know what it is that's left of a person when their soul has departed. But something that seems to stick around, maybe that means we, you know, we have more components than we thought we had. I mean, soul goes this way. The lingering memory of the person goes that away. I don't know. We ha we, uh, have you ever thought about that? We may have more components than you thought. Oh, this is really good for any program you do up here. This, this way of coming back into the show. It's good for any program you do. All right, so you know what we're going to do tonight? It's going to be ghosts all night long. Shall we experiment? You always got to get warmed up in this biz, so let's see. All we're taking are ghost stories tonight. That's it. You got one to tell? Good one? Fine. All other matters are verboten. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Art. Hi. Calling from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Canada, yes, sir. See you on CJ. will be here. Right. Anyways, I don't know if I met a ghost or a time traveler, but this is one freaky tale, let me tell you. Well, just sort of lay it out for me uh, real quickly, if you can, and I'll try and make a judgment. Every summer I go and I live in a tent in a campground. One night I'm sitting there listening to a football game, this guy rides up in an old Indian motorcycle. Mm -hmm. He had uh, skin that looked like leather. He had Texas plates on his bike. Uh, yeah, a lot of men in Texas look like that. <laughs> he had uh, two stickers on the fender skirts. One said, America, land of the free, as long as you do what you're told. The other one had a, <laughs> the other one had a picture of uh, Mount Rushmore and a picture of Reagan smiling with a, with a tooth that was sparkling. And it said, don't believe any of them. Anyways, we're sitting there talking. I gave the guy supper. If you're going to give me this kind of detail all the way through, uh, we don't have enough show to do this. Okay, anyways, <laughs> we get talking and uh, comparing countries, this and that. Told me that uh, they never really did land on the moon. Americans never landed on the moon. He said that. Uh -huh. He said, he said uh, not only that, he said Apollo 13 didn't happen the way it said. There was no accident in space. I asked them why this would happen. They said, uh, he said the country's morale was down, Vietnam War. He said, if you look at when they, when they came back to the planet, the whole world stopped, sat on their seat, on the edge of their seat, and held their breath. Mm -hmm. He said uh, they'd done it for financing, and they'd done it for the morale of the country. Anyways, he went on and on. I asked him what he'd done. He told me he was a history teacher, and he kind of grinned. And uh, huh. gave a belly laugh. He started telling me all these tales. And sometime I, I got up, went to use the outhouse. I was about 200 feet from my tent. I came back, he was gone. I never heard the bike. I asked my neighbor beside me. He never seen the guy all night. Nobody in the campground seen this guy. So you think that he was the ghost of America? Really, I, I, I mean, you know, know, teaching you, teaching you history the way it really was versus the present matrix that we all live in, right? I don't know if he was a ghost or a time traveler or what he was. I went well, to what, yeah, see, it's close enough. I, yeah. I, I'll accept that. That's a, that's a fair medium call, ghost or time traveler, who knows. 
Matrix Traveler. How about that? <laughs> West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Yes, sir. Oh, man, I'm glad I made it there. Um, yeah, I'd like to be uh, Mr. Art Bell. This is Mr. Art Bell. Hi, sir. How are you? What can I do for you? Do you have a ghost story? Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, I guess it was back in uh, 93. I was, I was standing, I was in a 7-Eleven. There was just three people in the 7-Eleven store, me and two people. Two people came in front of me, and they were going through the yard, you know, with the, the milk and the soda pops out. Yes, and, um, I mean, generally, yes, anyway, up against the wall, usually. But anyway, these two people looked kind of, they were dressed in right clothes, and they were just a few feet in front of me. And all of a sudden, uh, I heard this voice out of nowhere. It says, only fools pay. <laughs> and I was just looking around, and there was nobody there that said that. And Maybe I, it was a voice in your own head. Yeah, only fools that's pay. Right. Was, only fools pay. Trying to talk you into copping a soda pop or God knows what else, see? Could have been your own inner voice. Tempting you, you know, the, the little guy that sits over on the... Is, does he sit on the bad one, sit on the right or the left? Then there's a good one. But the good one doesn't get to speak up that much. That sounds like the bad one. Only fools pay in 7-Eleven. Take it, bud, and run. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Mr. Art. This is Frank. I'm calling from Orlando, and I'm listening to you on the Internet. Yes, Frank. Um... This is uh, quite a few years ago. I was actually pretty young, about six years old, <laughs> six or seven. I lived in Long Island at the time. And uh, <clears throat> I had an appearance of some type of apparition in uh, my bedroom window. Um, stays with me today. I remember it as, uh, as just like it happened yesterday. What do, you rem what do you remember it looked like? It was a uh, definite female, a woman that appeared to be in her 30s. Mm. Um, I remember that it was generally all one color, um, like a, a greenish or grayish color. <clears throat> and the best description that I can give of her, I could actually see an emotion on her face. It appeared that she looked at me with compassion. Um, if I was to see it today, I wouldn't be frightened. But then I, I ran out of my room screaming. <laughs> mm. And... <laughs> Um, I, I never told anybody about this until about the age of 25. I was mentioning it to my sister. At that point, she told me that she had also seen the same, the same thing in our house. Oh, no kidding. So no kidding. whatever it was then was um, in the area of your house, and not just visiting you in particular, but... I, I would imagine, you know, it was um, <clears throat> not something that I saw all the time. It was just a, a one-time deal. My parents never mention anything of it um, but we did move out of that house about a year afterwards and the people who purchased the house from us um, moved out about two months afterwards <laughs> now, I don't know if that's related or not but I don't suppose uh, when you sold that house that you disclosed to this happy little honeymooning couple that was going to get it next uh, that <laughs> there was an entity in there that would tend to show up by your by, by your bed in your window at night <laughs> Well, at the time, I wasn't old enough to, to have that kind of contact to give them that information, but... Uh, you mean you didn't I, say, Mommy, Daddy, no. you've got to tell them. <laughs> um, well, actually, um, I have a grandmother who was babysitting that, that evening, and she does remember me running out of my room screaming. <laughs> but, uh, oh, yes, yes. Yeah. All right. Um, I appreciate your call, sir. Thank, well, thank you, you and uh, uh, take care. Yes? An entity... Well, what do we know about this? We know that ghosts, particularly those produced by suicides, especially su suicides, and that, that is worrisome, seem to hang around the place where they committed suicide, where they took their own life. So I suppose had you had a chance to, you know, check into it a little bit, you might have found that uh, somebody may have done themselves in on that property somewhere. These days, you've got to disclose that kind of thing when you sell a house. 
But you and I all know, we, we, we both know, don't we, that you would never disclose that, would you? <laughs> and, oh, by the way, you're buying uh, an entity as well. It's in the house here. No, you're not likely to say that, are you? So I wonder how frequently such a thing is invoked. I suppose when there's an official prior history of haunting. Now, how, how would you establish that? Well, newspaper articles, perhaps? I can see an attorney using that. Uh, you see, there was publicity about this house. Everybody knows there was something wrong, very, very wrong in this house. A newspaper story like that. So who would want to have one about their house, right? Nobody. But then you couldn't sell it without disclosing what was really going on inside. I'm Art Bell. This is <laughs> Ghost to Ghost AM. The devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal. He was in a bind because he was way behind and he was willing to make a deal. When he came across this young man sewing on a fiddle and playing it hot, and the devil jumped up on a hickory thumb and said, Boy, let me tell you what. I guess you didn't know it, but I'm a fiddle player too. And if you care to take a dare, I'll make a bet with you. Now, you play pretty good fiddle, boy, but give the devil his due. I bet a fiddle of gold against your soul because I think I'm better than you. The boy said, My name's John. Yes, Jenny was sweet, but was she human? I have a way of knowing things, and I know this. If you have a really good ghost story, and you don't try to get through tonight, something really awful is going to happen to you. This has burdened you long enough. This is your opportunity for release by telling your story. And if you don't, it's not my responsibility. You've been warned. On the first time caller line, you're on the air. How you doing, Art? Well, so far, so good. Before I tell you, can I ask you a question? Uh, possibly. Do you know what lineage the Vikings were? No. I don't either, so I guess uh, it's not going to help. But, but anyway, I don't really believe in ghost art, but I do believe in demonic manifestations. I believe there's familiar spirits which pose as people that we've known, which are actually demonic manifestations. That is a really conservative religious viewpoint, isn't it? Right. Mm -hmm. And I believe there's nonspecific demonic manifestations. And, and you, you believe there are everything that uh, would be that explains the th millions of stories we can get on this program and elsewhere and photographs all of it is explained by the devil well yes because uh, the bible points it out about familiar spirits and of course and so all right fine we'll we'll go with what you believe your category to be but, the, but that uh, doesn't mean but i also believe that it i'm not going to argue it with you you believe it i'm i've no right. you know fine but, uh, believe it just tell me have you had uh, an encounter with an evil Demonic oh, absolutely. spirit? Absolutely. But let me just say that I believe that they could be interdimensional be beings, too. That doesn't, uh, because that, that's that's separate entities. So you're a little open-minded. Yeah, sure. <laughs> right. Sure. Go ahead, uh, tell your story. Now, this this, this comes with a parallel, too. Uh, me, and, me and a friend both had this same experience at different times. It's pretty, pretty wild. Uh, not only did we have the same experience, we had been friends for several years, and then all of a sudden we found out while he was retracing his roots, roots, that we had the same grandfather in Ireland, the same great, 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 great grandfather in Ireland, mm -hmm. which was very weird because we're both from different areas of the country, mm -hmm. and we met each other through work. But anyway, uh, what happened one night is, as I'll get right to the story, I woke up, and what I saw was really, really scary. There was a 
big entity in, in my room at the foot of my bed, and it was huge, and it had horns, great, huge horns on its head. And I'll, I'll get to the, the clincher of this in a minute. But it had great horns on its head, and it had red eyes, bright red eyes, and it was just standing there in my doorway. Heat red eyes. Heat red eyes. Right. Well, what I did is I said, of course, uh, and, and I'm not, I'm not uh, really, I, I believe in, in the Bible, and I believe in Christianity, but I'm not a... You know, I'm not a big practicing Christian. But nevertheless, I said, in the name of Jesus, be gone. And the entity walked back through the door and faded away. All right. You know, the, and I've heard this a million times. Well, here's the I thing. Mean, oh, I'm sorry. There's, a, there's more? Oh, there's, it's much more to this. I, I was just going to say, though, and this will argue a little bit with your belief system, I know. But uh, you might as well have said, in the name of Art Bell, the paranormal talk show host, be gone. Well, that might have scared him, too. It, it, <laughs> it, it might have, and it w certainly would have told us a lot. Now, somebody out there should try. Now, I'm not going to be responsible for any lawsuit, for any bloody pulps uh, uh, just sort of lingering uh, and soaking into the bed that are left after this is tried. But there, there's a great, there's a great <laughs> other part of this story, though. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, me and my friend, we practice coffee drinking at restaurants late at night and talking about things, including your show. Yes. We like to talk about your show over coffee. But anyway, I told him about that experience one night. I told him, and, he's, and I, he says, well, I had the same experience, the same thing. Yeah. And I said, did it have horns on its head? He said, yeah. And I said, what, something similar to you said, and it backed down the hallway. I didn't tell him one point of this. I said, well, tell me what it looked like. He said, well, the horns weren't really horns. It was like a Viking cap. Mm -hmm. And I looked at my friend and said, ah, the I, didn't tell, I did not tell you this part about it. Yeah, the I lineage said, but that's question. What it, that's what it was. It was a Viking cap. I didn't tell him that, but we both had the same experiences. He both said something similar, and his, instead of, you know, just out of the room, his was in the hallway, and it walked down the hallway and disappeared. But it was like a huge Viking. I'm, I'm with you all the way, and uh, I, I can't think of anything that I would less like to see than something with glowing red eyes. That creeps me out. That always creeps me out. Glowing red eyes, I know, are bad. Very bad. No matter what else, what other form the creature has, the glowing red eyes, oh, they're very bad. And by the way, just so there's no mistake about it, if I ever encountered one of these things and I had to invoke a name to get it gone, you can bet your bottom dollar it wouldn't be my name. <laughs> You all want to try that, you go right ahead. <laughs> wild, wild Card Line, you're on the air. Hello. Yeah, hello, Art. Hi. This is Robert, a KFI in Los Angeles. Yes, sir, the mighty KFI. Uh, I have been haunted by the ghost of a dead cheerleader. Whoa. Oh, not, not, as, not as bad as, uh, as, as a lot I hear about, sir. <laughs> oh, yes. She died quite recently. Uh, she, uh, she was uh, murdered by a photographer, and a photographer was sentenced and convicted for uh, uh, murdering her. Yes. Do you remember this story? N no, but, but uh, well, let's see, do I? I do remember. Well, anyway, it's not important. Go right ahead. All right. Dead well, cheerleader. Well, you see, I had met her uh, five, five years previously, but I was haunted by her in 1973 when I was in the Air Force. I uh, would be in formation. There'd be several thousand of us in formation going to tech school, and all of a sudden, the entire formation was called to a halt while all the big NCOs and officers came up to look at me. And I'm standing there wearing a cute little cheerleader outfit with pom poms in my hand, and my airman behind me is rubbing my behind. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, after that, my life was a living heck, and I couldn't understand it. Uh, anyway, well, uh, I I remember uh, boot camp real well, and people like you, uh, if you were really in that outfit, you know, it's like you went home the next day. You were, yeah. that, that was a ticket home. So there can't possibly be more to this story. Oh, there's plenty. Except, uh, well, there can't be except except to say that uh, uh, in boot camp, a lot of us in our mind's eye saw cheerleaders. Mm-hmm. Every every day, in fact. Uh huh. And well, they, and they, and they, everybody saw one. And there wasn't a, a woman around to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, my commanding officer's commanding officer, former commanding officer, was uh, Brigadier General Chuck Yeager. Uh, shortly after that, he came down to interview me. Why? 
because my commanding officer was uh, as friends with Egg Yeager, and Yeager came to interview because he heard about it. This oh, is about the time on. of the comet. This is about the time of the comet in 1973, and about the time Colonel Fox of Cape Wind. It, ne it never, State. it never got that weird, sir. Never. Chuck Yeager had a lot of things to do with his time, but interviewing people who had donned cheerleading uniforms and basic training while getting fondled, uh, that would not have been high on his list. I don't buy it, Monk. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Mr. Bell. Yes. Oh, yes, about that. It's a little slow on the trigger here. I'm not a Canadian, so... <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy it. It must be Air Force night tonight. I'm uh, retired Air Force. Are you? I was stationed at F.E. Warren Air Force Base the last few months I was in. And since I went retired on active duty, they gave me a position babysitting in the dormitories. Uh, the buildings at F.E. Warren are extremely old. They're from about after, after the Civil War. And I worked Ooh, very late at night. That really morning. is old. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a nice base. But as I was sitting there, must have been about 3 in the morning, I had a Buffalo soldier report in. And a, a Buffalo soldier? Yeah, full regalia, uh, buckskins. The hat, the pistols, just terrified me. You mean just came right up to you? He came into my office. To Full my form, dad. not wispy or anything like a ghost, but just solid human? No, he was, he was solid to me, I, and then he left. He, he just disappeared. Vaporized, I guess, would be the best word for it. In front of your eyes? In front of my eyes. Uh, about five minutes after, everybody in the dormitory knew I'd seen him, <laughs> because it, it did scare me. Well, there are two types after an experience like that. One is, like you, can't keep your mouth shut, going to have to tell everybody in sight just to feel better about it. And the other is, I'm never telling anybody about this. I'm going to go have a little nap, and I'm going to see if I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would lived uh, across the field from General Blackjack's old house, Blackjack Pershing. Yes. And there were reports of lights and stuff in that building, his old house. And I had never believed anything until that soldier reported to me. And well, here's, that was amazing. Here's something that I, uh, I've thought an awful lot about, and that is bat battlefields. Uh, I, too, was in the Air Force uh, to pile yeah. on here. And um, during Vietnam, and a lot of people died. And, you know, there are a lot of ghosts on battlefields, and I... I've been what if, if if a ghost is really a human soul still here on earth then there would be in my mind zero righteousness in the world and a very unfair god uh to take any soldier who had died in defense of his country and keep him trapped keep his soul trapped on earth yes how ultimately unfair would that be that would be a terrible Terrible afterlife. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Thank you very much. Uh, terrible indeed. So, why then are battlefields littered with ghosts? Hmm? What sort of God would allow that to occur? And the only answer you can really hope for here is that indeed it is not the soul, but uh, some other component of what's left of you when your body is gone. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. Um, Hi. This is Anita from Harrisburg, Oregon. Hi there, Anita. Hi. Um, I have a kind of a freaky story to tell that happened to me. Um, actually, we've had several things happen to us in this house. Um, and anyway, we had my husband and I had just watched a movie. It was the Amityville Horror. And we're getting ready for bed and went, went and got in. And I started getting this really icky feeling like something evil was in the room with me. Yes. And my husband had gone to sleep, and we had our one-year-old son in the, in the same room. And he started fussing and fussing and went and fell down. And I was starting to doze off. Every time I doze off, I jump awake like something kept bothering me or, you know, and I had this real evil feeling. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, I had dozed off, and I jumped awake again because it felt like something had taken a finger and run across my feet at the end of the bed, and I heard a hiss. It was a hiss. <laughs> and you don't have cats? No, <laughs> we didn't have any cats. Hisses are really bad. Yeah, but um, I had the light on all night. I was laying there on my back, you know, so I could see all around the sides of me, and 
And uh, anyway, I was so scared. I didn't know what to do, so I said, you know, just had a quick prayer. And that feeling went away. And uh, was finally my And son, whatever it was yeah, went, went it, away. Yeah, it did. And my son settled down, and I settled down, and we slept the rest of the night. And Well, you know, I guess we, we've got to ask, is, yeah. it, is that really... The power of God is the prayer, know. the uh, invocation of uh, the Lord's name. Yeah, but if Jesus, you know. uh, does, it, does that really drive these things away, or is it just the command, your yeah. command, yeah. Uh, your mental command to be gone? Yeah, but before that, my husband had seen a big figure in our doorway of the bedroom. He just saw the, the form of it, and oh. uh, this was like probably a couple months before my experience. And then it went away, and then a couple nights later, he woke up, and it was right in his face. Uh -huh. And he's, he goes, what do you want? And it says, I want you. And he just laid there. He was just frozen. And then I woke up, too, and he was just drenched in sweat. My God, you mean you both saw it? <laughs> you both saw him? Or, or you, you, I when, didn't when you see woke, it, you saw him drenched in sweat, huh? Yeah, he was just, and he was all freaked out. And, and I, I... I that's interesting because I've never heard of anybody coming back from I want you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, <laughs> we moved into this house. Um, we had to clean it out, and upstairs there were stacks and stacks of witchcraft books, and we kind of think that had something to do with it. We do you know anything about the uh, former tenants? Um, not really, just that um, um, they were... Um, they weren't very clean. <laughs> we had to clean up the whole house. And they obviously had an, a big interest in witchcraft. Oh, yeah, big interest. And even my kids, when they were little, they slept up in that room where we cleaned the books out of. And my oldest son said he would see, well, he described them as white ladies dancing in the closet. And uh, he said that they had made kind of a growling sound. Growling? Yeah. Yeah, so we've had a lot of weird stuff happen here, but... That's another thing that would be uh, really upsetting to me, would be a female growling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's, and my older daughter had seen him, too, at the same time. So I knew that they, you know, and they were totally serious. That's, they, that's even more serious. When you have, like, two people, two witnesses, two family members who see the same thing at the same time, if that really happens, time to move out. Well, actually, we had a house fire, and it burned the whole upstairs. You're it kidding. Scorched You're it. Kidding. Did it really? And, yeah, and so well, my husband remodeled the whole house, and we tore the whole top of the house off completely. And ever since then, we have not had anything happen here in this house. Well, so I wonder, yeah, but what does that say? I don't know. I don't uh, know. That's really, you know, that's another thing that I found really strange because, you know, after the house fire... We rebuild the house, and then nothing happens again. So you burned the ghost out, or no. <laughs> the ghost burned itself out. And uh, what, what caused the fire, do you know? Well, they think it was a, an extension cord, oh, yeah, but they're yeah. not sure. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's almost as good as swamp gas yeah, for because UFOs. This house was built in 1940, so, you know, lots of things could have happened here. <laughs> but see, that sort of seems to say that whatever it was was locked into that physical place, that physical uh, building. Uh -huh. And so what in the world do you suppose happened to it when it burned? I don't know. That's what I've always wondered. That had me puzzled because, you know, we were having so many weird things happen here and then all of a sudden it's gone. <laughs> well, a lot of people in the audience scoff at this kind of thing and they say, ah, baloney. Stories, made no. up stories, not made up, is it? No, no, none of it. I appreciate your call. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. No, not made up. Unfortunately, these things are real. I, I just, I wish that we understood more about them. And try as we might, it seems nearly impossible to achieve that. Once again, you might uh, take a glance at my webcam photo tonight when you get a chance. <laughs> it was my in-the-mood photo. Uh, well, let's see what lurks upon the wild card line. You're on the air. Hi. Hi. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Extinguish your radio. I did. Do you have a ghost story for us? I certainly do, sir. Let her I read. have. Okay. So uh, I was in my house in... Uh, 
Plymouth, New Hampshire, where I actually rented the apartment above an accounting office. And uh, at one night, at about 10 o'clock at night, all of a sudden I heard some loud noise, which sounded like somebody was down there slamming one of the doors. Then I heard what sounded like somebody going into a, a file cabinet and just ripping through the uh, files. Like you could just hear papers yep. flying through. Yep. And then... Uh, and I was scared. I said, well, I'm, I, I yelled down to it. I said, who's down there? And I said, I have a gun up here. And uh, no response. Just started tearing through him even more. So I went and I called the local police. They showed up in three minutes. The noise stopped pretty much right as they showed up. I went out and, uh, you know, gre greeted them. And they were like, well, what's going on? And they went and they checked all the doors to make sure nobody had broken in. And... Uh, and then, you know, sure enough, they said, oh, there's nobody in there. They shine their lights in there, whatever, and they left. Mm. Well, the next morning, um, I, or later that night, I heard nothing more. Um, but then, then you know, the next, the next morning, the accountant came in and said, I went down there and said to her, this was my landlord. I said, you know, I thought, I have to tell you, I called the police last night. Um, I thought uh, someone had broken in and been going through your files. She was like, well, nothing's out of order. And she's like, that's really weird because I couldn't tell. It felt like somebody was holding the door when I tried to come in this morning. Oh, oh, oh really? Is this our bell? Yo, of course it is, yes. Yes, okay. Well, like somebody was holding the door and she couldn't get in? Yes, sir. While all this was obviously going on, huh? Yes, and then she went around the front, unlocked it, and went in and... Uh, went back to that back door and that door was unlocked and no one was there and i was looking out every window in that house to uh make sure that uh you know nobody came running out of there because it is a gotcha. college town i've got to i've got to go at that point thank you this is ghost to ghost am do you <laughs> good morning everybody I'm Art Bell, and tonight we're telling only ghost stories. That's all we're doing. Ghost stories. If you don't have a ghost story, don't call. And it better be a good one, too. And we're only taking quality ghost photographs sent to my esteemed webmaster. If you have a ghost photograph that just won't quit, not smoke, not, you know, camera straps or anything like that, we want the real McCoy. Send it to webmaster at artbell.com, and we will post it tonight during the program. You can go look at it. By the way, I've got my own webcam. Remember when you were a kid? Well, wait till you see what the results are with me earlier tonight on my webcam. <laughs> it says volumes about my mood. You know, I look at my own webcam picture and it scares me. <laughs> I did that myself. I look at that and I go, oh my God, what's in me? You know, maybe that's a good question. What's in me? You take a look at that. Do I have my evil side? <laughs> God, I look terrible. Absolutely terrible. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Glad to have you back, Art. Oh, uh, thank you. And um, my name is An Andrew. I'm uh, in Castro Valley, California. Oh, yes. Um, listen, I uh, have a story that took place in 1980. I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, I don't know if you know where the town of Auburn, California is. I or... do indeed. Oh, yes. Well, I went to high school in Auburn there. Um, the high school was previously a university that my father attended. Just about a half a mile away, there was the Auburn Courthouse very famous building, um, huge, and it had been abandoned for at least 40 years. Uh, mm. Right after the war, they stopped using it and moved the courthouses to a more modern building. And I was an aspiring filmmaker in those days in high school, and so I managed to get permission from the county clerk to, uh, to go in and, and do an amateur film in there, and I got the keys, and I went into the place with uh, two or three friends of mine. This was going to be what? Just some histor historical film? No, no, this was just going to be kind of a...
kind of a romp, you know, kind of a fantasy little thing. I, I didn't quite have it worked out. It, we were kind of winging it as far as the film goes. Yeah. But it was just an interesting background once I got in there. I, I had no idea what I was in for um, as far as the story goes. And, and the architecture, too, was pretty amazing. Uh, we got inside the place. Um, if you can imagine, just a huge box, basically, made of stone, uh, three stories high. And then on top of that was a giant rotund, uh, much like a, a Capitol building rotund. Oh, yes. And on top of that was a, a little miniature rotund where you could get up a, kind of yep. a yep. Kind, of, kind of the crow's nest. No, I, I can picture it. I've seen the buildings. Okay. Well, um, we got in there, and, and the whole downstairs was all marble. I think it had been redone in the 20s in kind of Art Deco style. And there was dust and cobwebs everywhere. And uh, we, we started setting up our equipment and looking around. And uh, mostly we were using the film as an excuse to, to goof off because it was just such a tremendously interesting playground. You know, and to have the keys to this place, I felt like I was getting away with something. Um, but we started hearing... Uh, banging noises coming from the upper floors and we hadn't been up there yet so we didn't know if anyone was in the building or not mm -hmm. and so we went up and checked it out two of us did and uh, we had our girlfriends there they stayed downstairs uh, they didn't want to go up and uh, there was no one there so we came back down uh, we looked in all the courtrooms and believe me, the courtrooms were, were lavish, you know, the dark, varnished wood. Oh, even, yeah, even modern courtrooms are that way. And, and all through the South, they stay that way. I mean, they're really old, as you point out, um, heavy wood, carved wood. You, you really have the feeling of old, sure. Oh, yeah it, yeah, it was beautiful. And in the downstairs, there were safes. There were these enormous uh, safes with brass and steel and iron. And uh, they were just open, several of them. And so we filmed some footage down there, and and uh, this banging continued. And so then we, after having found out that no one was in the building, the banging persisted, and we started really getting nervous. And and yet at the same time we were intrigued. We wanted to see something almost. You know, we wanted to go up and and have some experience. I guess at that age. Mm -hmm. And so we we uh, kind of sneaked up there and looked around and there was again no one there nothing there uh the electricity was on so we could work the lights and uh, we came back downstairs and i noticed that uh, all my papers my script in my little folder was not on the bench where i left it and i was looking around for it maybe i left it over where the safes are or somewhere else and so i searched for it couldn't find it and then um went back upstairs carrying all the equipment with us and i noticed that of all things my camera strap was gone someone had actually taken the camera strap unsnapped it off the camera the movie <laughs> camera and it was missing yes so we carried everything up into this uh, gigantic courtroom and lo and behold on top of the the bench on top of the, the judge's table or desk there was my book and the camera strap neatly folded across it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there was, there was only four of us. The girls were really reluctant to come upstairs at all. And so there was me and my friend. And I would have noticed if either of us had been carrying the book or the camera strap. And um, I went back down and asked the girls, you know, how did the camera strap get off of the camera? And they said, oh, we don't know. We, we've just been sitting here the whole time. They were down there, you know, having sodas and eating food or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay. So we went back upstairs, and we had turned off all the lights because we wanted to see uh, if we could do f filming in the dark, you know, with the, the present light coming in through the windows. Only the young and stupid. Well, you know. I mean, after all this, you're turning off the lights. All right. right. All right, go ahead. Okay, so we, we go back upstairs, and, and uh, the light in the one courtroom is on. Now, I, I didn't think anything of it, because who knows? My, my friend could have gone back up there and turned it on, whatever. Sure. So we're in the courtroom. The light is on. Uh, I'm filming a little footage, and then the banging happens again. <laughs> so all of us go downstairs, 
Hmm. And and the girls want to leave. They they don't want any part of it now. They're they're scared because we've already told them there's no one here. Proving again, girls are smarter than boys. <laughs> pretty pretty much true. <laughs> and uh, but uh, you know adventure kicks in, and and so we really wanted to know what was happening. What and what you call adventure is actually. Stupidity. Uh, stupidity and youthful testosterone running out sure. of control. Anyway, so sure. fine, you, you go. Um, well, the girls decided to go, and, and it was, you know, the lunch hour that we had, and that was pretty much over. So being studious individuals, they went back to school, and, and we stayed there, of course. Mm. Mm. And um, on, the, on the downstairs floor, there were cells, holding cells. Ah, uh, made of, that's right. Know, there would be cells, wouldn't there, in a in a uh, old courthouse? Well, sure. there sure were, and um, a couple of them had doors at both ends. There were like long, narrow cells with a door at one end, iron bar grates, and a gotcha. door at the other end. Gotcha. Well, we went inside one of these cells, made sure that it couldn't lock. There was no lock on it, and the other end was wide open. We walked in. The door behind us slammed shut. <laughs> for no apparent reason. <laughs> yes, I've and seen so it. our instant reaction was to run like the Dickens and go out the other end. Yep. Before it slammed shut. I mean, we were terrified at that point. And so you made a dash for the other side. We made a dash for the other side. We got out oh. and entered into a different part of, of the courthouse, and circled back around to where we'd started, and it was open as if it had never happened. Uh -huh. So let me guess. You went back in. Well, no, we didn't go back into the cell. At this point, it, was, it had become like a game. You know, we were just waiting to see what the next thing was that was going to happen. And we couldn't let it go. I mean, <laughs> we weren't seeing anything. We weren't hearing voices or anything. It, it, we were just convinced that somebody's playing with us. Yeah, well, they, these kind of games in the movies end up with dismembered bodies. Anyway, anything else? Well, there was one final punctuation that, that made us all never go back. And that happened right outside the building in broad daylight, probably 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Up on top of the building, there were four statues. And they were the, the typical statue of justice holding right. the scales and the right. sword. Gotcha. Uh, except they weren't blindfolded. They just had their eyes closed. Right. Four women on the, the cardinal points of the compass gotcha. on top. Um, we were approaching the building. Just the two of us, my friend Aaron and myself. Mm -hmm. We looked up. We were just about to go in the front door. I had the keys in my hand. We looked up at the statue, and her eyes were open. <laughs> and then they closed. <laughs> and they closed while you watched? They closed while we watched. <laughs> and uh. we looked at each other, and we literally did a double take. We looked back up at the statue because yep. we both recognized that yep. we both had seen it. Yep. And we looked back up, and yep. her eyes were shut. Uh-huh. And that was it. We turned around thank, and went right thank back God. to school. The first smart move you made. <laughs> uh, that's some story, all right. Thank you very much. Okay, all right. Yeah, take care. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, when you look up at a statue and the eye opens and then closes, it's really time to go. I, I, I bought the whole thing, and uh, the only thing that could have caused me to reject that entire story would be if they'd have, you know, climbed up to investigate the statue or gone in the house, that would have been too much for me. But I'll, I'll buy what he gave. That wasn't bad. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. 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 Hello, are you talking to me? Yes, I'm talking to you. Oh, there you go. Where are you? Come on. I'm on um, uh, Long Island. All right. New York. Uh, this is Russ. This is my first time caller. And uh, I, have, uh, I have something that happened to me when I was four. I'm 47 now, okay. and um, what happened was I was running around the house after my sister. My sister was eight, I was four, and I couldn't, I couldn't catch up to her, and she ran down the basement stairs. I ran down there after her, and she's running around the basement, and she's laughing, and I'm trying to catch up to her, and as I was trying, as I was trying to get her, um, the basement, I saw the basement door open, and so I... I said, down the heck with it, you know, and I ran up the basement steps to go outside. And when I got to the top of the steps, I noticed my sister was in the backyard playing. And I looked down the stairs, and I said, well, she's out there playing. Then who's laughing downstairs? But, you know, at four years old, you know, who really, you know, thinks of anything scary? So, yeah, of course not. You don't. You know, so then I just went outside, and I, um, I continued to play. 
Uh, that was the first thing that happened. Um, and as I, as I got older, uh, my father um, would yell up the stairs at me and wake me up around 2 o'clock in the morning and say, what are you doing up there? Get to sleep. So I said, you just woke me up. So, um, so something was going on around He said he here. heard walking around. He says, you're walking around up there. I said, I'm not walking around. I said, you just woke me up. So now years go by, and I'm in the kitchen, and he's in bed sleeping, and my brother is upstairs sleeping now in that room. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and I heard walking around. And I, I went by the stairs, and I says, Jimmy, what are you doing walking around? What are you doing? You know, so I went upstairs, and my brother was sound asleep. So I, I got a chill one up my back, and I says, geez, this is what my father's been hearing all these years, you know? There you are. And, uh, and so that, that's been going on for, you know, that happened, that, that went on for quite a few years. Have you ever seen anything? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Scared the hell out of me, too. I was, uh, oh, I was around 15, I, w I would think. And we had a whole, um, we had, a, we had company over the house. It was a party for some reason. I don't know what it was. But anyway, there was a lot of people in the house. And I was coming out of the bathroom. And directly across from the bathroom is my mother's bedroom. Mm -hmm. You know, my parents' bedroom. And um, so as, as, a, you know, as I opened the door to, to come out, I saw a uh, woman standing in the uh, bedroom at the edge of the bed in a long white gown. Um, I couldn't make the face out, but she was, um, it was, it was just beautiful. I, that's all I can remember. It was just beautiful. And I went into the kitchen and I said to my mother, I says, um, oh, who's the lady inside in the bedroom with a long white gown on? This and sometimes could be a really bad thing to go tell mom. Well, <laughs> well, she <laughs> any, said, any, anyway, I'm, yeah, yeah, well, she said, uh, I know what you're saying, the bride and all that stuff, but no, um, yeah, she, she says, no, there's nobody here, and there's no one in the house with a long white gown on. So I says, I'm telling you, there's someone in your bedroom there. She's standing there at the edge of the bed, and she's looking out towards the hallway. And uh, so we went in there, and, of course, there was nobody in there. And, I, and from that point, whenever, every, whenever I went past her door, I would never look in. Thank you. But, um, you know, because I did not want to see that woman again. Um, then there was one time where I came home from work pretty late and I walked in the house and I it was dark and um, I said ma I said you home because I heard the TV on in the den and she always kept the lights out she just kept the den lights on and sure you know with the TV on so she goes uh, she goes I'm home so I said okay I walked inside and I walked in the den and there was no damn TV on and there was n nobody home so I flew out the door. I mean, I, I got these chills that went crazy. I, I just, like, shot out that door. Um, then, then I was sleeping, uh, and, and I woke lot, up. We don't have a lot of time now, so. Okay. All right. Um, I, was, uh, I was sleeping in my room, and, and the whole light was on. This is when I was just a kid. And um, I looked over towards the doorway, and there were two dark figures standing out my doorway. Uh, I don't know what they were, but they had these, like, they were shadows. And they were, they had hats on, and they were about, I would say, about three feet tall. Oh, we know what they are. And, uh... Um, we know what they are. Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you something, Art. They were standing outside my door, and then I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I said, I'm fully awake here. Uh, there's, you know, I was rubbing my eyes. I said, what the heck is that? And I looked over again, and now they were in the door. They were about a foot inside the door. So, um... I just laid down straight. I could not believe what I was seeing. I just wouldn't, uh, you know, I just would not believe that there was something in the room. And with that, something grabbed my feet, and I shot up through the covers, and I went for the light, and I put it on, and there was nothing in the room. Yeah, so physically point, grabbing your feet. That's something a, that's grabbed my feet. Now, that would scare the hell out of you. I, I agree with you. Thank you very much. Bad enough to see things hear things walking about and then and then see things but the line is drawn at the grabbing of the feet if something physically yanks on you that means it's strong enough to have manifested itself physically in this world and if it wants you it's going to have you 
East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello, Art? Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm Indi from Indiana. I'm a private in the uh, U.S. military army. Oh. And uh, okay. my sister had a story quite like the uh, females uh, before. Um, but, you know, I had just a little bit to add to that myself because I had one of the experiences somewhat in the same time. And we were young living in an army base out in Fort Meade, Maryland. And um, my sister was up all night frequently and she was always scared and she was always running to the bathroom and we just thought she was having bad dreams well what the young lady had described earlier was exactly what my sister was talking to us about and still continues to talk to us to this day something was literally scratching at her feet and grabbing at her feet and she would run into the bathroom shut the door and just cry her eyes out now during that time i was also uh, having things waking me up by breathing up in my face, and it would scare me so much that it would wake me up. Right in your face? Right in my face, and it just scare me completely, and Mom did not know what was going on with her kids. Now, at one time, I had felt something actually grab me, and uh, I thought I was sleeping. I thought it was a dream, and to this day, it still feels like a dream, but I don't know. You tell me, uh, but it almost felt like I was lifting up out of my bed. Mm. Um and floating down the hallway, but it still, to me, it seems like a dream. But it might have been an out of body, but when things physically grab at you, um, it's getting real serious. Because if they want you, they got you. I hear the drums that go in tonight. And she hears only whispers of some quiet conversation. She's coming in 1230 flights. Ghost to Ghost AM, actually. Only ghost stories all night long, and they're all from you. And they better be good ones. Ghost photographs to be directed to webmaster at artbell.com. Travis in Belfair, Washington asks, Art, have you ever considered doing a show in a haunted house for an episode of Ghost to Ghost? I never dream that I... Um, you know... <laughs> I might, and I might not. I, I don't know. If I did it, I would want to go to a real haunted house, and there really are haunted houses. But then I have to ask myself, it would be in the middle of the night, like now, and would I really actually want to do a show from there? And the real actual answer might be no. <laughs> I'm not so sure I would. I might, I know, I know one thing for damn sure, I wouldn't do it alone. So my wife, at the very least, would have to come along. I think I heard, I don't think so, from the other room or something even worse. No, 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 I wouldn't. Into the unknown night once again. West of the Rockies, you're on Ghost to Ghost AM. Cheers. Art, cheers. Yes. How you doing? I'm doing okay, sir. I'm calling you from San Diego, listening to you on KOGO. That'd be the one. Yeah, Padres won tonight. Go Padres. Go Padres. But, uh, yeah, I'm J.D., and um, I, I talked to you uh, uh, one time before, I think. Um, uh, I'm the guy with, I'm um, really into the Somewhere in Time thing, too. I'm trying to uh, bring it to stage, but... Uh, before I get into the ghost story... Um, now, you got it. Go, got to go right to the ghost story. Well, this has to do with the ghost, um, because uh, did you know Somewhere in Time was really not um, that Mackinac Hotel? That yes, it was, it was actually down near you. Yeah, Hotel yes, I know all about that. And that's a, that's a haunted hotel. They have a room shut down. But that's not my story. Um, I am from Hollywood originally, and when I was about 20, I'm 34 now. Um, this... <laughs> Uh, a girlfriend of mine was had a very successful father who bought a mansion up in the Hollywood Hills, and it had been empty for about um, I don't know eight to ten years or so, whatever. And the first night he bought it, uh, he was very excited. He told his daughter, and we went to go check it out, and it had a pool. And I'm a swimmer guy, you know, from Hollywood. <laughs> sure. Anyway, it was a really creepy pool because all the plants and everything had kind of overgrown, and it was a black-bottom pool. Uh. 
and but it was nighttime, and I I took a dive in, and I'm really a, I, yeah, I, I'm a great swimmer. It was a hot summer night. It was in August. And Young and stupid, and in Hollywood. Yeah, I was, and uh, it gets worse. But um, so I dive in, and when I was under the water, I just got this panic feeling that something was wrong, and I got up and I got right out of the pool, and I said something's weird about that pool. So time passes. The, the gentleman whose uh, house it was moved in, and he went away. He, he's, a, uh, he's got schools in London and Hollywood and New York, so he went away, and he didn't like me seeing his daughter, so I was not allowed at the house or... Anyway, he was in London for two weeks, supposedly, so good, I went good, over. Good time to see daughter. Yeah, so I went over, yeah. and I... Um, brought my Ouija board, which I'd been messing around with. with Great uh, idea. I know. So we ouija there, and we got a hold of, uh, and I'd been familiar with it. Um, but she wasn't that familiar, and she thought it was being pushed, but it was these two little boys called Seth and Steve. You mean that we're giving you uh, messages on the Ouija board? Yeah, for real. Now, and let me guess. Uh, the Ouija board probably said... Come on in, the water is great. No, that was Art Bell on uh, East and West of the Rockies. No, uh, 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 that, no, they were four years old and seven. And the four-year-old absolutely despised me. He didn't even know how to spell. Um, he knew how to say, like, a few curse words. I, like, I got you. But anyway, moving on. Um, this four-year-old, I mean, really despised. And my, you know, my hair was standing on by my arms. I was like, I don't like, I don't like this weird so there were these two boys and they, they the older one who was seven years old explained that they when somebody lived there about 12 years ago they were not supposed to be hanging out there but there was a very high wall on the other side of the pool and they went and the little four-year-old fell and the the seven-year-old jumped in to save him and the four-year-old dragged him under. They both drowned. So they told us this on the Ouija board. So the next day, the girl's sister came over to the house to hang out by the pool, and we were all out by the pool. She wasn't going to tell her dad either. And um, she said, hey, Amy, did you know that um, two little boys drowned in this pool? And that's why it stood vacant for so long and we looked at each other we did i mean we didn't tell her so then here i've never broken a bone in my body or ever once and i still haven't to this day but the dad all of a sudden the next day comes home from his you know london trip <laughs> 13 days early it's like he went there and turned around yeah. and he shows up and found me there, and we were up in his master bedroom, just, you know, oh, it was not pretty. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> threw me out, but I was going out, and I ran out the back, and I was, like, in underwear and a T-shirt, and I went, oh, no, 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 the Ouija board, the Ouija board, if he finds the Ouija board, it was under the bed, so I ran back up, and I got the Ouija board, and as I was running out, something tripped me. I mean, there was nothing there. I was running down the, but I broke my foot and I ne I've never broken anything but I know that little brat that little four year old uh, had tripped me I mean uh, it was a panic uh, situation uh, no this is really real uh, and, uh, uh, anyway. uh, yeah well it's ghost night so hey I listen to you every night you're the best uh, Art alright thank you alright you, you have much. a good one take care uh, that would be terrifying uh, in more ways than one wouldn't it really really terrifying to be caught like that <laughs> Uh, whether it was a ghost or daddy, both were uh, no doubt life-threatening situations. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Okay. Um, just wanted to say here, um, I currently live in a house that uh, has a couple of things in it since we've lived here. Now? You live yep. there now? Yep, currently. Yep. It's always, it's always been here. Um, house is about 20 years old, so it was built new. We moved in new. Nothing's ever happened, but something's always here. What do you uh, mean? What what kind of something? Um, it, I guess it has to be a uh, spirit of some kind, because like we've seen things moving in the house. Everybody um, who is here, you know, we've always seen something. What do you mean moving? Um, whether it's objects, 
Um, moving in what way? Uh, at, like physically moving an object and playing games with it, like... Now, do you mean like sort of moving across a table? Do you mean something in the air? What do you mean? Yep, yep. Well, we've seen, I've seen it myself move. Um, I felt it um, like when I um, actually wake me up at nighttime. Um, it's rather unusual. Like I've seen it move objects. In uh, what way? Well, like just from side to side or up or down, and then it will just drop it. Uh huh. Um, it's actually taken objects, uh, and then they've disappeared, and then they'll re reappear like a few weeks later. You know, that sounds a lot like a poltergeist. <laughs> Lovely. Well, you know what else it's done? Um, one time, my brother. This was before he moved out. My older brother. He's reading a book. And all of a sudden, he calls me upstairs, and he's like, Matt, he's like, something happened. I'm like, well, what do you mean? I smelled this awful smell, yeah. and uh, it started burning his hair. What? <laughs> like, seriously, went in the room, and you know that disgusting smell when hair's been burned? I certainly do. Yeah, well, that was the smell in the room, and I'm saying, well, what are you talking about? He goes, well, I was reading b b uh, my book, and all of a sudden, my hair started catching on fire. So he oh, made... that's a strong clue. Yeah, <laughs> the strong clue to move out. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so it, it's it's always um, it's something now, every could day. Now, could you see anything? Was his hair singed? Was oh, actually... yeah, 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 right at the top of it. Not a lot of it, but <laughs> definitely enough to I mean, that's just one thing. There's Every night when I go to bed, it particularly likes picking on me, and it likes picking on my mom every single night. And uh, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you, uh, how can you handle that? I mean, how, how can you possibly handle that? How, how can you not move? Um, <laughs> I haven't had a clue. Like, I've gone on actually vac on vacations, and this damn thing follows me. Like, I'm not joking. I could be in a hotel. And a day later on the trip, I'll be, I'll, I'll just sense it in the room. I'm like, it's here again. <laughs> it actually follows you around. Um. It, I don't know how to explain it, but that's. It, I, well, yeah, it's a fine way. You did fine. The question is, how can you stay there? I mean, how can you stay there even one more night? Um. Burning hair, that's way over the limit for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm here every night, and usually by myself, and, uh, yeah, I'm here right now by myself, and sure enough, 2, 3 in the morning, it starts up. I, I, I record music uh, quite a bit for a living, and uh, it seems to enjoy playing with my equipment, uh, whether it be turns it off, turns it on, resets different uh, uh, banks in, in my synthesizers. Well, it beats having your hair set on fire. Yeah, that's, that's true. All right, I appreciate the call, sir. Thank you. That's not good. That's not good. I know the exact smell he's talking about, and I'm sure you do too. You've, you've smelt burned hair, haven't you? It's awful. But to have your hair self-ignite, that's a really strong sign. Wildcard line, you're on the air. Hi, Art. This is Andy from Largo, Florida. Hello, Andy. How are you tonight? Fine. Good. Got a story about a glowing tombstone. Up in oh, Michigan, that... oh, it's, it, it's really good. Up in Michigan, you know, each town has their little local legends. Uh, there was a story about uh, off at 100th Street out in Byron Center, there's this little cemetery, and they say, well, there's a glowing tombstone in it. And I remember in high school going out here, and yeah, you'd see it glowing through the years. It'd, it'd have vandals. One year, some kids uh, took the stone. Well, the Post Farm family that, mains, that maintains the yard replaced the headstone. And my friend Mark that still is up there said uh, every year, it's around Halloween, it's, there's a big attraction, a, a big group of people that go out there. But anyway, it only glows during a full moon on a clear night. Sounds crazy. Well, I had vacation uh, three years ago. And now, when I went is, up wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me understand. This, they replaced the headstone? Mm-hmm. Because it was glowing, because something was obviously really wrong. So they put a new headstone in, and it, too, glowed right, well, at a full moon. The, uh, the reason they replaced the, uh, the tombstone is because, I guess, some kids got in there and actually, oh, van and actually stole the stone. Ah, I got you. All right. Whatever, yeah. But the new one glowed And the, well. the new one glowed, too. Well, when mm. I, I do it, I was like, oh, please. Well, when I went up there on vacation, I 
looked up the post farm because I used to know the family. And most of the kids are all grown up and have their kids now. But, but Helen remembered me, and she talked to me for a little bit. And it was nice talking to them. And I thought it was their mercury light or something reflecting, you know, because everybody had cornfields out there. And uh, the cemetery is so old. I mean, the headstone said 1843 to 1920. Right. So he'd be, what, 77 years old. Hendrick Meyer, then the Meyer family from the Meyer farm. And she seemed a little stunned when I brought it up. But before I left, I took my, uh, my rental car out there one night, shut the engine off by myself, and I'm looking at this. And it, was a, it happened to be a full moon. And it's sure enough, the, the headstone's going. Well, Art, there was an old man about 10 feet from the, from the stone. I don't know what he was doing out there, but he was just just standing there. Now, it, you know, most people say, well, how do you know it just could have been somebody else? And not, not at 2.30 in the morning, because I'm a night owl. I'm up all night. Anyway, it was just really freaky. So I got in the car and took off and told Mark about it when I called him up a few days ago. And he says, oh, yeah, that's, that's very, they're very common. But in high school, I don't remember hearing about the old man walking around. So they can't explain it. And I guess through the years, uh, even some students from Michigan State actually broke a small chunk off and had it studied. And it, all it is is just granite and, you know, graphite or whatever. Oh, well, so, yes, you know, though, uh, I've seen a lot of movies, and in all the movies, uh, college students who take chips of glowing tombstones die in puddles of mush. Yeah, really. Hey, before you hang up, one more quick story that you'll appreciate. Remember you telling about the car... It stops in a railroad track, then you can see, like, handprints on the back of it if you put powder on it. In San Antonio, Texas, yeah, okay, well, absolutely check, true. Right, well, check this out. I'm a waiter in a restaurant, and a table I had the other night went to Clarksville, Tennessee, for vacation, where his uncle lives. And the same story, same scenario and everything. And I said, oh, come on. He said, well, we had to spread some butter on the back of the bumper, the back, you know, uh, the part of the trunk, the bumper, uh, just underneath it. And then they put some, uh, some powder on it, so the powder would actually stick. Well... They say the same story. They never heard of the San Antonio incident. They never even heard of your show. And I'm thinking, they were telling me this, because I said, because I got family that was raised in, like, uh, Old Hickory, Tennessee. Well, before. I don't know. What did they do? Did they go to a railroad tracks? Is yeah, there's a railroad they, track. Park the car, and, and, and you're saying that it got pushed off, and they had handprints on the car? Exactly. And it, the road's not at an angle, and it was an old school bus in the 30s, and a bunch of kids were hit by a train. And as of today, you know, I know enough about, you know, engineering and stuff. Come on. Your car is not going to just start moving by itself. There's no way. The road's flat. No, absolutely not. The same San Antonio story. So what is it? But they actually saw the handprints. Well, his wife was just so freaked out about it. It, it just it, it bothers her today. Uh, it, would, it would always bother me, and it still bothers me today. <laughs> Why? Because... Of all those souls that you would not expect to remain on Earth, um, there would be the children, right? The innocents, the really young ones. If their lives were taken tragically by a train hitting a school bus, there's no way my mind can grasp the concept of a god that would allow their souls to remain, you know, to push cars every now and then. It just doesn't add up. Either that or the nature of things is not as we would have it be in our world. You know, maybe, maybe there's nothing fair about death at all. I mean, has that ever occurred to you? Everybody thinks, well, death is going to be fair because God's fair and God's good and God wouldn't uh, allow anything bad to happen to our souls, right? But maybe the truth is there's not anything. There's not a damn thing fair about death. Even the innocent children and the most innocent of adults, maybe there's nothing fair at all. That's something to think about. The dark of night, huh? East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Uh, hello, Mr. L. Yes. Hi. It's glad, I'm really glad to have you back. Ah, uh, thank you. Okay, and uh, before I get started, this is a good ghost story about my brother. I wanted to shout out to everybody on FNet there in the Art Bell channel. This is the source, guys. <laughs> I had just told him my story in there, and they said, you got to call her and tell him this. So, All right, so you, so you are. Okay, uh, my brother died a real violent death, uh, and uh, we were at his funeral, and he'd always told us that he'd believe in asshole travel and out-of-body experience and practiced all that, and he told us he would find a way to tell us. So we're at the funeral home, and uh, we're in a little room where there's a Coke machine and vending machines, and my brother Bill says, okay, Howard, 
if, if you're there, let us know. The lights in the room start flickering. The Coke machine flickers. It goes on about five or six minutes and stops. Really? We talked to the guy who works there, and he says that's never happened before. He's never had any kind of problems like that in a funeral home. So we were thinking, okay, that might be a coincidence. We're leaving after the funeral, and he had an old pickup truck that was rust bucket, and we had worked on this radio on it for a long time, over a year, trying to get it to work. Right. And he didn't want to buy a new one for it because it's just an old work truck. And uh, it had never worked. We rewired it, put new speakers, try to hook them up. We're pulling out. As we pull out into the road from the funeral home, the radio comes on. <laughs> it's ZZ Top. It's his favorite song. <laughs> it plays the whole song, and then yeah. the radio goes off, and it's never played since. Really? And... Yeah, that's really. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> you know, in the world of is it a sign or isn't it a sign, that is one hundred percent sign. Well, it's go. It gets it gets better. The light flickering thing. It started becoming more, more and more persistent and really consistent in my life and my family's life. I moved into an apartment about a month later. The light across the street on the street light was flickering for about a week. Then yes. it moved to the light on my side. Yes. And then a few days later, the light downstairs, and then the light above my apartment went to about a week. And my brother called my mother one minute after midnight on her birthday, all her life. To this date, this is the most convincing evidence. To this date, on her birthday, one minute after midnight or two minutes, her phone rings. When she answers it, it's a dial tone. And it still happens. We've had friends over on her birthday just to see it happen. <laughs> now we don't know if someone's prank pranking, but for the oh, first couple of years. I don't think so. That's that's a conscious thing, definitely. But the light thing, is, it's to the point where my wife believes it now because we can be at the mall and it'll happen and she'll go to work. She says, it doesn't happen when I'm not around you. Well, gotcha, I'm around you. Listen, I got to go. We're okay, out. all right, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. I absolutely felt this wonderful love come through me. And so we walked out of the graveyard. It was probably about 4.30, maybe 5 o'clock in the evening. And we walk into the, into the yard, and I'm still feeling all of these. And my husband goes to take a picture, and I thought, oh, maybe they'll show up. So I asked St. Michael to allow them to show up and to show up in this, in this particular photograph. And the odd thing is, they did, but I didn't tell my husband. We got the the film back about ooh, about a year later. Why wouldn't you tell him? I didn't. Sh I don't share stuff like that often because you know I'm kind of like that. A even little bit. even with your husband. Even no, I, I, <laughs> you know. But I I did later because when we got the film back, we forgot to develop it. Yes. And I forgot all about it. So when we got the film back, there's this giant white glowing around me, and I had two St. Michael's medallions, one in each hand because I was going to give them as gifts to people, and I put one in each pocket, and my hands look like they're on fire, and this giant form is radiating above me, and you can see a face. Now, I have a friend who's a graphic artist, and she went looking for faces, and I, I said, I'm not going to tell you where the faces are. You tell me. So she went looking for faces, and she does, like, layouts for magazines. She's an editor. So she's got a very detailed eye. And she found another face, which is directly above the cross in the steeple of the, the mission of Santa Barbara, which looks like a little bit like, you know, the picture that you have on your web of Jesus at the Vatican. It looks a little bit like that. Yes. And um, it, it was just, it was really overwhelming. And then I, I went and I showed this picture to a friend, and she said, I never believed you about your ghost until I went and visited a friend who went to Santa Barbara, and I walked to that graveyard. She said, I, I just had to get out of there. It was, I was panicking. Well, see, now, there's a, another aspect, thank you, of all this that bothers me. And that is graveyards. Again, I'm, I'm going to say this, and uh, I don't know how you all want to be disposed of when your time on Earth is gone. But... Graveyards don't sound too good to me. I mean, in terms of where I think I would like to go when my time comes. I'm leaning toward the ash idea. This graveyard thing, I don't know. Don't want to think that there's any consciousness left, and if there is, that it's stuck anywhere near a graveyard, because that wouldn't be a good place to spend a lot of after time. We're going to have our, uh, by the way, our electronic voice phenomena people on again soon. They record voices in graveyards. 
So you see what I mean? Think about your own final disposal. Do you really, really want to be down six for at least part of the day? Mm. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hello. 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 Yes, sir. Yes. Great. Hello, Art. Where are I, you? I'm in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City. Yeah, all right. Okay, I have this one for you. I was, uh, we're, this road that I'm referring to that these two incidents this happened on the same road in the same year. What, what incidents? Okay, one is on a school night back in high school, there was, uh, I had a grand, I had a stepmother that I had to, uh, pay mileage on her car to use her car to go somewhere. So that's what I was doing. Uh, on a school night, I went to a friend's house supposedly to study. And I went over and I picked up two girls. One was named Sue and one was named Alexis. I hope they're listening tonight. Hey, Sue and Alexis. We were down this road in front of an elementary school. And we were driving. Not very fast. It's like maybe 35, 40. And a man... An elderly man and his dog. You could see, I mean, it looked just real as real can be. Sure. Did what? I hit him. You hit them? I hit the ghost. Yeah. Now, if you can imagine, I have two teenage girls. Did, with you, me. Uh, did you feel a thump? There wasn't time. I had two hysterical teenage girls screaming at the top of their lungs. You have my sympathy on that, but I mean, when you hit this whatever it was, I mean, you hit a dog and a human, right? Yes, sir. Or what was supposed to be a dog and a human. And um, so obviously the, uh, all three of you saw the same thing. They wouldn't be screaming otherwise. And so what did you do? There was no noise. I had to keep my composure and try to settle them down, and I had to try to decipher and disseminate what what just happened. And so... I was able to, and we all realized something did transpire there, and they wanted to go home, and I took them home. And to this day, I, even, I, I didn't even go home and share that with my parents or my mother or my stepmother. Because I had to borrow her car, and I'm supposed to be out studying. And where was this? Outside of Chicago. Outside of Chicago. So if they're listening this morning, um, they could contact me. And, and if, if you contact me, I'll put you all on together, and you can verify that story. They and would... let me tell you, my uncle, my one of my relatives on that same road, he built a nice house about four years later. I went to a Christmas party. And his neighbor is an elderly man. And at this Christmas party, for some reason, I, I started a conversation with this man. Yes. And I asked him how long he lived there in the area. And he said forever. So I asked him, I said, down the road there, was there any man that ever died that had a dog? Yes. And he said he knew his name. It was his neighbor. He died. A car hit him. Ugh. And he died. Oh. And, I'm at this, and I'm at this Christmas party with my relatives, yep. and I didn't say anything, because I didn't understand it. And over the years, I've listened to uh, Father Martin. Well, I still don't understand it. I, it it's, it's the scariest, most worrisome thing you can think about. If ever there's an innocent, it's somebody killed out walking their dog across the road, right? And this guy seems to be reliving getting hit by a car or many cars again and again and again for what? Eternity? And we, the three of us, we have to live that because it's part of our life too. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure it is. Well, uh, well, maybe the girls will uh, get in touch with me. It frequently happens. 
there, there's a whole lot of this that really is genuinely scary because it, it's just unimaginable to me that people would be sentenced to these horrible eternities. Uh, West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. It's Brad. Yes. In Rancho Santa Fe, just half a mile from uh, the Heaven's Gate incident. Oh, yes. I can imagine there may be some ghosting about there. Um, I'm 45 years old. Um, the story I'd like to tell you took place quite some time ago, back in the 70s. If you remember towards the, the end of the Beatles' career, they, they um, embraced uh, transcendental meditation for some time. They sure did. Well, believe it or not, when I was a junior in high school, uh, the people that ran that uh, cult came to our school on career day uh, to a public high school. I'll be darned. Um, under the guise of, they told the people that ran the school that if we all did this meditation that we would all get be better grades. They actually called it the science of creative intelligence at that time. Did they really? And they, 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 they thought schools were foo-foo these days. Well, they bought, they bought it, and <laughs> my, my mother did it. My, every, just about everybody in the school signed up. Really? Well, what happened was after about three or four wait, years... Wait, 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 wait. Hold your story at that point. We have a break, so okay. I'm, I'm just going to hold you over, and we'll finish the story, all right? Thank you, Art. All right, stay right there. at home with my wife. Uh, we were in bed messing around, and we're both kind of guarded people, but uh, guarded as in, um, you know, we don't let a lot of things out. We, I pay attention to a lot of things, and I trust my senses. Well, in bed, um, we were lost in thought, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I got this feeling come over me as if, as if something was in the room with me, and I never felt this feeling before, but like I said, I trust my senses, and I knew something immediately was wrong. That'll take away the moment. Well, it did take away the moment, and suddenly I got a vision in my, in my head that I've never had before, and it was, it was frightening. What I saw was, uh, imagine seeing a pit of hell with uh, brimstone and fire and people in agony, and that flashed through my, my head. You know, I don't know how long it took, but it, it flashed in my head, and I stood up, or you know, I stood up in bed, kind of bowled upright, and I got really cold all of a sudden. This was in the summer. Uh, people in, in ag people in agony. Yes, people in agony, screaming, writhing in pain. Many, many people uh, in agony. Yes, it was just like I said, it was just a brief flash in my mind. Kind of like, uh, listen very carefully. <laughs> of that maybe uh, uh, that brings chills to me because it was very similar to what i what i saw and heard and felt anyways i kind of turned to my left and i saw something flash on the corner of my eye and you know that really frightened me and i turned to the right and kind of swung my feet out of the bed and i saw a figure move from our bathroom into the doorway and i turned immediately looked to the doorway and saw a figure move well that frightened me i jumped out of bed i stood in the doorway and i saw a a figure running down the hallway. And at first I thought this was my wife's uh, son, but like I said, I trust my senses. I knew something wasn't wrong or wasn't right. So I go to my wife and push her off the bed and scream at her, there's somebody in the house, there's somebody in the house. Huh, do I, something, I start, honey. <laughs> I start running down the hallway thinking yes. that someone's trying to harm our children. Sure. And as I get almost to the hallway, um, across from my son's room is our bathroom and... 
Uh, I would be face, directly facing my, our daughter's room. Yes. And when I got in the hallway, a figure, a small figure, about the size of my son, uh, about three, four feet tall, run across the doorway from the bathroom into his room. And of course, I ran into the room, and both of my children are sound asleep. That's the one time you might do that, run in after something like that. If it ran into your, ch into your ch child's room, you probably go in after it. That's right. Well, the, the kicker of this part is, is like I said, it kind of, that made me believe. Uh, but after this happened, my wife came out and said, you know, what did you see? What did you see? And then she started getting scared. And she said, hold on, hold on. And it was like she was praying for a minute. And she said, hold on. And then she calmed down and said, okay, it's gone. I said, what is gone? She says, it. And I said, what is it? And she explained to me, to a T, the person I saw. Well, she's um, I, I, okay, thank you. I don't dismiss that. I don't miss, uh, dismiss, certainly, the fact that prayer can make whatever it is uh, go away. But I don't know that that means that, uh, you know, we always, I, I, I think we think that that means it's erased. You know, whatever it was is now erased, as far as we're concerned, because it's gone. May not mean that at all. That thing is still somewhere. I mean, you just, you didn't erase it, did you? Well, some of you would think so. Or release it would be, it would, maybe that would be the word you'd use, release it. All you know is it's, it's gone, right? You don't know gone to where, you know gone. Nevertheless, a tactic, if it works, it works. Wild card line, you're on the air. Yes, good morning, Art. Good morning. Yes, I am calling from Lorain, Ohio, which yes. is about 30 miles west of Cleveland, and I'm listening to WTAM. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm calling from a haunted house as we speak. Um, let me start by saying that this has been going on ever since I've been about five years old. Uh, we have quite a large family, four children, and my mom is raising us. Sounds like um, you're on a cell phone. Uh, yes, I am, but uh, can you hear me clearly? Oh, I hear you, yes. Okay, well, let me start by saying, first of all, that I have seen things, clouds, um, formations, uh, shadows. Um, people have heard voices uh, calling their name. Um, friends have been slapped in the face in the middle of the night while they were sleeping over. In your house? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, Art, um, I listened to your last Ghost to Ghost, and we were trying to get a hold of this psychic from WTAM that could tell us. Oh, yes, the one yes, who was uh, consulting the, the, the gentleman there, uh, in uh, the sports reporter, I believe, who was living yes. in a haunted house, yes. Yes, because um, me and my brother would like to do a documentary on my house. Um, we are the only owners... My grandfather had built it from his hands, and it took him many years. Um, friends have seen faces. Face. Friends have seen people. Uh, my sister has seen shadows. Do you realize, though, how dangerous it is if, if, you, if in this house that you're in right now, there are things able to physically manifest to the point where they can slap a face, you are in significant danger? Well... My mother has called a parapsychologist out in Cleveland State University, and the parapsychologist has told her that by the symptoms that we have named, that he believes it's some kind of child that likes to play games. And he told us, whatever you do, please do not tell him to go away or it or whatever it may be. Tell him to go to the light. Because if you tell him to go to go away, he will just go to another household. Um, have you ever heard of anything? Well, I was just uh, I was sort of laying that out in a way a, a minute ago. Um, you might call out a name or a religious icon or the name Jesus and get something to go, but that doesn't mean that it's gone. It just means it's gone from where you are. Well, yes. Um, I, I mean, these say. things have been these, these things have been going on for years. Um, lights flicker um i we like i said we have tried calling do you, do you know how many documentary producers have been found in pools of blood 
Really? Do you know wow. how many? Do you know how many? No, I, I, I have no idea. Yeah, me either. But uh, probably quite a few. So, what I'm saying is, careful. Be well, like, really careful. Oh, trust me, Art. We will be. Um, like I said, I am trying currently to get a hold of the psychic from WTAM because we would like to just try to bring the spirit to peace. I mean, um, like I said, I mean, you're right. If this thing can do the things that I've named, then, you know, what danger can, can lurk? I mean, like I said, we're the first owners of this house. Uh -huh. um, and I don't see, you know, we, I, I just don't understand this. And it's quite frightening at times. I'll be sleeping in the middle of the night and I will feel something sit on my bed. Oh, really? Um, oh. I, I, I have a dog and a cat. My cat noticed this. Of this. course your cat knows it's there. Sir, I'm, I'm sorry we're out of time, but you, you'd best get out of there. I, I wouldn't stay in a house like that. There's no way. Especially not the sitting with the, sitting on the bed with me part. Uh-uh. I uh, feel someone pull on an extended leg of the tripod behind me, which I figured was uh, one of the members, Roger, just, you know, fooling around teasing me. Mm. Uh, I actually grabbed onto the tripod, so I gave the tripod a hard jerk to, to pull it away from his hand, which pulled loose and turned around to look at him. And he was there, back about 15 feet. There was no one else around me. Wow. So whoever or whatever grabbed it was something invisible. So I came back on a subsequent investigation just shortly after that and decided this would be a good place to uh, do some videotaping, see if I could get some infrared ghost lights there. Set up the camera at the top of the stairway, focusing down along the stairs. Uh, there was a little light, a little ambient light in the place, but not much. And as I'm focusing down there and uh, watching the screen on my camera, I notice out of the corner of my eye that I see a uh, silhouette, a shadow silhouette, uh, come up behind me, uh, just shining on the wall off to the right of the stairway, which is a very uh, enamel, glossy kind of wall. So even in the dim light, the shadow shows very well. Mm -hmm. Didn't think too much of it. I, I suspected really it was probably, you know, Brendan or one of the other guys coming up behind me. I uh, turned around to look. And no one's there. Mm. Uh, no one near me at all. But there's the shadow, perfect silhouette of a male figure still there. Well, um, that figures. I mean, uh, after all, with what you do. Uh, by the way, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Brendan and company. Uh, I don't know, in this week or two. Yeah, I so, saw that. So, um, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's very typical of. What you're going to get involved in if you go traipsing and, and looking, try, trying to look this stuff up, uh, eventually you're going to find it. I mean, if you go, if you really want to find it, and there are a lot of people who write to me and say, hey, how do I find a ghost? I'd like to experience this. Well, fine. There's lots of places you can go. You can go hang around graveyards if you want to, if you're real serious about it. Sure, hang around graveyards. Listen to stories. There are houses and hotels that are haunted. There are many places you can go if you're really serious about it. But think real hard before you make your decision. Think really hard. Because you might not like what you find. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, this is uh, Leonard in Seattle, listening to you on uh, KOMO. Hi, Leonard. Hi. Oh, man, if I want to tell you. All right. <laughs> this was uh, about 88, 89 when I was in high school. Uh, I grew up in Alabama, about uh, oh, good hour and a half drive outside of my hometown. There was this old plantation house, kind of decrepit, falling down, disrepair, way out in the middle of nowhere. You had to go down a dirt road for quite some time to get to it. Sure. There was a, kind of a story that, uh, that everybody had heard uh, surrounding this place, that when the uh, 
Sherman, I think it was, one of the northern generals was coming down, and they were freeing slaves in a lot of the uh, plantation houses. This one family was very adamant and against the, uh, the idea of having their slaves freed and actually decided that they were going to, they would kill them rather than see them freed. Wow. These guys, they went back there, uh, just started slaughtering people, had them chained up to the walls and just, just killing them. Oh a few God. of the, uh, the people, the slaves, managed to get themselves free, get a hold of some weapons, and started just slaughtering the family. I'll bet. In all, I think something like 50, 55 people just murdered brutally in this one little house in the area surrounding it and that night, and the rest of them just took off. So <laughs> you can imagine the angry souls that it would be uh, hanging around this area. Oh, I can indeed. Mm. So one uh, Saturday afternoon, uh, me and some of my buddies had had a couple of beers, and we were thinking, oh, what kind of trouble can we get into? <laughs> we thought we'd go and, uh, hey, let's go look at that old house, <laughs> investigate it, yeah. see what we can see. Let's go catch us a ghost, Bubba. <laughs> exactly, right. All right, all right. So uh, we get out there, and we're looking around the house. It's just decrepit, falling down, just in terrible disrepair. Mm. We go back out around uh, to where the old slave quarters were, these little falling down cabins and whatnot. Mm -hmm. We get close to this one cabin, yes. and uh, apparently this, from what happened, I would assume that this is the place where all the killing happened. We walk up to it. We're about to go inside. I put my hand on the door, and that's when the noise starts. I, it, the wow. noise? What noise? <laughs> Screaming, banging on the walls. The whole shack started shaking like an earthquake. Completely freaked us out. Obviously, we didn't go in. We took off running. Uh, cars were about 100 yards away. The weird thing is, the noise didn't get farther away as we were running farther away. It was like the noise was right over our heads. We were running like crazy. Keeping for the up with you. Exactly. I looked back towards the house and to the, the shack, and I saw big, bright red eyes looking out this window at us. Ay, ay, ay. Oh, man, we left about three inches of tire on the road getting out of there. Oh. I'm surprised we didn't run into a tree and have a wreck. Well, you, you could have done that ghost or not, but uh, uh, whew. that's as, as scared as I've ever been. And uh, I take it you didn't go back. Oh, no, we never went back into that area ever again. But uh, well, I guess I guess imagine. even these days, after a few beers, that'll slow you up. And you, <laughs> you just don't suggest that kind of thing anymore. Oh, well, you know, we were. Pretty, pretty darn sober right out at the time the house started shaking. Isn't that amazing how, how the <laughs> chemical balance of your body can change just like that? Oh, Boom. yeah. <laughs> Almost right. immediately. Appreciate the story, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Good morning, Art. How are you this morning? Well, um, okay, sort of. Uh, my name is Jim. I'm calling from Florida. Yes, Jim. And I'm listening to you on the sky. On the sky? W-S-K-Y. W-S-K-Y. All right, Gainesville. Yes. Yes. Uh, golly, where to start? I wrote you a while ago, uh, emailed you, but you were inundated with uh, shadow people emails, so I'm sure you didn't get to get to mine. Thousands of them. Yes, yes. I listened to the show last night, and it was absolutely fascinating, and I just want to take just a second to tell you how much my wife and I absolutely love your show. Thank you. Huge fans. Thank you. Um, where to start? Uh, the beginning. Yes. Around 1979, I uh, got involved in a haunted house project. When I say haunted house project, I'm talking a theatrical event that would happen every year in my hometown up in Vermont. Um, you mean they put on a play about a haunted house? Or no, we, we, uh, we found an old building and we put on a haunted house. Oh. But we didn't realize the building was already occupied. Actually haunted. Oh, yeah. Well, the whole thing was started by the local JCs, and they were just doing it as a fundraiser. And I got yanked in. JCs are usually pretty nice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great bunch of people. Oh, oh, you mean the function, not the haunting. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, great right. bunch of people were, uh, uh, you know, getting involved, raised a little money for the community. And uh, they pulled me in because they knew I was a makeup artist. 
And, of course, when you're doing a scary haunted house, you want someone who can do the blood and the gore and all the fun stuff like that. So I got pulled in. Uh, so I went to a meeting at this building, and I pull up in front of this thing, and it looked like the Adams family lived there. It was <laughs> old. It was an old abandoned school building. Well, not yes. entirely abandoned. Some of the offices were still being used, but it had been built around the turn of the century, very Victorian, two-story redstone kind of building. All right, listen, we've got this mentally pictured. Hold on, we'll do it after the break, all right? Okay, sure. All right, all right good. Stay right there. <laughs> Stan, thank you very much. Uh, oh, oh, listen, when you think about it, what better place for hauntings to occur than the yearly haunted house in town? You know, a lot of civic organizations do it for uh, Halloween, right? They all build a haunted house. It goes on in almost every town across America. What better place, uh, particularly over many years, to actually... You know, have the real thing present, the real McCoy, because you'd never be able to separate them, and nobody'd ever believe a word you say, and people can't hear you scream in space. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. Hi. This is Marie in Spokane. Hi, Marie. Hi. Uh, well, I, my story is, is about a ghost that my husband and I have seen. Both around. of you? We've both seen it. The first time I saw it was uh, when I had a daughter she was just a few months old and my bedroom was across the hall from hers and I was sitting in there one night and I looked through my open door into her open door and in the doorway is this woman dressed in white from top to bottom and she's kind of glowing and she's just standing there looking at me and I kind of looked away and looked back and she was gone and I'd seen her a few times after that, and I, I didn't know what it was. But one night I was talking to my husband, and I kind of hesitantly said that I had seen this. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen her too. And it was just really odd, and we started calling her the white woman. And she was dressed in white from head to toe. She kind of looked like it was maybe an old-style nurse uniform. Right. And when we'd see her, she'd just be standing there. I, I wouldn't feel like there was anything wrong going on. It was like she was protecting the baby. And even when we'd moved, and we'd moved when the baby was about a year old, she, was, she moved with she us. She moved with you. She moved with us. And she would kind of stand guard over the baby like a... Now, see, that's really, really interesting. Isn't that weird? Yeah. And she, it was like... You know, she was like some stern librarian, you know. She didn't have this smile. She just would just stand there like she was standing guard. I got you. And, you know, after, and now my, my baby's almost five, and we haven't seen this woman in a few years. But but this this is my youngest daughter. The same daughter, she used to look around and watch things, kind of like you're you're saying you have that picture on the web of the baby sitting in the swing did you see that something. i haven't seen it yet i All was right. gonna look when you i understand what you understand though what i'm saying that baby yeah. that baby is obviously obviously you can see it in the baby's soul it's seeing what we're seeing on film yeah it's we had, really freaky we had this, uh, similar type things with with our daughter i don't ha i you know i never really looked through pictures of well her. then it's obvious what she was seeing isn't she it? was seeing something and when she was about two We'd watch the movie Fairy Tale. We have an older daughter, and we watched it, and, and she saw the fairies. And after she saw that movie, when she'd look up and look around and watch things moving around, she'd say, fairies, fairies. And she'd point <laughs> at the fairies. And she was sure she could see fairies. And we'd just say, oh, oh neat, neat. And she just it kind of, it was just very unusual. She's Children. still 
children are very yeah, interesting. Yeah, you, uh, you do yourself a favor and you go look at that uh, photograph. On, I will, I will. It's on page number two of the ghost photos, all right? All righty. Thank you. Take care. Yes, indeed. There is no mistake about what that child is seeing. Children's expressions are uh, easy to read, and that one's really easy to read, and it's really easy to see that that child sees what the camera has captured. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, Where are you? Uh, right now, actually, I'm on. I'm in holidays in uh, uh, Western Canada. Okay. I'm in, uh, skiing in Banff, but. Um, I'm a I'm a twin. Uh, my parents died when when my brother and I were uh, very young. We were raised by our grandfather. Uh, we we both were in uh, Vietnam, and my brother was killed. Or we that that was our understanding. Um, when I was um, well, I I came home, and um, about two years later, my grandfather died. Uh, he and I were, were living uh, alone in, in his house. Um, the night that he dies, uh, I'm sitting on the end of my bed, sort of contemplating life, feeling a little bit sorry for myself, and I feel someone sit down next to me oh. and put his, arms, put his arm around my shoulder, and, he, and it's my grandfather, and he says, Daniel's alive. Daniel's alive. And da Daniel's my brother. I've got you, yes. And I, I mean, I just froze. I didn't, I didn't know what to think. And I sort of, um, the next day, I had convinced myself that, you know, I, I, I'm convincing myself that this is happening, or, and then I, I tried to blow it off. Uh, that night, um, I was uh, sitting in uh, my grandfather's den on the couch and I can f I, I, I get a feeling and I look over I was just eating by myself and I look over the door my grandfather's there and he says Daniel's alive and he's trapped and you got and you gotta go get him and, you get, um, and he's trapped he's trapped and so um this was not too far not, not too long after um I'd come home and um, I did make some trips back, and I I was assuming that I, I thought I thought he was a POW somewhere. Um, that's what it's that's what it sounded like, yeah. Yeah, and so I'd, I'd made a couple trips. I didn't really tell people what I was doing because I didn't um, I didn't want to get locked up. Um, Clear thinking. So anyway, yeah, so, uh, we don't have a lot of time. So what happened? Okay. So then, um, uh, about a year and a half later, I'm down there again, and I've decided that you know I'm not this. It, this isn't happening. And um, you mean you're back in Vietnam? Yes. Yes. And uh, that that morning, the the phone rings in my room. I pick it up. It's my grandfather on the phone, and he says he's here. Um, he's alive. Uh, anyway, there's, there's short on time. I, he, he was in a Greek, Greek Orthodox um, mission hospital. He, he was alive. He, was, um, he wasn't shot. He, there, he'd have been in an accident of some sort. Um, and he was in a, a semi-vegetated state. A anyway. Um, he was, in other words, he was in a coma. Yeah. And Your brother was alive. You found him in Vietnam, and he was in a coma. And we bring him home. Um, after we get him out of the hospital at home, he was still. Um, I mean, he, he never he never uh, completely recovered. But we, uh, I, I cared for him at home. The day we got home, um, and we're we're getting Daniel up into his room. There was a. Uh, sorry, I'm getting emotional just thinking about this. Um, there was a, a mug that, that uh, Daniels made from a grandfather when we were in, I think, grade six or something. And um, it was sitting on Daniels' nightstand, 
and it was full of hot um, grape Kool-Aid. And the significance of that was that um, Daniel and I would drink hot. Uh, we loved it. And we used to pretend that we were drinking coffee like... Uh, yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. So And, um, yeah, so the, a couple so, of years later, oh, oh, five years ago, uh, Daniel died. And um, I was, so was going to sell the house. Um, I had listed it for sale. And uh, anyway, I got a call from the realtor lady. She was a basket case. I only got a few seconds. Okay, and uh, she went around the house. Um, she couldn't open a single door in the house. They were all sealed shut. Um, and she said that my brother had told her that the house wasn't for sale. <laughs> um, well, I'll just let that one stand right where it is. But the clear implication is that somebody on the other side, if it's urgent enough, important enough, can come through in any way it must, telephone, electronically, or in person. So I guess it is possible, if it's really urgent. This is Ghost to Ghost AM. We'll be right back. up the audio you know the streaming audio mm -hmm. but apparently you're not having a problem no it takes about well a few more seconds for it to click in and then it's on just like a radio cool i mean perfectly i want to throw something at you real quick before i get into my story what is it about you and your red eyes um because i have a good story for you yeah i i i don't really actually want to talk about okay it. well maybe you don't want to hear my story no i'll listen to your story you go right ahead let's hear it well it kind of kicked off when you had uh, gunny on last night and i'm sure you've probably seen and you've heard people mention the movie already amityville oh, of course all right remember the scene about the red eyes through the window yes okay out of that whole darn movie that's the only thing that scared the you know what out of me and uh anyhow during my school years and going to college i always thought there was a presence in my room and this kind of thing and People say, well, you're just dreaming. Well, okay. But why is it when I wake up, it's always right at 3.15 in the morning? And, you know, just like in the movie. And I thought, nah, it's no big deal. Well, this went on and on. And like every other night, I'd always wake up right on the dot. And I had one of those illuminated clocks, 3.15 in the morning. Yes. Okay. Several years later, while I'm married, uh, well, I had the red eyes show up. And Oh, uh, see, you know... <laughs> I was about to say, uh, waking up at 3.15 or a given time every day is not all that unusual. A lot of people do that. Right. But not the red eyes. Well... How did they show up? Well, in this case, um, and, and I, I mentioned Gunny because, I mean, not to go backwards here, but yeah, picture 17 and 18, I've seen those big time. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, he was mentioning how sometimes things will come to you in a dream state or at least you're real relaxed or whatnot. But uh, I was laying in my bed and... All of a sudden, it's like, wham, I'm, I'm being chased. In bed? Uh, I'm in a tunnel with slimy walls. Oh, and, all right, so you're suddenly out of your body. Right, and all I see is these red eyes coming at me. And I'm running like, you know what? Yeah, that'll keep you going. Well, I woke up screaming and yelling. My wife thought somebody was in the house. I mean, she just, it, even the hair on the back of my neck was standing up. Well, this is usually called a nightmare. I know. <laughs> it's supposed to be a ghost story. Guess what? I look at the clock. 3.15. 3.15. I could have guessed. And, oh, maybe a month or two later, not not the running or the chasing, but I'm laying in my bed, and yes, most people would say, oh, you just fell asleep. Well, I'm staring at my door, and, and uh, excuse me, my closet door, like you were saying, you don't like your open door closets. Right. And I don't know if I was hallucinating, I wasn't drunk, wasn't doing drugs, but I'm going to sleep, I thought, and boom, there's the ice, just like that. In the closet? Uh, coming out of the closet. Coming out of the yeah, closet? No no silhouette. Just, just <laughs> Red eyes coming eyes. out of the closet. Just the darn eyes. I'm done with you, sir. I don't want to hear any more of, of that. Red eyes coming out of a closet. Sorry. That's it. That's where I draw the line. I don't want to hear any more. 
That is, that is, of all the nightmares that could be, that's the worst. That's something that I, uh, that's just enough. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. 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 I guess it's me. How are you? I'm, well, I was all right. <laughs> I have a ghost experience that uh, changed my life. Oh, well, they usually do. Go oh, right yeah. A, go right ahead. Um, I took a job as a custodian at a research center in the country. And my first night, this guy, he had a DUI, so he couldn't drive. He wanted me to take him home. And I said, yeah, I would. And we wound up coming home this back way. And he said that he didn't want me to go down this certain street, you know, for fear of ghosts or whatever. Sure. So I, I went down there anyway. Although that's pretty unusual. I mean, if somebody isn't going to go down the street, I mean, you're on your way somewhere, and it's not usual to give a, 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 anybody that reason. We're not going to go there because there might be ghosts. Come on. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> well, I come up at the stop sign. And at the other stop sign on this street, there's, there's an intersection, and there's a car at the stop sign, too. It's a black car. Yes. <clears throat> and it didn't signal. Then it put on its signal abruptly, and I was at the stoplight. And for some reason, I didn't go. I was supposed to go. Then it was supposed to turn. Yes. And I got goosebumps. I started shivering, and my friend is just talking to me. He's holding a conversation because we just met each other. And I can't go. I'm stuck at the wheel, and I'm just looking at this car. And then finally, for some reason, I started inching out. And the car started inching out, too, and I was just trembling, and he was talking to me, and I looked, and in this black car is this woman with this grotesque, wrinkled face uh, just staring at me. Old uh, woman. I mean, it, it just looked dead. And I looked at my friend, and I go, what an ugly woman. And he goes, what are you talking about? I go, don't you see that car right there? And he goes, I don't, I don't see anything. What are you talking about? And I just kept going. I go, do you see me trembling? And he goes, no, I don't see anything. Okay, well, this is the first night. <laughs> the second night, this... I decided to go down there to try this again. So we, down, we got on the same road, same night. It's about 3 in the morning, something like that. Oh. We're driving down. Why would you, wait a minute, <laughs> why would you possibly go back to the same place again after something that terrifying? Why would you go back? I think it's because he told me he didn't see anything, and maybe I thought I was delusional. I don't know. But I decided to try it again. Uh -huh. right. Maybe I should be a ghost hunter. I don't know. All right. <laughs> but anyways, the second night, same night, same road, same everything, almost the same spot. Mm. We're driving down, and there's this house on the corner. And we're driving, and we're coming up to the same stoplight. And I start to, to slow down, and I look. For some reason, I look over at this house, and I look up. And it's a two-story house. And in the second story, there's this room with a red light on and it looks like it's radiating out the window, almost like, um, have you ever developed film? Yes, I have. They use yes. the red light. You yes, know, so yes, you yes. You can see that right. that light is coming out. And I just stopped, and I was like, it, for some reason it intrigued me, and I told my friend again, and he saw the light this time. I go, do you see that light? And he's like, yeah, I guess it's kind of unusual for someone to be developing film at 3 in the morning, huh? And he was like, yeah, I guess. And we look, and we're looking and staring, and then I see that woman's face in the window. Staring back same, at me. Same woman. The same face. Then I told my friend, okay, I'm not delusional. Do you see that? And he's like, no, I don't. So we get out of the car and we go to the house. We knock on the door <laughs> to, to make sure that I'm not crazy. <laughs> and <laughs> this old gentleman enters the door. I mean, we wake him up at 3 in the morning. Of course, he's, he's mad. Upset. What the hell are you on, son? Yeah, pretty much. And, you know, I told him, I said, hey, um, there's, you know, we saw this red light coming out of your second story house, we just wanted to make sure everything was okay. We didn't want to think we're crazy. And he's like, what are you talking about? And we said, upstairs, you know, is there someone here? Or he goes, no, I live alone. I go, do you have a dark room or something? Well, no, I don't have a dark room. I go, well, what's upstairs? He's like, nothing really, just, you know, some, some old keepsakes or something, whatever. And we told him that there was a light on upstairs or this or that. Well, he went upstairs and he said, well, nothing's on or this or that. So we said, okay. Well, as we're walking back to the car, we look into the orchard, which is behind his house, mm. and there's a light on in the orchard. And? And I go, let's, let's go check it out. <laughs> so we go walking over to this light, and we keep getting farther and farther into the orchard, and then finally we come across this light. You only got a few seconds. Okay, my, and so my friend goes, hey, there's a note. So he picks it up, and he puts it in his pocket, and just as he looked up, he goes, I hear something. Do you? And then he, I said, no. So we got back in the car. Real quick. And we're taking off down the street, and I almost hit that woman with the face. And when I got home, we pulled out the note, and it said, nice to meet you. 
<laughs> the young and the stupid. start laughing hysterically and all of a sudden there's not three of us laughing there's four people laughing <laughs> oh really yeah and we look in this guy he's addressed just kind of like us you know hiking boots blue jeans a downfield jacket but his eyes look like the eyes of a you know an animal caught in somebody's headlights yeah and so I, my buddy I, paul I, know, goes, I know the look right my buddy paul goes who the are you yes and the guy continues to laugh, gets up, turns around and walks about three steps away and just basically disappears. Oh, my. And being young, teenage bravado, right, we're thinking somebody's trying to pull a little trick on us. So we all jump up and we're going to go find this guy. Well, it's too dark <laughs> to walk in the secluded area without flashlight. No, wait a minute. Uh, you know, I could take the somebody's fooling around with, with us part of this, uh, except for the fact that you just said he disappeared before your eyes. That's not, what we thought. Not just but you, then, you know, but we're three of you, three of you now. Yeah. Well, that doesn't smack of a high school prank. No, it doesn't. And that's what happened was, after a few minutes, we kind of came back to the fire, and the longer we sat there, the scareder we got. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And pretty soon it was, we think we better move our camp. Right. And so we did. We actually got up that night and moved closer to where we knew there were some other people because the longer we sat there, the more freaked out we were. But I just wanted to throw that in because none of us said, you know, in the name of Jesus, go away. It was basically, who the f are you? And uh, whoever he was turned around and walked away. Well, maybe you spoke the language you knew. Well, that's true. Maybe a drowned camper would understand that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Take care. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. 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 Hi, Art. How are you? Oh, progressively going downhill here lately. Well, I'm hanging in there. How are you doing? Well, actually, what I'm about to tell you actually goes back about 10 or 15 years when I was in the canal zone. Oh, really? Panama yeah. Canal, yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, my sister and I, she lived in Gamboa. She had a Ouija board. Uh. And, uh, yeah, this, this is going to get strange. But... Um, we kind of got to playing around. It's the first and the last time I ever played with one of those things. Um, and we contacted a spirit, if you will, and asked where it was from. And it, and it spelt out Calibra, which is the town of Calibra during the construction days. And my sister asked it to make, uh, if it could make a present. And it said yes. Um. You know, when you're doing all this on a Ouija board and you're getting that much information back and it's beginning to be contemporary, uh -huh. a town you know, uh -huh. at this point, how are you accounting for what you're doing? Well, I'm, I'm really not sure, man. This is the first, this was, like I said, the first and last time we ever played with anything like this. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, anyway, she asked if it, would make, if it could make a presence. And it, it said yes. And it spelt out clock. C L O C K, and then it went to buy. Spelled it out uh, on, the, on the Ouija. Spelled out clock on the Ouija board. It literally. And then went to buy. It, it left. Yeah. Um, my sister had about six cats at the time, and about three minutes after it went by, the cats were running wild in the house, and, and just I mean one of them went behind the refrigerator. Yep. And she had a clock that was made out of some exotic wood cut out um, of, of Panama, of the shape of Panama. And the clock, we had noticed, had turned at a 45-degree angle. Huh. Uh -huh. Now, um, after that incident, we never, ever, ever brought out that Ouija board again. Well, you know, you're lucky that what you what obviously uh decided to interact with you uh -huh. didn't didn't decide to stay and or cross over uh-huh well it, it's just kind of funny uh you know we're talking about construction day era and it, it just kind of freaked us out a little bit because i mean you don't just see clocks like 
turning on walls and things like that. And we didn't physically see it turn. Uh, we just happened to notice later on, within about five or ten minutes, well, that that's, it that's, had... Yeah, sure. It's pretty specific. If it says clock, and then the clock is physically turned... Uh-huh. That'd be yeah. enough. That'd be more than enough for me, especially after all that spelling. Well, it scared the hell out of me, dude. I hear you. All right, thank you. Uh, take care. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Hi, uh, this is Denise from Iowa. Iowa, yes. And uh, when I when I was 17, I I was in in my bed sleeping, and I woke up and I saw a spirit looking down on me. What kind of spirit? Well, he had. Well, this is. I'll describe him for you. I saw him. He had a black hat on. He was blonde hair, white, and he had a red shirt and black jeans on. And I could see through him, but not... I could totally see him. Like, was he actually hovering above you, standing in front of you, sitting... He was, on... he was standing over me. Over you? Yeah. He was looking... Just look down, you know, you're just put your head down look, you know, and uh, then he walked through my window. Walked through your window? Yeah. As in leaving? Uh-huh. And, I, and then I, I jumped up and I looked out in my window and nobody was there. Uh, a lot of people would find it amazing that you would jump up and look out your window. <laughs> I just, and he looked so real to me, so I just, it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, I just can't believe in modern day when we all know that if you go up to a door or a window where something like that has happened, a hand is going to gr grab you and, and drag you through the glass until there's nothing left of you but a shred uh, when you go up to the window like that. So I just can't believe in this modern day you would actually go up to the window. Well, m well my bed was right, right next to the window, so I just, uh. I just looked over at my window. <laughs> okay. I appreciate your story. Thanks. Thank you. Wild card line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, this happened about summer of 97. It's going to have to be a real fast one because our program is ending. Okay. Uh, I lived in the town of, of all towns in Pahrump about that time. Pahrump. Oh, yeah. Great. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Great. Let's end it this way. All right. And uh, I was living with a uh, girlfriend of mine at the time. And this one house is a single wide with attachments made on it and everything. And every once in a while, her four-year-old daughter at the time would come up and say, there's a man in my closet. i go back there and look, nothing there. Closet. And then every time, I'd hear voices standing by the front door or somebody'd hear voices standing in the back room. And we'd go outside, nothing. Dark, and can't see anything. Get a flashlight, don't see nothing. Right. Uh, I'd call her on the phone when I was out on the road. And she'd say, hold on a minute, somebody's in the bathroom. And then she'd say, I just heard a toilet flush. I'm the only one in the house. Because her kids would be over at her mom's at the time or something. Or then the weird things like that would happen all the time. And we'd park one night about a block away from the house. And we just watched the house. And we just saw shadows moving inside the house. There was, you'd see the lights from the next door neighbor shining through the windows. And you'd just see shadows roaming back and forth across the house. And it was like, oh, we need to go. Needless to say, we didn't stay there very long. We ended up moving to another house across town. You know, let me tell you something. Um, there are haunted houses. I, I really haven't said this before, but there are haunted houses here in Pahrump, Nevada. In fact, there are references to them on the, uh, on the World Wide Web. Oh, really? Yeah, right here, of course. Doesn't it figure right in my own little town? <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I that, mean, why not? It seems to happen was, everywhere else, so it might as well be here in my own hometown. And here you well, are, my fin final caller, with a haunting in Pahrump. Yeah, and well, that's the only one I knew about. I lived there for about six years, and that's the only one I knew about happening in there. Well, you're obviously out on the road now, right? Uh, well, I moved back to Nebraska. I just got off the truck, and I'm headed home now. <laughs> so you're, you're really on the last leg of, of your trip. Right, yeah. How does it feel to be back in a little car after being in the truck all that time? Oh, kind of different. I mean, just, I've, well, I've been doing it for so long. I used to have a mail jeep back there in Nevada, and going from a big vehicle to a small one with the steering wheel on the wrong side was all kinds of fun. <laughs> <laughs> good night, my friend. Uh, good night to you.
I think that'll do it for the week, for the night, maybe for this lifetime. From the high desert, I'm Art Bell. Ta-ta. Southwest, I bid you all good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be across the entire world. In the greatest part of it right now, our part, it's Halloween. Welcome to Ghost to Ghost 2001. <laughs> this is a night when all we do is tell ghost stories, nothing else. I know there's a world of things going on out there, but we don't do it on this night. We do one thing only, and we do it very well. We tell ghost stories, real ghost stories, and there's no lack of them ever. Now, I want to qualify this by saying right up front, no lame ghost stories, only the scariest uh, most hair-raising ghost stories that a person could ever relate. That's all we're taking. So if yours doesn't meet up with those qualifications, sit back and listen, because there'll be plenty that will. So those are the rules. Those are the only rules. Your ghost story had better be good. And you should be a good uh, storyteller, too. So that's it. That's all we're doing tonight. I'd like to welcome KLYQ in Hamilton, Montana, 1240 on the dial in Hamilton, Montana. Glad to have you on board the network. That's just great as we continue to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. This is an unusual ghost to ghost tonight. It is an unusual Halloween. It is the first Halloween full moon since the year 1955, and it is the only one uh, until 19 Halloweens more pass. I believe it is a blue moon, blue or not. It's the only full one since 55, and the only full one for 19 more years. So that's the agenda tonight. I, I never have had any doubt that ghosts are real. I know they're real after having uh, presided over this program for the last, I don't know how many years, decade plus many now. I know they're real. I guess the question in my mind about ghosts became somewhat moot probably about four or five years ago. After doing so many of these and after observing things I have observed, I just came to the conclusion that uh, it obviously is real. There really are ghosts, which means that there is survival of physical death. Anyway, nothing but the prime grade A ghost stories are allowed tonight. So before you dial, consider, do you have, are you in possession of, is the best ghost story of all time emblazoned in your mind? If it is, dial. Otherwise, sit back and listen. That's what's coming up. Nothing but ghosts all night long. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Ghost to Ghost AM. Now, one more time, this is your opportunity to phone in the best, scariest ghost story that any of us have ever heard. The scarier, the better. And if it's really, really scary, I'll be really, really happy. Why? Because I'll know that we're having good stories on the air, and I like to be scared like everybody else. You know, doing these shows, really, it, it scares the hell out of you after a while. A lot of times it just plain scares the hell out of you. But there is fun in fear, some types of fear. This kind of fear seems to be fun. Well, it's fun in the telling. It's not as much fun in the doing, as you will discover listening throughout the night. So 
Let us begin. First time caller line, you are on the air. Hi. Art? Yes. Good evening. A, goodish, a ghoulish good evening to you. And to you as well, sir. Yes. Uh, this story takes place... Um, Actually, I'm Rex. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Hmm. And uh, this story takes place about 10 years ago when I was working as a photo lab assistant in uh, Yosemite National Park, California. Yes, sir. Um, one evening after I had finished uh, talking with my folks, I was uh, walking home along the Merced River. And a uh, very pleasant, very pleasant evening. And um, recently I had been looking into the... Uh, folklore, the mythology, some of the history of Yosemite Valley, mm -hmm. which had to do with the Miwok Indians and this sort of thing. Now, as I was approaching my uh, cabin, the tent cabins that all of us employees stayed in, right. I, uh, I, I had absolutely nothing in my mind, completely blank. And I believe that contributed to what happened next. As how, I how, how frequently in your life have you noticed that you've had a completely blank mind? That is somewhat unusual in itself. Yes, it, yes, it was. Um, I mean, just all of a sudden you uh, said to yourself, wow, I'm not thinking about a damn thing. Exactly. All right, so anyway, there you were in that state, and what happened? Exactly. Well, I approached my tent cabin. And as I was standing on my door, unlocking, unlocking the lock, uh, I felt there was something very strange inside this, this cabin. It was twilight, it was dusk, there was no sound going on. You just felt something was there, or you felt something? I felt something. It, it, describe it. Sort of like an, I, I, I could almost feel, I feel an aura radiating from inside it, and it mm. wasn't a very pleasant aura. Okay. So I opened the door, and pitch blackness was inside this cabin. It was like I was looking into dark matter. Darker... And, than black. Darker than black. Yeah. And this dark matter turned and looked at me. Looked at you? Looked at me. Well, to perceive that, you must have seen, or did you just feel that? I mean, how did you know it was looking at you? You know how uh, some people have this third eye, this kind of a psychic sense kind of thing? Mm-hmm. I felt like this thing turned and looked into my soul, mm -hmm. basically. Yes, and was it as empty as your head? Uh, almost. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't be good. But what happened after after I felt this thing was looking at me? Yes. I felt it rush at me, like a hurricane kind oh. of force. It's like that poltergeist swoosh. You oh know? lordy, yes. And I remember this thing hit me, and I completely blanked out. I remember being in this white light but all i could hear was this ghastly scream so it was just good night for you huh well actually this white light hit me and then about a fraction of a second later i remember landing on my back and i looked back up at my cabin and i was 15 feet away from the door my, i don't know how my, my. i got there my 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 had you had not been drinking uh nor i just got off of work just finished no. talking with my folks and i walked sober on. as can be Exactly. What do you think happened to you? Uh, I had the feeling that it was had something to do with the tragedy of the Indian situation in Yosemite Valley. I don't know. I can't really explain it too much. Maybe. I'm going to offer an alternative theory that you may not like. Uh, obviously, what I picked up on in your story was that you were thinking about absolutely nothing, which is rare. I mean, have you ever caught yourself out there, folks? Wow. I'm not thinking about anything. I wonder if I'm okay. It's not something you do every day. So anyway, his mind was blank. His words. When your mind is blank, you are in an interesting, susceptible moment. Really. If the neurons aren't particularly firing in any direction, and it happens, you know, it does happen, then you are very susceptible so what may have happened to him may have happened at that exact moment because he was so vulnerable. Interesting. Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Art Bell. How are you? I'm okay, sir. Where are you? I'm, this is Anthony in Macon, Georgia. All right. And uh, I'd like to relay this ghost story to you before I transform into a canis lupus. <laughs> so... Uh, this story... Uh, do you do that from time to time? Uh, occasionally. Occasionally I do. 
especially on nights like this. Huh? But um, about 1975, I was approximately six years old. I uh, was visiting my grandmother here in Macon, Georgia, and this was shortly after my grandfather had passed away. He was an avid golfer, and he had a heart attack on the golf course. Appropriate. Yes, dying, mm -hmm. dying while he's doing what he does best. And, yes, uh, or liked best, or loved. Exactly. That's the way exactly. to go. Sure. And um, we were visiting my grandparents' house. Now my grandmother was just residing there. And uh, this house had an added-on room that my grandfather had built, designed and built. He was a he was an architectural student from uh, Georgia Tech, right. graduated from Georgia Tech. And uh, this room he had built and designed. And when we had visited, we I would stay in that room and uh, the extra bedroom in there. Sure. And one night I was in there, fell asleep. I wake up out of nowhere. I don't know what woke me up. I just woke up. And at the foot of the bed was a glowing figure, uh, white glowing figure, okay. just staring at me. Now there was no no, no sort you, of facial expression. That's what was I was no, going to ask. Yeah, right, there was no face, okay. no facial expression, but it was facing me because it just you know seemed to be staring at me, sort of a outstretched sort of arms, but you didn't see any arms. It was sort of just maybe sort of a flowing sort of. Uh, that'd, be, that'd be enough for me. Uh, you would right. you would know it was a spirit. Exactly, exactly. So, like any uh, five six year old young man would do, I ducked under the sheets. I said, "Whoa, wait a minute." You know? That would have been my move too. Right under the under the covers. Exactly, because you're always safe there. Yeah. But then I, you know, took another peek, and on that peak, it was still there. Oh, that's bad, because usually when you come out from under the covers, it's gone. No, it wasn't. <laughs> okay. It was gone. It was still there, and then I went under the covers again, and I did not return up from the covers, and I fell back asleep. But, <laughs> but get this. Yes. Now, this is the, the kicker. When I woke up the next morning... Yes, sir. ...on the ground near the foot of the bed was a golf ball. <laughs> <laughs> so your granddad uh, had been there and left a sign for you, a golf ball. I would, either that or somebody was playing a elaborate hoax on me. But, uh, as I you know, I, I still have his, I still have his golf clubs and I have some of his golf balls. So maybe they just happened to be in that room and I just didn't notice them when I went to bed. But it was an eerie, eerie thing. Yeah, I hear you. All right, thank you. Yes, the covers. The covers were always refuge from, uh, for me, it was things in the closet. To this very day, I cannot abide an open closet while I sleep. I will not go to sleep with an open closet. Because a little six-year-old Art was absolutely certain there was something in his closet. Certain. And I was manic about having the closet closed. And uh, how's this for an admission? I still am. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. How are you doing? I'm okay, sir. Where are you? Uh, my name is John. I'm calling from Colorado Springs, Colorado. All right, John. Got kind of an unusual story. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I grew up in a small town in Minnesota. Yes. Um, grew up with a pretty good knowledge of the spirit world or um, demons or ghosts or what have you, that that stuff existed. I believe that it, it existed. Sure. I always felt like there was something in my room when I was growing up. Um, used to have strange dreams. Sometimes um, I would have dreams where I felt like I was being spiritually attacked, where when I woke up I couldn't speak, um, or when I'd go to sleep. It seemed like the, the moments between being awake and going to sleep would be a lot of, a lot of fear. Um, there is a lot of fear. Uh, that's when people have OBEs. That's when they have things that freeze them in place. I mean, paralyze them completely. That's when I think you're susceptible to best seeing across the veil anyway. Yes, I agree. That's a good way of putting it. I think that's a time when yeah. you're sort of wide open to anything that's looking for you. Absolutely. And like I said, I, I, I grew up with this, and 
um, I, I think people are real resilient because I think you can grow up around this sort of stuff and even as I got older things would happen or something would drop in my room and I'd come up with an explanation of how it could have happened um, but every everything will culminate what I'm about to tell you but anyway I, I joined the army in 1989 summer of 89 and about eight months before that um, something really strange happened now what I'll tell you is at the time my mother and father were separated and eventually a couple of years later they would get a divorce right at the time that this story happened my father had not been living with us for probably about four or five months quite a while right uh, I'm sitting in the living room one night watching TV uh, my brother was it was in his room which is on the other side of the living room wall yeah and uh, I saw my father walk through our house um, as a solid as a I mean, solid you know, being your, your real dad I mean he was... absolutely and and people when I tell this story people always say well what year did your father die he didn't die he's still alive today gotcha so it's kind of strange well anyway he walked um, through the hallway and there was a door open on one corner of the living room and that's where I saw him and I was so convinced that it was him and it was about 9.30 at night you know what would he be doing coming home at 9.30 at night and he hadn't lived there four or five months Right. You don't think of that right then. Of course not. So I get up and I follow him into our, my parents' bedroom. And when I had been, been in there for, I guess, about 10 seconds or something, I, I felt a, a very real presence, the same kind of thing that I felt growing up, going to sleep in my room, that same kind of feeling that very hard to describe. But, you know, I, no, know, I, I, know, I know the feeling. No need to describe it. Right. There's something else in the room that's a sentient being of some type. Absolutely. And that's when I... You know, kind of got scared and left the room. And then I met, I walked down the hallway, and I met my brother in his room. And he said, "Did Dad just walk by?" And I said, "Yes, he did." What? Really? Absolutely. Now, <laughs> the really strange part about it is, uh, my father was wearing a particular sweatshirt that I remember him wearing a lot when I grew up. He used to wear it when he'd work on cars in the garage. Yes. So I still remember to this day he had this purple sweatshirt on and a pair of blue jeans, and he wasn't wearing shoes. He was walking in a pair of socks, and he was kind of walking sort of forward on his toes. That's the way he used to walk through the house. And you're telling me that your dad was not dead. Your oh, dad, absolutely not. Your dad was still alive, right? Right. I mean, uh... That's really fascinating, and it's about the second or third story of its kind that I've ever heard. But I have heard a couple of others, sir. Well, and that's kind of what I'm wondering, and I hope maybe you or somebody could shed some light on this, because I've heard of something called the doppelganger. Oh, there's uh, there's a million different explanations for it. Thank you very much. A million different explanations, but one possible explanation is that all living things, present and past, have a spirit that can leave the body. Uh, this has been a particular point of interest, actually, for me for some time. Uh, ghosts of the living. What does that mean? If there are really ghosts of the living, as there are, are certainly of the dead, then it says something fairly profound, I think, about the nature of spirit itself, the, the nature of the soul itself, doesn't it? It's an area that I would like to see some ghost investigators really bore in on. Uh, they tend not to do it, I think, because to them a ghost has to be dead, uh, you know, out of the old living body to be a ghost. Well, I have a different vision of all of this, and it includes the possibility that every living and passed on soul uh, has a nature of spirit that we don't fully understand yet, but the, the kind of call we just had, the kind of report we just got, begins to take us down a path of understanding that may uh, buck up against some of the uh, the mainstream thinking, if you can call uh, ghosts and stories about ghosts mainstream at all ever. Probably not. I'm Art Bell, and this is Ghost to Ghost AM. Take a ride. 
Call Art Bell from west of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. The wild card line is open at 1-775-727-1295. And to call Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0900. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell from the Kingdom of Nine. A full moon, a blue moon, decorates our Halloween Ghost to Ghost program 2001. I'm Art Bell. In the nighttime. Ah, good evening, everybody. Ghost to Ghost continues right now with all of you. You'll convince yourselves before the evening's over. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Yes, Art, I have a... West of the Rockies, call toll-free 1-800-618-8255. Okay, I've got to bleep out your last name. You're not allowed to give your last name. So you made me hit the button. Your your first name is Burke, and you're in Washington, right? That's right. Okay, Burke, what's up? Well, back in 1991... I was a student at the International Summer School in Oslo, Norway. Uh huh. I was one of 60 students and two professors who took the long weekend trip from Oslo to Bergen and back. Yes, sir. And on the last leg of our trip, we stopped in a place called Blåfarverka. That means the blue color works. It refers to the small glass blowing factory there. Yes. Well, we went into this Viking-style longhouse with picnic tables and sat down to eat dinner. Here we were in Norway, and what do you think they served us? Chili. Uh, reindeer? No, chili. Chili? Yes. Chili. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. The guy sitting across from me was from Texas. His name is Andrew. I bet he could believe it. Oh, yeah. He said something like, oh, boy, chili. They knew I was coming. Uh-huh. Well, I didn't like chili. I just ate bread. It's a nice dinner roll for us. After we finished eating, Andrew picked up this sugar cube from a little bowl. He said, you see this? I'm going to feed it to that goat out there. Goat? Goat, yes. There was a little little barnyard with a little barn. I think it was a petting zoo. Oh, yes. All right. Well, anyway... I said to Andrew, you can't do that. It says on the sign out there in Norwegian, English, and German, please don't feed the animals. Right. He said, oh, yeah? Watch me. I've known kids just like your brother. What? I've known kids just like your brother. No, he's not my brother. Oh, like this guy, anyway. Yes, Andrew. Andrew. Yes, well, we walked outside. Andrew stepped over the two-rail fence. He walked around the corner of the little barn. Then he came running back, climbed back over the fence, and said to me, That goat was evil. It wanted to kill me. He looked around, and he said, Hey, look at that mine over there. Let's explore it. And I said, You got lost in that castle in Bergen. You have a bad sense of direction. You're going to have to get to the point of the story. Yes. We walked into this mine. He looked to the left, and he said, Hi, how are you? Yeah! There's a human head in there. A human head. A human head. I looked, and there was. A human head. Yes, it had purple skin, no eyes, sunken cheeks, and brown, disheveled hair. When I saw that, I made a noise like, and I turned away. When I looked back, it was gone. The human head was gone. It was gone, yes. All right, uh, I appreciate your call. Human head story. Purple skin, huh? Well, I haven't seen one of those. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Yes. Yes, sir. I'm a retired police officer from the Midwest. Yes, sir. Uh, this happened about 15 years ago. This has bothered me ever since I went on this call. It was a domestic disturbance, non, or it was a dis- disturbance, non domestic, um, when I arrived. A lady told me that there was some loud thumping going on in her condominium. She lived on the bottom floor of a two-story condominium complex. Right. Um, and she walked me to the center, and sure enough, here 
sound like somebody hitting the floor with a sledgehammer. Hitting the hitting the floor. Yes. And, and she lived on the bottom floor. She lived on the bottom floor, and okay. it just it was just unbelievably loud. I I said, well, we'll need to get the manager and go upstairs and see what's going on. She says, well, nobody lives there. I said, all right, well, we'll still need to get the manager and see what the problem is. I ruled out water pipes because no water run through that area. Sure. Uh, the manager we finally got a hold of, this was 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we went inside, and, and uh, she said, what is the problem up here? I don't understand this. And I said, well, the loud thumping. And she says, well, no one's lived in here for about six weeks. This is where Colonel Wilson died. Oh. And I, Yeah. And I said, uh, I had stepped it off from the front of her com, her condominium to the point of the noise right above, right above us. So you were standing about where it would have come from. Right. And, uh, I also stepped it off from the empty com, or condominium to the point where the noise would have come from. Yes, sir. And she put her, and the manager put her hands on either side of her face and said, oh my God. That's exactly where his head was laying when we got him, when we found him. Another human head story. Oh, my God. No, I mean, he had died of a heart attack. But no, he I understand. Laying, laying right there. Yep. Um, and anyway, it was just really strange how everything coordinated and was exactly in, in a line right where he was lying. Well, it's, un it's unusual, you know, that uh, a police officer would actually get to observe all of this. Usually it's all over by the time you're there on this kind of I, story. I wrote it. I wrote it up. Uh, oh, you did? And I knew, uh, of course, I, I knew I'd be ridiculed for it also, but I wasn't. And uh, I never heard a thing about it. But I huh. I said I heard the noise. It was loud. And it, it was uh, very loud. It sounded like something 10 or 12 pounds being dropped right on the floor. And uh, Well, let me ask you this. I, I have had endless emails from law officers all over the country about these kinds of things. Inevitably, of course, they don't want their names used. But a disproportionate number of people in law enforcement seem, you know, to run into this now, you know, or something like it. Uh, well, really, we're, really we're, a, lot, a lot of you. We're normally the ones called on problems. That's why, that's why we hear about it more, I'm sure. Makes sense. But as, far, but as actually being there, like you said, being there when it's happening was, very strange, uh, and that that I've been retired a couple of years now, but that, that it has bothered me ever since that call. And evidently, this lady had moved not too long after that because the thumping just continued. Mm -hmm. uh, now it hit about four times and stopped. And she says this will do per periodically um, throughout the night. I'd move too. I would have moved too. <laughs> Thank you so much. You better take care. Um, that suggests a spirit behind, you know, a spirit left behind. And that brings up all kinds of questions about whether we're really conscious on the other side, and uh, apparently we are. I think from everything I've heard, from all the investigations I've done into ghost phenomena, I would have to say I think we're probably conscious on the other side, although it, it seems fairly clear that a lot, uh, an awful lot of the dead don't know they're dead. They simply don't know they have died. And that's interesting because you would think any attempted interaction of a consciousness on the other side would immediately notice, hey, something's wrong here. I'm passing through walls. People aren't hearing me. Something. You know, I'm dead. Or maybe it's not that easy. Uh, Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, sir. How are you doing tonight? All right. This is uh, Dean calling from uh, Tampa, Florida. Yes, sir. And one thing I would like to say is I agree with you. I think uh, we actually exist on many different levels, in fact, and even as in life and as we pass to death, I think in a sense, I think a lot of us in our sense of awareness, we tend to almost tune into that. I think we each get glimpses of it, but yet maybe not the full picture. And maybe that's intended. I think so, sir. Uh, I would like to uh, actually uh, give you just a moment of clarity here. After I'd actually met a young girl named Clarity in 1985, I had a couple after effects, actually. And I think there's a positive side to actual spirits that you might actually encounter. And I think, in a sense, it might actually be a protection in a sense. And I've seen this in children and things like that. And I've heard stories about that. I had an experience. I was driving to uh, Irving, Texas, in fact, on a major highway coming out of uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And I just bought a new car. I'm driving down. It's about early 1986. As I'm just coming onto the highway, 
this rather large 1970 Cadillac, one of those old ones about nine feet long, sir. Sure. Yeah, it kind of takes one of those. Uh, he decides he wants to take a right and go across three different lanes. Suddenly he just cuts right in front of me, and I start doing 360s on the highway. And this is right at rush hour. We're talking three-way highway, you know, three-lane highway. Right. As I'm doing 360s, sir, I'm starting to come up over on two wheels, and I start noticing, like, almost literally, and, and I, as I look back on it, almost an angelic whirlwind of just, and I couldn't, it wasn't like people, but it was almost like a sense of protection because I can almost remember how quiet it was as I'm doing these 360s, going up on two wheels and watching people drive around me, yet not being touched. And the most amazing thing is after I crossed four lanes of traffic, I suddenly realized I'm going backwards. I look up, and in my rearview mirror, sir, somebody's sitting in my back seat. Holy sir. Well, number one, I was by myself. As I look back in front, I notice all traffic is stopped, and I'm slamming on my brakes. I look up back again in the midsection, the actual um, the uh, barrier between the actual two uh, highways. Right. I'm coming upon that, and I'm I'm doing about 40 backwards. As I'm looking up in the rear view mirror, well, whoever was sitting in my back seat, well, they're gone now. So, um, that one, I'm appreciative of that because I didn't want to have to deal with that. But secondly, I'm watching the barrier and me coming up doing about 40. I stop within about three feet of it. Not a scratch on the car, nothing. I've completely stopped rush hour traffic in the middle of Dallas, Fort Worth. Everybody's literally walking out of their car, looking at me like I've just filmed some stunt movie. And you were uh, no doubt convinced you'd been saved by some sort of angelic presence. Exactly, sir. And all, right, it, all right, all right. Uh, and to make it, yes, sir. To make it very quickly and short, uh, two weeks later, I'm coming around a little S turn in Irving, Texas. Suddenly, it's a rainy thing. All of a sudden, I start losing the grip of the car. I go. I'm just starting to go over a cliff. Suddenly, I stop, sir. I got out of the car. I look around. There's handprints in the front of my car as the rain's dropping like that. You can literally see as somebody tried to stop my car. Uh -huh. There are people out there protecting us. Sir. Shades of uh, San Antonio, Texas. All right, well, that is interesting. Have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered, when you see an accident that's so horrible, you know, a car is totaled, it's mushed, there's nothing, and somehow somebody came through it completely unscathed. It occurs. These things happen. And a lot of times you get stories like the one that man just told. And no matter what uh, chaos was around him at the, the moment, the instant uh, all of this occurred, and it does occur, of course, basically in an instant, an accident like that, he kind of gave it to us in slow motion. It may well be that, and, and who knows why, uh, but there may be some protection, and, and of course everybody would say, well, then why doesn't everybody get protected? I don't know. They just don't. But something that through it all won't let you get touched, no matter the mayhem all around you. You hear about these miracles, the seeming miracles, all the time. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello, Art. How are you this evening? Okay. All right. Well, this uh, was about uh, the middle of last July. Where where are you, sir? Uh, this is Dave and Christopher. Dave? Yes. Okay, Dave. All right. And we were up uh, camping in White Pines up at the northern end of Illinois. Right. And we had just finished a late dinner, and we were sitting around a roaring campfire, starting to get cool out. And we decided to do what most people do around a campfire, see if we could drum up a few ghost stories. Okay. So we're sitting around, and everybody's trying to think, and all of a sudden there's a rustling behind behind us in the, in the dark, yeah. you know, in the trees and such. And we look over, and out comes this little black cat. Yes. And you know how some cats are very socialized. They come by, and they rub up against you. Okay, well, this little thing came and got up in between the people and the fire and started, as she walked by, she'd give you the little tail hug like. You right. Know? Oh, and, yes, yes. Yeah, you know, so she's walking around, and, and people are just watching her walk and touch and walk and hug, and she gets around to these two girls that are just about the other side of the fire from me. And as she does, she stops for a moment, and the girl who absolutely loves cats reaches over and starts to give her a scritch on the back. Right. And the tail goes up, and all of a sudden the girl darts back, screaming, turned completely white, and the girlfriend next to her does the same thing. As it turned out, when she had reached over to scritch the cat, she had actually gone through the cat. Her hand went through. Her hand went through the cat. Through the cat. After this cat had walked around half the people in, at the campfire, touching and hugging as she walked by, rubbing their leg, and everybody swears up and down they felt the cat. Yes. Felt the fur. Yes. 
and everybody starts looking around for the cat, and the cat's gone. <laughs> All right, and there's nothing but like a, a wall of thicket and leaves uh, back where the cat must have gone. Somebody picks up one of these Q-beams, goes back in the direction of where we thought the cat had gone, and there's nothing there. Uh -huh. That's fascinating. So Puts her hand right through the cat, huh? Puts her hand in, <laughs> almost almost right through the cat. As she starts to scratch it, it's like it just started to... No, I understand. ...turn to gas, that would you know? Produce, it would produce a scream, all right. Yes, uh, very, very interesting. Thank you. Now, of course, that suggests that we ponder the possibility of uh, animals uh, also being ghosts, the spirit of animals surviving physical death and appearing to us. Or does it suggest the possibility of something that transforms itself into another state? I don't know. You decide. West of the Rockies, uh, you are on the air. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Where are you? I am in Oregon, Elmira. All right, good. Well, My name first, is Anisha. And your first name is? Anisha. Anisha, that's a good name. Thank you. Yes, I have a story. It was from my grandmother. Sure. Um, her father was dying. He was in the hospital. And one day she came home. She was doing the dishes. And then all of a sudden she could not breathe. Um, so she had to go outside. And there's this intense light. Huh. And she still couldn't breathe. Um, later, uh, after about mm, 15 minutes, I do believe, right. um, finally she could breathe and she felt a sense of relief. Well, during a 15 min minute period, she had to catch a breath or two. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so that, she was more or less fine after about that yeah. period. Yeah. And then her mother, my great-grandmother, and the minister came and told her that her father had died. Oh. And so you think it was at that, uh, that period of time that she could not breathe that the death was occurring? Yes, I do believe so, and that's what she believes also. And just a couple weeks ago, my great-grandmother is ailing. And she was talking with somebody, and the only thing I really understood was Wally, which was my great-grandfather. So I do believe that he is trying to contact her and help her through. Okay, well, consider this. It seems like young children and old people, particularly those who are close to death or near death, begin to see through the veil, begin to see the other side, more readily now people who work in uh, you know homes for the elderly and things like that mm -hmm. can tell you stories about this all day long now of course they sometimes put it off to a feeble mind close to death but uh, most of them don't and when you when you really pin them down uh, they believe that these people are being visited by dead relatives and that uh, some are coming by trying to ease the transition exactly what you said all right. That, I guess that's it then. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Very interesting stuff. Uh, but the youngest and the oldest seem to have the best contact with uh, the other side of the veil and can even perhaps readily communicate. It seems to go away. You know, as the busyness of life and the necessity of living in this world we're in today, and it's no easy world, as we all well know today, you know, that takes up all your attention. It closes the opportunity to get through the veil because you simply don't have time for it. But clear your mind like that young man earlier. Or let your mind be young and not yet uh, uh, trained not to see these things. Or let your mind be old, in which case it may well be preparing to go on to uh, the next world. And as you get toward the very end, if you're lucky enough to live that long and don't go by a truck, you know, or some other violent method and you can feel your death coming, then slowly you are indoctrinated from the other side. That would seem to be the case, and that would seem to be uh, what that story was all about. All right, only the best, only the scariest ghost stories need apply. Everybody else can sit at home and listen, this is Ghost to Ghost 2001. I'm Art Bell. 
Only the very best stories, folks. Otherwise, just sit there and listen to your radio. Short Bell in the Kingdom of Nye. From west of the Rockies, dial 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. Or use the wild card line at 1-775-727-1295. Good morning. Ghost stories. Running with the night. This night, Halloween 2001, I'm Art Bell. Only if you have the scariest ghost stories should you call. Because that's all we're accepting. Stand your hair up on the back of the neck kind of ghost stories. In addition to that, I would like to announce we have two new pages of ghost photographs. And if you would like to give it up this Halloween, I mean that the a ghost photograph you've been hanging up, uh, hanging on uh, on to all these years. Why, I've got a way for you to uh, finally release it on the world. Send it to my webmaster. That would be webmaster at artbell.com, and we'll get it posted. We are accepting ghost stories as of right now on the web. Send it to webmaster at artbell.com. And like the stories, only the very best photographs get posted. So go to your computers and let's see what we get. And we indeed run back into the night. On the first time caller line, you are on the air. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm okay. Uh, what is your first name and where are you? Hi, my name's Melanie and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Melanie, okay, very good. Welcome. Thank you. Um, well, let me get started here. Um, uh, I had an extraordinary evening the night that you had a guest, Dr. Evelyn Paglini. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, it is indeed. Okay. That night, I live on the East Coast, and I went to bed very late. Your show runs very late here. Yes, it and does. I, yes, I went to bed between 4.30 and 5 o'clock uh, that night or that morning, and I was very tired. I immediately went to bed, mm -hmm. and um, I was, my consciousness was alerted. Uh, there were, there's a term, there is something you call shadow people on your website. I've never heard that term before, but I call, I've always called them angels. I've had this, uh, had this happen to me before. And what you call shadow people were running across my bed into my bathroom, which was lit up. It wasn't bright. Why would you presume they're angels if they're dark? Uh, now, the shadow people, as represented on my uh, website, uh, are of varying forms, but they're all dark were these things that you saw dark yes they were but i don't get into dark i don't get into the dark part of it gotcha okay so you, you thought of them as angels yes and they'd, they'd run across your into the bathroom in front of my bed they were running in front of my bed into the into my bathroom i live in a very small apartment and let me just mention that i do live on my own i'm just, i'm a single uh, female okay so i was alerted um, my, my apartment wasn't bright. It was maybe, just... maybe they all have little teeny weeny pea-sized bladders. Pardon me? Maybe they all have teeny weeny pea-sized bladders. <laughs> well, I don't think that's what they were doing. But yet. they were running. They were headed to your bathroom, right? Yes, they were. Uh -huh. But I don't think that's what they were doing. I just okay. think that they, they like to come down and be with me because I've had this happen to me <laughs> before. Yes. Okay. So, um... I was alerted, my consciousness was alerted, but I was still in a sound sleep, and I wanted to wake up. I was frightened because I really thought there was a human being in my apartment, okay, a being that I live on my own. Um, I could not wake up, and um, they kept on running, and, you know, they were having a party in my apartment. Huh. And eventually, like I said, I went to bed between 4.30 and 5 that morning. I eventually woke up. Um, it was very hard for me to wake up. They did not want me to wake up. But eventually I woke up. I went and got a kitchen knife out of my kitchen, and I put it on my nightstand. Went back to bed, 
woke up the following afternoon between 12 and 12.30. So I you don't... mean you would have sliced up one of these little bundles of joy? Uh, well, I wouldn't have sliced them up. If there was a human being, I would have sliced, sliced. the human being oh, up. I see. All right. Okay? Yes. So, uh, it was so real, I actually thought that there could be an intruder in my apartment. Uh -huh. uh, that's how real I've got, I've, I've got the feeling, right. Understand. Okay. So I... I don't, I don't use an alarm clock. I'm very regular. I wake up between 12 and 12.30 every afternoon. I work in the evenings. Mm -hmm. As soon as I wake up, I look at my uh, clock on my nightstand to see how much longer I can sleep before it, it becomes 12.30. I do it all the time. Okay. So I get up, and it's 12.30 the following day. I go to my kitchen to make uh, some coffee, and I notice my clock radio in my kitchen is blinking. Okay, so the power went out. Right. I'm waiting for my coffee to brew. I get my coffee. I uh, go back into my room where my computer is because that's what I do in the morning is I have my coffee and I, walk, and I play on my computer. Yeah. And I notice the clock radio next to my computer is blinking. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, remember, I woke up and I, the clock on my nightstand was not blinking. Yeah, you're right. So. Uh, let me get a little. Hold on. Okay. So I get on my computer. It is on safe mode. Safe mode. Safe mode. For the you non-computer people, that means that it, it may have uh, lost power and tried to reboot and reboots in safe mode. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. It usually reboots. It's very rare that it goes on safe mode. I It'll understand. It'll just reboot itself. Yep, I understand. Okay. And the day on my computer... Uh, the day Dr. Evelyn Peglin was on your show was, I believe, a Thursday. Uh-huh. Okay, so that Friday, the day on my computer was changed to Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> and it has, what started it all, Mr. Bell, was the night that you did your, experience, your, your experiment with Rush Limbaugh. Uh-huh. I haven't focused or meditated on something like that. And I'd say a good three years. Well, it you know what that door. does, yeah. It opens the door. You've got that right. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the story. Yes, well, the combination of uh, your participation in the experiment and listening to Evelyn Paglini and being in the state that you were in without getting a lot of sleep really had you totally open to this sort of thing. Now, bear in mind, everybody, that uh, generally when there is a ghost scene, uh, if you are able to record it, you will record a significant electromagnetic phenomena associated with an appearance or an occurrence. And a sufficiently large electromagnetic phenomena would affect the, uh, uh, the electrical circuits that surround you. Bear in mind, uh, the, you know, the, the, the way it happened. Uh, first uh, one room and then another room, then back to the other room. Pretty strange. Wild card line, you're on the air. Good morning, Art. Happy Halloween. And uh, the same to you, sir. Uh, this is Paul, let's say, from Central Illinois. Okay. Um, I'm a sheriff's deputy. and Oh, you are? Yes. Until okay. a few weeks ago, I worked the midnight shift. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife and I bought our first house uh, last August. It's a nice, like a 70-year-old house, still in good shape and things like that. Uh, well, one night, it was about September 8th or so, mm -hmm. I come home from work, and now my wife, she's a paramedic. She works 24-hour shifts, and on that night she was working, so there shouldn't have been that anybody would, home. That would be back in what we call September 8th, back in the normal times. Huh? Yes. The last of the normal times. Right. That's what makes it easy to remember. Sure. But, uh, my wife, she was working that night, so there should, her car was gone. There shouldn't have been anybody home. I came home for a dinner break about 3 o'clock in the morning or so, and I walked in the door, came in the house through the kitchen. As I come in the kitchen, I see the silhouette of a person standing there by the kitchen sink. And remember, and I was on duty, of course, the first thing I did, seeing a strange person in my house, was to draw my pistol and point it at this person and tell them to show me their hands. I'm sure. Uh, well, there was a little bit of light coming in through the window uh, from a street light, and this person kind of slowly turned her head and looked at me, and I see it's this little old lady, huh. and there was a, you know, you kind of get that strange feeling, and you start noticing that 
she was a little bit translucent. Oh, really? So I, I felt kind of silly pointing my pistol at her when I realized what it must be that was going on. Uh, so the first thing I could think of to say was, uh, you know, what do you want? And Boy, that's pretty good. You know, a lot, some uh, people in your position might have fired that gun. <laughs> I mean, just out of absolute heart-stopping fright. They might have fired that gun. It probably wouldn't have done a whole lot of good. I think she was already beyond the point that my pistol could have hurt her very much. Good that you could realize that. <laughs> Man. Anyhow, she looked at me, and she just had this, if you can imagine, a little old lady who's kind of ornery and just knows that she's pulling the best trick in the world on somebody. She uh -huh. just had that kind of bemused, old lady, ornery look on her face. And so, like I said, I asked her, what do you want? And she just kind of grinned at me and then <laughs> faded out and disappeared. We haven't had any. I haven't seen her since then. I mean, there are, she doesn't, uh, you know, move things around in my house or anything. The only thing that ever happens that might be out of the ordinary is every once in a while, you know, if my wife or, and I are in the uh, living room watching television or something, we have a dog. And there's been a few times that she goes in the kitchen because that's where her food dish is, and she's like the, not the kind of dog that spooks easy. She loves people, and you know, nothing really scares her too much. But she'll be in the kitchen, and we'll just hear her let out a little. Yep, and then she'll just come running back in the living room sure. and cower at our feet. Sure. And the, whenever she does that, I just imagine that uh, kind of ornery look on that old lady's face and figure she's just playing tricks on my dog. And as long as that's all she does, I guess it doesn't really bother me a whole lot. Well, I understand. Nevertheless, uh, what do you think you saw? Ah, uh, well, and I'm sure it was a ghost. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind about that. <laughs> I wasn't dreaming. I wasn't asleep. I'd been at work, you know. I've got you. All right. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, story. Take care. A deputy sheriff. And, of course, seeing is believing. Once you have seen, as that man saw, you will believe. You will never doubt again. You will always know that, uh, that there is something over on the other side. Whether that's to be your destination or not, you cannot know until your time has come. But there is certainly something there, something, something that can come through. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yes, sir. I'm on the air? Yes, yes, yes. Hi, Art. Uh, your name is? Uh, my name is Dave. Dave. Hi, Dave. Hi. I'm uh, from Canal Winchester, Ohio. Okay. Um, I just want to uh, start by saying this um, story began and ended on Halloween night, and it's, uh, it's a pretty scary one, I think. Okay. Um, let me just start by saying I was, um, I was in college. Um, I was dorming with a few friends. Um, off campus at a at an apartment, and about half a mile down the road was a house that I suspected to be haunted. I don't, you know, I've always I've seen those before and things like that, which is a whole different story. But um, I just felt that this house was haunted, just from its the way it looked, the things that were going on. Nothing that actually was going on there. You never seen anybody. Um, just uh, the only thing that ever happened there was that there would be uh, a curtain up in the up in the high window that on occasion was drawn slightly. This was an unoccupied or occupied house? Uh, I had asked neighbors and other people if they'd seen anybody live there. They said no. It, it looked like someone had lived there. I, mean, uh, I always kind of lived near what I would always think of as a haunted house. You, you, you know what they look like. We right. all do from having well, this, seen this, the movies. It just, yeah, it just seemed haunted. No, you never seen any people. You ask neighbors, they never seen any people. I don't know. You so did you finally them. decide to investigate? Yes. That's on Halloween night. Inevitably. I convinced some friends. Um, actually, my girlfriend, who's now I'm getting married to, <laughs> nine years later. She's marrying you? Yes. <laughs> nine, this, is, this happened nine years ago. <laughs> well, I um, guess if you could talk her into doing that. Yes. <laughs> anyway, but, proceed. Um, I coax uh, her and another couple to, you know, let's go down there. It's Halloween night. Let's see if anything happens. <laughs> so uh, we take a walk. Um, this house sat right on a creek, pretty large creek. And right across it, uh, right, you know, it was on, there was a bridge there, a wood bridge. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't know what it was, but nobody was, nobody had the guts to, to get, get too close to the house. We just wouldn't do it. It right. just seemed ominous. It was Halloween. Right. I had convinced them that it was haunted. So what we decided to do is go across the bridge to the other side of the creek, take a walk behind. We're pretty far away. We'll sit there and kind of. Just check things out, see if anything happens. 
Yes. Yeah. Well, nothing happened. So we're kind of, well, what are we going to do now? Let's, let's take a walk down the, uh, down the creek a little while. Maybe 150 feet getting past the house, we noticed something across the other side of the house. It looks like there's a shack there. Right. And we're like, wow, look at that. There's a shack back in the woods. So we all start to approach it, and it appears that someone's sitting inside the shack, actually in the door opening, sitting on a stool with a shotgun in their hand. <laughs> this oh. is on Halloween night at, you know, 12 o'clock at night. Uh, it's midnight. With a and, shotgun. Yeah, it looks like someone's sitting there with a shotgun. Mm -hmm. We, of course, take off. We run. Gotcha. And uh, we catch our breath, and we say, you know, I... Uh, I don't think, I think we know just for seeing things, you know. There was nothing there. It's dark out. You know, let's go back. Let's go back and see if it really was a shack there. So we do. We go back. And instead of, we still see the shack. It doesn't look like the door's open now. So I decide, well, me and the, the guy, a uh, friend of the girl, stay behind. And we decide to venture and see what's going on. The closer we get to this shack, it, it, it just vanishes. The shack vanishes? It, the closer we get, it just starts to... Missed out. It just is gone. There's nothing there. I mean, now we're there where it would be, and we're just standing in the middle of the woods. Holy mackerel. The only, this, the only thing... Yes? Exactly at that same moment that we realize the shack isn't there, there's a graveyard of cars. And when I say a graveyard of cars, it's almost... It was like a... Well, let me just tell you that the, the cars that were there, there had to be, I don't know, we didn't count them, but there was 30 to 50 Corvairs. 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 A lot of Corvairs. Considered to be died. the most deadliest cars ever. <laughs> a lot of Corvairs died. They weren't, they weren't like, uh, crashed or anything. They just were, so, they were just there, you know, they were like, uh, <laughs> weathered. You know what I mean? Yes, so They were weathered. Yes. It looked like vandals that maybe busted out windows. Things like that. Oh, this is too weird. And you're telling me this, this graveyard the, of cars is, is was truth. all around you, or where was it with reference? We were. We were now. We have. Hey, come over. See this. Everybody. We were all there now. You know, there's, there's four of us. Well, including me. Four. And we're standing on top of now cars, Corvairs. They're all Corvairs. Uh huh. They're not. They're not damaged at all, other than just to look like they had been there for 50 years or however long they were made. You know. Right. Right. Um, there was just two different cars there though and they weren't like that they were total the what you could say was fatal crashes they were totaled and i remember what they were because we were like it was a toyota love truck do you remember those yes i do it was a toyota love truck and it's some kind of subaru and they were crushed to what you would consider to be fatal crashes right the corvairs were fine they were just there um that freaked us out pretty good you know we're like but nothing really that I would say supernatural happened. This was Halloween night. That happened. The night did kind of seem kind of spooky, but that happens on Halloween. Um, I'd say it's pretty supernatural if a shack and a, completely disappears and a graveyard of cars appears. Oh, uh, yeah. That's not the end of the story. Art. Okay, go ahead. Um, about nine months later, maybe nine to ten months later, um, it's, it's beginning to be fall. Um, you know, I live in Ohio. It was probably late summer. Right. But it, it was fallish. Yes. Um, I had told lots of people about this story. Nobody ever would go back in the woods to find the cars, but they were there. I mean, I actually, we went back again during the daylight and seen them there. Ah. They were there. They were real. All right. The house still seemed haunted and never seen any people All there. All right, we're running short on time. Okay, okay. Um, about nine months later, a friend of mine tells me that he's seen a bunch of Corvairs parked around that house. And I, I, I was like, are you kidding me? You know, you, what are you talking about? He said, man, I just drove by there, you know, an hour ago, and I seen a bunch of Corvairs parked around that house you were talking about. Yes, I, I was. So I decided to grab a friend of mine, and we went out there. And? And the house was totally destroyed. I don't know how to describe it. Okay. We have no more time. We have there, no more time. Is there a punchline here? No, I was just telling the story. Okay. So it was all gone then? Uh, pretty much. I appreciate the uh, the call, sir. That was paranormal, definitely. Things don't disappear and then become something else. Guys with shotguns in uh, cabins don't disappear. This is Ghost to Ghost AM.
Kingdom of Nye from west of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. And the wild card line is open at 1-775-727-1295. To reach Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0903. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell from the Kingdom of Nye. You know, Crystal Gale's making this song available to you on my website free of charge. Actually, her website, we've got the link on my page. Want a free copy, CD quality? It's there. Midnight in the desert And there's wisdom in the air I've been looking for the answer Are we lost our intuition? Are we running out of time? Midnight in the desert And we're listening We're listening Good morning from the high desert on Halloween. Curious what it's going to be like when you die? Stick around tonight. Tonight, uh, you uh, may well get a glimpse, just a glimpse of what it may be like. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Art. This is Alan calling. Uh, Art, I've li- listened to your show a few times, I guess, and I've wondered occasionally which one of the calls were real, which ones weren't. But uh, I don't know. Are you real? Well, it, I'll tell you a story. So first yeah. of all, turn your radio off. I thought it was uh, No, and I can't continue with the call if you don't. So. Okay. I guess it began when I was six years old. I would swear there was something in my closet. I would watch my closet doors, okay? I knew the exact width of uh, that my closet door was open. Right. Okay? Right. It began this way. Night after night after night, I would watch it. One morning, the closet doors were completely open. I questioned everybody in the house. No one had touched it. Okay, this is how it began. Secondly, I had one of these things I learned from your program was a, I guess, an out-of-body experience. Yeah. I was frozen on my bed. Okay, I, I was tingling all over, and I could not move, and I was scared to death, and I just began praying to Jesus, please, Jesus, please. That's uh, a precursor to an out-of-body experience, yeah. Well, I also did the same thing with the with the door to my room. It was the closet door and my door to the room that I would watch, and there would be a crack in the door. And I would watch that crack every ten minutes. I would look at it. Why? I felt like there was something outside there. You mean in, inside the closet? Out, inside the closet and also outside the room, outside the bedroom. Oh, I see. So, once again, one evening... The door, every time I looked at it, it seemed like it would be a quarter inch or a half inch wider. <laughs> and it got to the point where it was about yeah. two inches to three inches wide. <laughs> and, and one night that was happening, and I couldn't move. And I started to look at the door, and so help me, Jesus Christ, as, as he is my Lord. The door started to have a light green color around the background of it, yes. like the light from behind it. Yes. And a mist around it. And I got up out of bed because I, I had been released from this hold that I used to call it. It was just a hold. And as I approached the door, and as my hand reached out to touch the door, praying to God the whole time, the door fell backwards away. Just yeah, yeah. fell backwards away. Right. And I ran back into the bed and just covered up and started praying. Oh, yeah. So at, at that point, I'd have a heart attack. I mean, and I ran, no, I ran into my mother's and father's room, and I slept there all night, and they acted as if nothing was wrong whatsoever. No, see, that's my, that's my nightmare. That's really my nightmare. 
Oh, God. If I, if, if I were to walk up to a, a, an open closet door to close it because I, I don't allow them to be open, I just don't, and the door fell backward, I don't know what I'd do. I'd probably have a heart attack. Absolutely a heart attack. Wild card line, you're on the air. Hi, Art. Hi. This is Ann from the Springfield, Missouri Ozarks. Hi, Ann. And I have a story for you that, uh, a ghost story that completely changed my life. I, I bet most ghosts, really, it, it, people who have encounters with ghosts have their lives changed, period. Yeah. Uh, but, but go ahead. All right. I'm a Cherokee historic reenactor. We're called Buckskinners. Uh, we have pre-1840 camps. I own an 18-foot teepee where buckskin dresses cook over the campfire and sleep on a buffalo robe. Okay. In 1994, I attended an 11-day rendezvous. That's what we call our camping events. Yes. It was held at Fort Washita, Oklahoma. It was an old Confederate Civil War fort and cemetery. There were about 300 camps, hundreds of people dressed in proper period attire. Sunday was the last day of the rendezvous. Saturday afternoon, uh, we celebrated a lovely wedding of a couple complete with medicine man and ritual ceremonies. Right. That night, a group of the wedding party got really partied hardy, drinking and loud drumming into the wee hours of the morning. Sunday morning, people started tearing down their camps. My husband and I decided we'd stay through Sunday night and break camp Monday morning. Uh, everyone else was gone. The guy next to us uh, stayed in his trapper's tent. He decided to stay along with only two other lodges. The rest of the 300 camps were gone by Sunday afternoon. Okay. It's now 11 o'clock Sunday night. After finishing a wonderful dinner and sitting around the campfire, my husband decided he'd go up on the hill and get our truck and bring it back to the primitive camp. Mm -hmm. While he was gone, all of a sudden, I started feeling really scared, and I'm not the kind of woman that gets scared easily. Right. The hair on my neck was literally standing on end, and I didn't know why. He came back with the truck. Uh, I still had on my white buckskin dress and was holding a candle, lan uh, candle lantern, and I walked to the truck to meet him. He was very nervous himself, saying he felt really strange. From a distance, he said, I look like a ghost. Suddenly, these birds started flying above our heads, screaming a high-pitched, shrill sound. These were ravens and owls. This was at midnight sharp, okay? Yes. And this was totally weird. Ravens and owls don't go flying around no, at midnight no. doing this. No, no. By now, a spirit of sadness and remorse had overcome me, and I was crying and sobbing. We decided, uh, we started hearing drums all over the area. And these were ghost drums, Art. There wasn't anybody there. Some were uh, nearby and others were far away, and they were Indian drums beating fast like war drums. Right. We got into the teepee. I kept the fire going really strong. We smudged the lodge and said prayers. Yeah. Uh, we, could hear, grew, uh, we could hear waves. Uh, we could feel and hear waves of ghosts coming by the teepee all night long, Art. Um, well, there's we a night of terror for you, and, and oh, the, fast, the fast drums, too, the war drums. Everywhere. That's got to give you the feeling that here it comes, baby. Yeah, uh, we could hear jingles on the women's dresses like they used to wear. Right. Sometimes the drums were right on the other side of our number 10 canvas wall. And so you lived through the night. Yes, about 5 o'clock, I suddenly got really tired at 5 o'clock in the morning. I fell asleep with a roaring fire in the candle la uh, lantern lit. Thirty minutes later, I woke up, Art, to a cold, dark teepee, and the canvas door was gone. I, I shook my husband and said, my God, wake up. He got up and looked outside the lodge, and the teepee door was twisted and leaning up against the wall of the teepee. Now, that doesn't make any sense. There was no wind, and I had a heavy dowel on the bottom of that teepee door. There was no way that that thing lifted up, twisted, and was leaning against there. But the really spooky part, Art, no, was that the way. fire was out. The fire was out, yeah. And completely cold. cold. No, I've got you. Uh, 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 bad night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's a wild one. <laughs> a whole Indian nation arose around them that night. Lucky to live through that. Oh, man. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yes. Um, what is your first name? Lynette. Lynette. And where are you? Oklahoma. Okay. Much like the last caller. Right. And um, when I was nine and my little brother was seven, uh -huh. our father owned a service station, which uh, the service station was the front of the building and the, la the back of the building was the, our home. 
and um, as a lot of old service stations used to be, we oh, lived on a major um, highway. America from coast to coast used to be dotted with places where the gas station was out front, the house right, was in the back. Right, this is on Route 66 across the street from oh, the cemetery, no across kidding. the highway. Oh, I traveled that road many times. And it was a highway that um, went, had an overpass, and lots of people were killed there. But we were, um, my father also owned a restaurant just, you know, maybe 100 yards away from the service station. Right. And he and my uh, stepmother were there running it one evening, and my brother and I were home by ourselves. It was a rainy night, and when Dad had closed the service station at about uh, 8, um, he was very security conscious. He was a much decorated naval man, very no-nonsense kind of guy, not a paranormal believing individual. Sure. And um, my brother's bedroom was, the door was, to his bedroom was the door that you could go through and go into the service station. And we were sitting on his bed playing something with our little cars or something, and we heard the door to the service station open, and we knew that wasn't right. And we heard footsteps, and we both looked up at the same time, and we looked at the door, the partition door, Right. and the doorknob was turning, and it scared us to death. And <laughs> I ran to my father's bedroom, and I called the restaurant, and I told Dad that someone was in the service station, and he grabbed his pistol, and he came running. And he came in through the back of the house and came forward and opened, unlocked that door and went through, and there was no one there. But we were behind him, and I looked down, and I saw wet footsteps uh -huh. leading from the front door to that door. Dad, I don't think, looked down. He was just checking the front the Looking, service station door. Well, yes, of course. And he saw nothing. And this was the same man that when he died in 1973, after a lengthy illness, uh, he had built a house downtown in the little town of a thousand, and his uh, wife survived him by three weeks, and she was the archetypal, archetypal evil stepmother, had no friends and not a friend of ours. She had two girls that took care of her that my dad had hired, and um, she died three weeks later, and we were at the cemetery doing interning her, and um, one of the two girls told me that when she, the day she died, the day they called me, before I got there, when someone dies at home, uh, she had been ill and uh, hypochondriac all her life, and so it was not unexpected, and she was older. A police officer just simply is sent, and they verify that someone's died. Sure. And no big deal. So the police officer was standing there talking to one of these two girls and uh, or I guess to both of them and then he turned to he looked toward the front door and then he looked to them he said who was the man that just walked through <laughs> and both of the girls looked at each other and they looked at him yeah. and they said well we didn't see anything what she told me or both of the girls told me is that they had seen a man walking from the front door of the house to the back of the house down the hall to this woman's bedroom since my father's death. Well, there you are. Uh, thank you. I, I, you know, that's typical in, in so many ways. Frequently when one person, one soulmate dies, the other follows very quickly. And, of course, the other aspect of that, again, a police officer there to actually observe this. A lot of cops see these things. A lot of cops. Why? Because they're around uh, extremely stressful situations. Frequently, they are around or close to death and dying because they are called, right, all the time. They're called. So would it surprise you that they would see so many things? Not really. Not really. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hello. Who, me? You. Oh, okay, me. Okay. Yes. Uh, I've got a few stories, but I'll just tell you one of them. Well, um, best, give me your best shot. What is your first one. first name? Heather, and I'm from Susanville. You don't know where that is. It's by Reno. Uh, I'm pretty good. I, yes, I've been to Susanville. Okieville. Yeah, well, anyways. <laughs> yeah, they film Deliverance here. Uh-huh. I'm kidding. Um, well, one of the stories I have is... Some kids were saying, oh, there's a slaughterhouse, and it's supposed to be haunted, you know. I'm like, yeah, right. So I just um, 
me and my boyfriend and one of my other friends went there just to get scared. You don't actually expect to see anything, you know, you just want to get scared. And so we went there one time, we went there a few times. One time, it was like we usually go there real late because we don't want the neighbors to wake up. And we went out there, and one time in the field, we heard somebody humming, like a lady humming a tune. Yes. We were shining the flashlights out there and everything. There was nobody out there. And we were like, oh, man, that's kind of weird. And that wasn't really scary, so we left. And then, like, we came back again. And for the last few days, we had dared each other to go into the actual slaughterhouse by the house. There was a real big house, and then there was a slaughterhouse. It was like a, a shed with a square fence around the front of it. Right. And so the guys took their turns going in there, and then it was my turn to go in. And normally, the gate was open, and nobody had been there forever. The weeds were like four feet tall around everything. So you could tell nobody's been there for years or taking care of it. And the door was stuck open with the weeds. And when it was my turn that night to go, it was the next night, the door was shut, and I'm like, oh, that's just wonderful. <laughs> so I was already scared. So I'm like, all right, I can do this. So and I was trying to show off, you know, because I was the only chick there. So I, like, opened the door, and I just turned, and I go right into the shack part. I looked, there's just, like, a, um, an old mattress and some chicken coop wires, and I was like, oh, this isn't that bad. And then I'm sitting there, and I'm looking around in, like, where the fenced area is, and something, like, to the right of me, the door was on the, door was on the right, the slaughterhouse door and the other side was the left and something from the left started running through the through the weeds like you know like you couldn't see anything but it looked like there was something like four feet tall running through it and went down this side went to the corner and it was like going towards the door on the other side of the gate and I was looking at the door waiting for something to just jump out me and I was oh <laughs> about to God. wet myself and right before it got to the door something right where it has first started running yep. something smashed into the the fence and it just goes doo -doo -doo, and it just shook it back and forth and the whole fence moved and i just dropped to my knees oh and started God. crying and i screamed for my boyfriend and the two chicken shit excuse my language guys were in the car with the windows rolled up and the doors locked <laughs> and i was screaming for him and i was crying i was so scared because i like getting scared and you had to go in yourself yes well because we all dare each other and i went all the way in and i was scared so bad oh i, I can I, imagine this thing that I mean, I was like, what the heck was that, you know? Yeah. And I, was, I didn't know what was going on, because you never expect anything to really happen. And so I was like, ah, oh, and I screamed for my boyfriend. He had to carry me out, because I was so scared I couldn't even walk. What do, you, was, what do you think you saw? What do you think that was? What do you think I was? Well, I was thinking about it, and I don't know, because there was a guy that was bitching at us about, I'm sorry, my language. <laughs> I'm only 22. I can do that. Um, there was this guy across the street that never wanted us to go there, and he goes, no, this place is not for sale, and no, you can't go there. And the house looked like it had it had, it had covers all over the furniture in it and stuff. And there was another couple things that happened at that place, but I'm sure you're in a hurry to get me off the phone, so I won't tell you that. Uh, <laughs> but no, you, you tell a good story. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> something that ran around it, I don't know what that was, but I was talking to some friends, and since it was a slaughterhouse and they slaughtered cows there, yes. it sounds like the cow smacked smashed into the, the gate and was trying to get out. You know what I mean? You know how something goes boom and it, and it smashed into it and was shaking it back and forth. That's the only thing I can think of. Do you think... Maybe a cow trying to get out, you know? Do you think animals have souls? I, I didn't used to, but there's another... Can I tell you something else real quick? Real quick. I was quick. in my apartment one time and I was sitting there. It was 8.30 at night and I was reading a book. It was, I mean, I was wide awake, okay? And my boyfriend's in the living room watching TV and I looked down at the end of my bed and something, I couldn't see it. Four little paw prints jump up on the bed like a kitten or a puppy, starts running towards me, and right when it got to my leg, it disappeared. I go, what the hell was that? <laughs> so I know that wasn't a person. It was obviously a little animal. Some so I'm animal. assuming that I guess they do. I mean, I don't know if they have souls. I really don't think they do. But oh. I can. I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe animals are like that, too. They don't know if they're dead or not. Maybe they don't. has nine lives. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the story. Yeah. Yeah. Have a good night. Oh, I think they have souls. I do, and I know all the arguments that would suggest it can't be, isn't, and the Bible says it cannot be so, and so forth and so on, but sorry, I believe differently. I think animals do have souls. I've always thought that. And if you're a real animal person, whether you're a dog person or a cat person or, you know, kangaroo person, whatever it is you fancy, then you know that all animals have separate, distinct discernible, unmistakable personalities, real personalities. They have passion. They have love. They have dislikes. They have so many measurable things. They may not have speech, but that's okay. 
they don't have to talk to you most times for you to understand what it is they think or want or feel. And with so much, with emotions, with, with so many identifiable intelligence-like uh, traits, well, I think they have souls. I've always thought that, and I suppose I always will. But moreover, I think I have encountered the ghosts of animals. I'm Art Bell. This is Coast to Coast AM. There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. There's a man with... Not much point in fearing him, because when he comes for you, it's your time, right? Might as well go peaceably. Want to take a ride? Call Art <laughs> Bell from west of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies at 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at area code 775-727-1222. Or call the wild card line at 775-727-1295. If you just tuned in, this is Ghost to Ghost. All we do is tell ghost stories all night long, a long tradition on this program. I don't even know how long, maybe well over a decade now. Real ghost stories. I will only take the very best ghost stories, so unless yours is, is a real hair razor, razor just uh, don't bother. Sit at home and listen on the radio, and those with the stories that will bring us out of our seats or keep them in them. <laughs> Only those need call. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Good morning. Good morning to you, sir. Uh, where are you? What's your first name and where are you? My name is Steve and I'm from Union, Missouri. Okay, Steve. I just, uh, last June, my family and I, we moved into a house that we rented. It was an older house and uh, I guess we were there for about a week. And uh, I was sitting in the living room one night and the living room had a shot you could see to the kitchen door. And I was sitting there, and I looked up, and there was this smoky gray figure of a man. And he was standing there. Now, I'm never one that ever believed in ghosts. So I looked down, and I, I was telling myself, well, when I look up, this thing is going to be gone. So I looked back up, and the thing walks into the room. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it stands in the room. Um for for a, a couple seconds and then it just it just like dissipates and disappears. <laughs> um, so I don't want to be one of these people that run out of the house screaming in the middle of the night. Um, so I get my kids and I'm, I'm trying to do this real calmly and we get to the front door and I'm closing the front door and up from the house comes this horrible scream. It was oh. a male scream. Okay. Um, so we, we we left the house that night. Um, I had a business trip so I was gone for about a week. And I came. We, when I came back, of course, I, I had uh, talked myself out of it because I didn't believe in these things, and uh, was hoping maybe it was a first-time incident, whatever. So we, we went back into the house. Um, we had been there for a night, and it was one evening. Um, now, why would you go after a scream? Well, no, no offense here, but I mean, the scream would have done it for me, and yet you went back in the house. I did go back. How did you well, reason that one out? With well, yourself? there was a lot of reasons. There were financial reasons were one. Yeah, I understand you know, those. Yeah, yeah you yeah. know, it's like you just sure. move. You, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you're hoping yeah. the best, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Okay. We went back in, and um, it didn't sound anything like this, did it? Was It wasn't that bad, was it? No, oh, no. It, it was definitely a male scream, though. Um, okay. We went back in, and it was about the second evening there. Um, I, w I was actually talking on the phone, 
and the door started rattling. I mean, actually rattling like somebody was rattling. I thought it was the kids playing, even though I, they had been sent to bed. Right. And I, 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 I told them, you know, cut it out. And my daughter says to me, well, Dad, I'm not doing nothing, and my brothers are asleep. And about this time from the basement, the scream starts coming again. Um, and it got very, very cold. By the time I reached her, she was speechless, of course, and I, I got him out of there. You mean suddenly cold? Yes, very. It, it, was, it was definitely cold. <laughs> and by the time I got to her, she was speechless. I got him out of there, and um, we stayed there for just, well, that was the last night that we ever spent there. And it was about two weeks later we, we moved again. Um, never experienced anything like that before. With some financial loss, I'm sure. Yeah, there was some financial loss, but um, peace of mind <laughs> overruled that. <laughs> and, and living. Yeah. Definitely. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, yikes. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. I mean, you say I wouldn't go back in, but there are a lot of times you move and you just barely make it into the new place. And, God, you wouldn't want to give it up because you were scared, would you? So, you know, I say, hey, take off. That's that. But in reality, in the real world... You'd probably go back into that house. Rather than having to move, you'd somehow rationalize it in your mind. You'd go back in. Once. Wildcard line, you're on the air. Hello. Good evening, Mr. Bell and everybody else in Radio Land. Yes, sir. How are you doing this evening? All right. You know what I have to say? that This is kind of the lamest ghost to ghost I've heard so far. Uh, I want to make a challenge to everybody out there to make it the best ghost to ghost. Well, it then, then it, that can only happen one storyteller at a time. Okay. Well, I do my best, Mr. Bell. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, my story takes place in Flume Fall, Manitoba, way up in the northern uh, part of Canada. Yes. And the story is that there's a lake called Phantom Lake just because it's shaped like a phantom. And it is told that there is an old house where a man used to bring his wife on camping trips. Now, this man was seen to be, was told to be psychotic. And what he did is that he chained, when he went on his hunting trips, he actually handcuffed his wife to a bed. Now, on my gym class, we went across the lake, and we actually went by this house. And why, the, why did he handcuff his wife? I don't know, um, but it is but it is found in the Gazette that um, it is true. I've actually went up to the okay. library, and I have seen it. Yeah, okay. At any rate, I uh, passed by the house my, with, our, with our gym class canoe trip, and one summer evening, me and a buddy of mine, our young brave souls, went out to actually see this house. As we came up to the house, it just seemed to be abnormally cold out that night. As we walked into the house, we just creeped inside, and we saw the bed where the woman was laying there. Oh, sorry, wait. We saw the bed where supposedly the woman was chained up. Yes. We took a look. We saw the handcuff marks on this old mattress on this old metal frame bed. And all of a sudden, we heard a deep mumble, like a... <laughs> surrounded and I like to point out and all the windows were frosted up <laughs> at the time as we, as when I heard that that scared the bejeebers out of me I turned around and I saw help on the window where and I saw steam coming up you mean help you frost. mean help written on the window yes uh -huh. and there's steam coming from it as I turned around me and my buddy saw this we saw a light orb come towards us, shoot back, and just just went right around the corner. Me and my buddy ran out, and we've just never been to that place again. Not bad, sir. All right, thank you very much. I have one question out there for the Laos people. Um, there's, uh, it's told that there's supposed to be a dragon with a green orb. My girlfriend has shown me this picture of this, of a giant dragon with about four Navy soldiers holding it. I'd like to have information on that if anybody could tell me. All right. We'll see what we get. Uh, East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Yeah, my name is Scott. I'm originally from Alabama, but now I live in Burlington, Vermont. Yes, sir. And uh, <clears throat> one of my closest friends is a guy named Eugene McCurry. We've known each other for 25 years, and several times he's told me this story. And... You know how people will tell you something, and if you've known them for a long time, you know they're telling the truth. Of course. Okay, well, this is one of those situations where I'm, I'm convinced, at least he believes that what he saw was the truth. Okay. 
he was born in 66, and I think he said this happened when he was about six years old. So this would have happened probably sometime around 1971, 72. Right. Uh, he had a real poor family, and at that time they were doing a lot of farm work, like picking peas on people's farms, you sure, know? Sure, sure. And he was too young to work. And they, at the time, were living in this place in South Alabama, a little country place with the name of Nyota. And apparently, his family were out in the fields picking peas, and he was standing along the side of this field. And he saw what he claimed were the apparitions of two headless men dressed in black suits walking across the field directly at him. Headless men. Two headless men dressed in black suits, probably like undertakers is the picture I have in my mind, yeah. walking across this field straight toward him, just totally, you know, scared him out of his pants. Sure. And then they vanished. And he's told me this story on several occasions. You know what I would think if I saw that? I would think it was death coming for me. Oh, I'll tell you, you know, of, of all the apparitions, me personally, of all the apparitions that I could possibly see, Head the idea of somebody would... With no head, it's just absolutely the most terrifying. That's yeah, headless, that we... headless is definitely not good. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you hear these stories about Anne Boleyn in the Tower of London walking around without her head. You know, it just gives me the creeps. Yeah. But but that is, that's to me, that's a very that terrifying would have, that story. Would have done it. Yeah, would have done it for me, too, sir. Not for the authenticity of that on several occasions. I wish he was here to, to verify it, but, but I, I swear to God I'm telling you the truth. I'm sure you are. Thank you very much. All right, yep. Headless. Uh, why would something appear to us? Why would a spirit appear to us in a headless form? I can only think of a few reasons. Either as a poltergeist uh, screwing around with us, trying to scare the hell out of us, which uh, it certainly would succeed. Or it could be, as I suggested, I might have guessed that death was coming for me. Two headless horsemen, right? Suits. <gasps> coming for you. And then what other possibilities exist out there? That there is some form of death where headless beings live? Well, rather not think about that one. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi, my name's Robert. I'm from Temecula, California. Hi, Robert. Uh, originally, I was, I was born and raised in uh, Portland, Oregon, and I lived in a small city outside of Portland called Milwaukee. And when I was probably about six years old, my parents had rented this house out in Milwaukee. And for the first time that we came up to the house, we kind of knew that there was something odd about the house. My dad could feel it, and I could feel it, but just me and him were the only ones in my family that could feel it. Feel it. I sure. had an older brother and a younger sister. And we... We were locked into a, a year lease on this place. We couldn't get out of that lease, so we were, we were pretty much stuck there for the year. And during that year, I saw I saw this thing, and to me, it's it was clearly, truly, just pure evil. What kind of thing? It seemed like almost like a a, a, a demon to me. It wasn't. I didn't never considered it a ghost. A shadow person or an angel. It well, just... maybe it was not a ghost. It could have been evil. It could have been evil. So I mean, this... But can you describe it with any better detail? Yeah, this thing used to hang out in my bedroom window at night. And he would sit there all night long watching me. How so... did you stand that? Well, I wasn't scared of it. At six six years old, you've pretty much got an open mind in certain things. Yeah, but six-year-olds can feel evil, too. Yeah, it, well, I knew it was evil. I knew it was bad, but I knew I was safe as long as I was in my room. And I knew that this thing would not enter the house unless it, it seemed like it had been invited into the house. Uh-huh. You know, but it was it was out there. Waiting. Yeah, it was out there waiting. Maybe for an invitation. Yeah. <laughs> I got you, sir. Thank you. Uh, there was an interesting, uh, somebody sent me an interesting fast blast from, uh, I think, the Chicago area. Yeah, here it is. Mandy in Chicago says, you know, can't call at work. I saw, this is tonight, I saw a burly man 
dressed as a lumberjack, flannel cap, suspenders, at my window, looking in, seemingly tired and lost. And then she adds, I'm on the ninth floor of a high rise. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi, Art. This is Nathan from Sacramento. Welcome. Thank you. I, I've listened to, to your show for a long time and goes to ghost for a lot of years, and, and finally finally, I'm calling in with a story. Yes, here you are. Great. This, this uh, happened to my family, gosh, about 15 years ago when my daughters were about four years old. And uh, my ex-wife and, uh, and I sublet a house for the summer. And um, shortly after we, uh, we moved in, we started, uh, my, my ex and I argued a great deal, and our daughters started having nightmares. And um, they would, uh, would tell us that they, both of them had the same, same dreams on different, different nights, and would tell us that they saw a red lady in their room. A red lady? Red lady. Uh, this woman that was all 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 dressed in red, huh. and um, this went on for for uh, gosh, period, the whole time we were there. And uh, shortly before we moved, we were talking to the neighbors, trying to figure out what was going on because it was clear that there was something something there, yeah. you know, some some energy in the house. Sure. And um, found out talking to the neighbors that the original. Um, owners of the house. This was not a real old house; it was about ten years old, probably. The original family, the um, wife, had committed suicide in the children's room, had had cut her wrists, and that uh, when when one of the children came home from school that day, they found their mother in their bedroom covered in blood. Oof. And so we, you know, made the, the connection that that was uh, some energy residual from that was what my daughters had been dreaming about that whole summer and uh, we, were, we were happy to uh, well I, I, I assume that you're aware that um, people who investigate know about ghosts are almost universally agree that people who for some reason people who commit suicide tend to stick around uh, more than more than others at a much greater rate than others now I'm not exactly certain what that means, and I've always tried to think what might that mean, that, that a suicide would be stuck here. Uh, there is there's some sort of, uh, of course, biblical, I think, uh, uh, prohibition against taking your own life. So, it, you know, it may mean that uh, for a while you don't get to go where you're supposed to go otherwise. It could, be, it could also be that just the energy of such things are so intense and so horrible that they imprint themselves on the place for for years after i think that i would rather believe that explanation uh rather than thinking it is a soul stuck in some horrible repetitive thing uh, thank you very much uh, suicides wild card line you're on the air hello yes hello hello oh hi hi uh yes sir it's a pleasure to speak to you um where, where are you sir uh, my name is Mark, and I'm calling from Bradley, Illinois, and I'm listening to you through 890 AM WLS in Chicago. WLS, of course. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, my story goes back to uh, 1989 in the summer when I was 14. And uh, the house that my mom and I moved into uh, late November of 87 there in Pawpaw, Michigan, was uh, a 110-year-old house, and it was it was very... Uh, it, it was very, very spooky. It was across the street from a, from a cemetery. And, well, in, in the summer of 1989, I was watching the Bulls lose, and uh, I, I, I walked from uh, the living room to the, uh, to the uh, kitchen, and uh, the, the door to the upstairs was always kind of a scary place. And the damn thing, it, it, it opened by itself. The door and did as, as you were approaching the, 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 no, the, no, the door to the upstairs uh, area, which there have been rumors and newspaper articles through that area that that uh, the upstairs, uh, a baby had died in, it in the early 1900s, and there was a lady upstairs that died, and yes. it was really, really scary. And, and anyway, I the door opened by itself. And you, I, you, I, I couldn't saw, it. you saw the door with your own eyes open oh, by yeah. itself. Oh yeah, no doubt about it. So like, come on it, in, bud, right? Oh uh, yeah, and it was. L listen, uh, we're yes. at a, I've got to take a break here. Uh, yes. Can you stick around, finish your story? 
Yes, absolutely. All right, stay right there. It's a good place to leave it, where the door opens by itself. I've seen the movies. I know what that means. You go through, and you're a headless guy in a suit. From the high desert. This is Ghost to Ghost AM. I'm Art Bell. From west of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies at 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. The wild card line is open at 1-775-727-1295. And to reach Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0903. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell on the Premier Radio Networks. We are under a Halloween full moon. Won't be another one like it. Uh, hasn't been one uh, like it since 1955, and you're not going to see another one for 19 years. And on top of everything else, this is Ghost to Ghost AF. <laughs> back into a Halloween night, and back... Uh, Back to you, caller. You're back on the air again. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, there, at that point, I, I I looked I looked up to the uh, to the stairs, and uh, well, there there was a uh, there was a woman on a cross. Uh, on, on a, did you say on a cross? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was bad. It was really bad. It was so bad it. Um, I urinated in my pants, and I, uh, I, uh, I went into the bathroom and prayed, pretty much. So. Uh, yeah, it'd be about it, all you could do. Uh, well, I, I, you know, I, I was scared, but you know, it, it. So, I make a long story short, the weird thing about the whole piece of property was, uh, you know, we were renting at the time. Uh, let's see, I, I, I get kicked out of my uh, this place. Because my mom and her boyfriend and stuff, and I, I left in '91 when I was 16, and uh, it took about uh, two years for the house to be sold by the landlord, and uh, the guy who moved in demolished the 110, 115 year old house. He built a new one, and the weird thing is, is that he, he he got married or was already married, had a kid, a baby, who coincidentally lived in right around the same area upstairs. And during that time when he moved in, he tore down about, he, he ripped out about 100, 50 to 100 trees that were pretty much kind of considered sacred. Uh, these were old trees, 100, 150 years old. And right. It, it's almost as if, uh, you know, there were rumors, just all kinds of scary, scary rumors going around through, through the town. And the, the baby died of cancer, his wife died of cancer, and the last thing I heard was the guy just picked up and left. Wow. And it was bad. It maybe was bad. he was trying, maybe all this time in tearing down the house, in building a new house, then in, in tearing down trees, he was trying to stop whatever it was. Had that occurred to you? I don't know. I, I, I don't know, but I, I know that, I mean, it was just downstairs. We had a cellar, and we'd hear strange things at night, and... Uh, at, maybe, one point, maybe I mean, just... at, at one point, when I, when I was seriously depressed as a teenager living there, I... I asked for a spirit to come down and, and try to help me, and I kid you not, Art, I, I heard footsteps at one point coming down the stairs, coming to help me. And then at that point, I thought it was the devil, and I I asked for it to go away. And it went away. Yeah. yeah. Huh. I mean, at one point, I mean, I was so seriously depressed that I, I and it's going to sound bad. It's going to sound really bad, but it's the absolute truth. I asked the devil to help me, to, to, do you, was really... Do you, I, I, do you think the devil helped you? He was offering to help. He, something came walking down the stairs, and I I absolutely prayed for it to go away. I, I just, 
I, I, I've I see. So, 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 the, what you asked for help was the devil, and when it uh, began to approach when I started you, walking down the stairs, I, I got completely scared, uh -huh. completely scared, and I. That's called a foxhole conversion. Thank you very much. But I don't blame you. This is something I've never understood of people who make deals with the devil. Never have understood it, never will. If you conclude there is a devil, there is a dark, evil force with which you can bargain if you so desire. Once you have realized that uh, such a, a force exists, then in your mind, how can you not realize that the opposite force exists, uh, thereby immediately understanding the magnitude of the decision you're about to make, the bad decision you're about to make, that will bear on eternity for you. And, and so once you realize the one, how can you not realize the other? East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Oh, hello. Hi. Art, hi. How are you? Uh, fine. Uh, what is your first name and where are you? Uh, Mike from Sarasota, Florida. Okay, Mike. Uh, this happened when I was about uh, five years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was kind of like uh, a nightmare the way you remember it, but it, it actually happened. And I was laying in my bed, and, um, you know, my parents were in the living room. And all of a sudden I felt this, like, th you know, this presence like everybody talks about. And something like staring at me, and I looked out the uh, window from my bedroom. Yes. And there was a, I, you've been calling them shadow people, there was a, a, a shadow, you know, the head of a, a person. And this was like in 66. You know how they wore the, the men would wear those hats and the long coats? It was wintertime? Yes. Um, that's, that's what he was dressed in, and that's all you could make out. Uh, anyhow, I, I, I just laid there for I don't know how long. I finally was able to just scream. And my parents came running in, and they were like, what's wrong? I was saying, you know, there's a man at the window, a man at the window. And my parents, you know, ran over. And like I said, it was wintertime. All the windows were frosted up, but my window was, there was no frost on it. Huh. And so they went to the front door, and across the, the way was a, a schoolyard. And they could see the, the figure of this man, like I described, going across the schoolyard. So my dad went out after him, and he'd gone around the corner. My dad was going to, you know, follow his footprints, and there weren't any. But what's really strange about it is, I mean, you know, that was pretty scary for me. Uh, but my wife is one who wanted me to call because she found out we've been married 10 years, and 10 years ago uh, my mother told my wife, which she'd never told me, a week before that had happened, uh, my parents... You know, tucked me into bed, and they came in like 20 minutes later to say good night. Yes. And I wasn't there, and they couldn't find me. Looking and you bed. weren't there. I wasn't in bed, so they thought maybe I'd gotten up to you know go downstairs and play or something. They looked all over for me. They couldn't find me. And like I said, this was a little bit before this had happened. Uh, you know, so it was winter, and they looked all around for like three hours. And you weren't there. No, till one in the morning, my father finally happened to look up. I was sitting on the roof of the house and you know there was no way I could get up on the roof you know there was no ladders around or anything I was just sitting there <laughs> what do you think happened to you I have no idea but I mean I have guess you considered the possibility that you were abducted yeah I thought you know I, I thought you might say that because yes. uh, my wife and I have listened to you for a few years yes then you know how I think well uh, you know the the thing about street lights you yes. know going out yes uh, to the point of, like, people that are with me for any length of time will will comment, like, you know, it's so strange when I'm with you. Yes, I've heard well. this from so many people, sir, that street lights uh, extinguish and or go on as you walk down the street. I'm familiar with the uh, phenomena. Some people will attempt uh, to explain it by explaining there are a certain type of, uh, there's a certain kind of street light that does that, but I've never seen one. Never. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, my name's Patty. I'm calling from Northern California. Hi, Patty. Hi, and I listen to you on KDAC. All right. And um, my story is not really that scary. We've had some scary encounters, but it's kind of interesting. Um, many years ago, I lived with a truck driver named Richard, and um, he was a real good stepdad to my kids, and especially my oldest son was really close to him. So um, even when we split up, we all stayed good friends. But uh, he had some problems, and uh, he took his own life. 
Oh. And uh, this was some time ago. But, um, oh, maybe about a year after that happened, uh, my kids and I were living at a isolated ranch in Colorado. And right. uh, it was like an 800-acre ranch on the edge of a wilderness area. I mean, we were way out in the boonies. And um, we were 30 miles from the closest grocery store. And uh, one night, we were sleeping, but my oldest son was 15 at the time, and he was awake. And uh, he said... He hears this truck, this diesel, come up our driveway. And he thought maybe it was a hay truck or something that had gotten lost looking for a ranch or something. Yeah, diesel is unmistakable. Yeah, you know, and he's thinking, well, you know, maybe it's a hay truck, whatever, you know. But he said the guy gets out and starts knocking on the door. So he tried to wake me up, tried to wake up his sisters, tried to wake up his brother. Nobody would wake up. He said it was really eerie because normally I'm a light sleeper. But he said none of us would wake up. So he answered the door, and uh, it was Richard. Uh, and uh, you're came... you're sure? Oh, he's sure. He's sure. Oh yeah, <laughs> he was. He said he came in, shook his hand, uh, sat down and talked to him. And uh, Richard was a big Pepsi drinker. He loved the stuff. And he right. went out to the truck and got some Pepsis and brought them in. And and my son said they sat there and talked for a couple hours and drank Pepsi. And now your son said that. Richard was full form. I mean, right. He, he I asked. I asked him. I said, "Well, what did it feel like when he shook your hand?" You know. Right. He, and he said, "Just like if anybody else shook your hand, solid and real." That's very unusual. Normally, uh, spirits are unable to manifest that physically. Well, he actually came to another time after this, but on this occasion, the odd thing is, in the morning, you know, he's telling us the story and we're kind of going uh, oh yeah all right sure you know right and uh but we looked and there was uh pepsi cans on the table <laughs> and we said this this is we were 30 miles from a store that was in, e even if there would have been one open you know at this time and night. yep well again you know there's something about those who take their own lives I don't know what uh i just know there is something different and by percentage there are many more of them than than of others, and I I don't know what that means. Yeah, well, he really identified identified with his job too, so I wasn't surprised that he came in his truck, you know. Well, it's good to know there's diesels on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Okay. Good night. Good night. Take care. There there just is something about those who take their own life. They're in for a bit of a different ride, I suspect. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Debbie. I'm from Eugene, Oregon. Yes, Deb. I'm originally from Portland. Okay. And uh, I've had several paranormal experiences, and every time there was that um, soul gripping or spine gripping cold that you can't explain. It's not an. No, I know. I hear that from so many yeah, people. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is. But my scariest story is when a ghost yelled at me. Yelled at you? Yes. And um, a friend of mine, an ex-roommate, who's a chiropractor, and his name happens to also be Art, invited me over to this 100-year-old um, house that he wanted me to see because he knows that I love antiques. And this house is in the Selwood District of Portland, where I'm originally from. And this house is really a weird house. It, the base of the house um, scooped out like a skirt, and huh. all of the archways in the house were in the shape of huge skeleton keyholes. It was really a weird house. Ooh, that is weird. It is. Yeah. And then I was looking around, and his roommate was a woman who had children, and we saw the whole house, and her room was decorated in antique lace. It was absolutely beautiful. And there was one room that had nothing in it, and the whole house was decorated, and and I said, why is this room empty? And he said the children were in it, but they didn't like it, so they moved out. Uh -huh. Later on, I came upstairs to use the restroom, which old houses have, and I walked into the room to see the stained glass windows. And halfway through the room, a ghost popped up in front of me. That was, looked like what? He was a large man. He was bald. He had a brown suit and a white shirt. And I knew he was a ghost because I could see the wall behind him. Uh, and he had no feet. I, I could see him, but he, I couldn't see his feet. He just stopped right at his ankles. And he immediately 
raised his finger and pointed to the door. And he said, get out of my house. Oh, my God, oh really? Oh, my God. I swear this is a true story. I ran so fast that I tore the carpet runner off of the stairs when I went down the stairs. Wow. And I went down and told my friend about it, and he immediately wanted to meditate for the ghost to leave the house. Uh -huh. This is really true. And I wanted to leave, but he said, well, let's just sit down and say, you know, to meditate for the spirit to leave. So we did that, and then right above us where this room was where this ghost had been seen by me, I swear to you, we heard footsteps walking out of the room and coming down the stairs, and I was out of the house. We both ran out of the house. We both ran out. I so, would not so go much, back in the house. So much for meditation. <laughs> oh, I had to have him go back in and get my purse. I never <laughs> went in again. Good for you. Next time, don't <laughs> let him talk you into the meditation thing. Yeah, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> Thank I'm you. Sorry. Take care. Oh, my. Where are you? Um, I'm in a little one-horse town called Central City, Nebraska. All right. Welcome. And I hear you from a, on a Omaha station. That's right. Yeah. Um, my dad and I drove tractor-trailer for 15 years together. He drove it many years before that and a few after that, but then I started getting involved having babies and everything, so I quit. Uh -huh. Well, it was during the mid-'70s. And uh, we were hauling pro produce from Homestead, Florida. We picked up avocados and um, limes, and we'd take it to the West Coast. Well, right. sometimes when we had to reload, we'd have to go all the way down the coast picking up partial loads right. to go back to Florida gotcha. or other places. But anyway, um, my dad, this one day, I hadn't been feeling very well, so um, he he took the whole day reloading, the, you know, going down from Northern California down towards uh, Indio there to finish off the load. Well, I got up, and it was my turn to drive, and he got us about, oh, not too far from the Arizona border. And it was beautiful night, clear, everything was just clear, but there wasn't a lot of traffic. And so um, I was feeling great. I mean, I'd been driving for quite a few years, four or five years, about three, maybe four, three to four or five years then, by then. And I, I, I always liked driving nights, and it was a beautiful night. There wasn't that much traffic. And um, I don't know if you know, but there's four lanes with a large median between it and right. going through Arizona there. Anyway, um, I was feeling good. Laid back, just going like mad, and um, I, I guess I'd been—I had my headphones on, and good music, and <laughs> going real well that night. And all of a sudden, I guess about two hours into the night, my dad was already in bed sleeping, and I saw about—oh, I don't know how to say judge this—but I saw way out in front of me a woman, what appeared to be a woman with long hair, in a white dress, a long white dress, in the middle of the highway. Well, she was actually standing on my lane, the, uh, the slow lane. Okay. And she was waving her arms, like, to stop me. Right. Well, I couldn't just slam on the brakes. So you're not, you don't do that with a big rig. No, you, you don't. kill the guy in the back <laughs> and throw him through the windshield if you do. So I, by the time I got up there, I was just about level with where she should have been. I, I got it stopped, and I got out of the truck. I walked all the way around the truck, and I couldn't see anything. And um, when I got back in the truck, I thought, I scratched my head, you know. I thought, well, I'm not tired. There's nothing wrong. What's going on here? There's no gal. Well, then about, uh, uh, my dad said, what's going on? I said, nothing. Go back to sleep, Dad. I thought I saw something in the road. He says, well, are you tired? I said, no. He said, okay. He rolled over and went back to sleep. Well, I drove about four more hours. And the same thing happened again. I saw way out there, I saw this lady, small little woman with a long white dress on. Yes. And uh, waving her arms like mad. And then I haven't had things like this happen. So I thought, you know, what is going on? Anyway, by the time I got the truck stopped again, I should have just passed where she was at. I got, got out of the truck, walked back around the truck, looked everywhere. Because it's pretty well lit out there. Um, there there's like lights you know, uh, along that stretch of highway. Sure. And um, there was nothing there, nothing anywhere. Uh, I might got back in the truck, and my dad said, what's going on? I said, you know, Dad, maybe you ought to get up. <laughs> so he got up, and I told him what was going on, and he said, are you tired? I said, no, Dad, I'm not. I'm getting there, but I'm not tired yet. 
And he said, well, I feel pretty good. Why don't I take over? I said, well, okay, but I'm not going to go to bed. I'm going to sit up for a while. Okay, we don't have much time here. So he went on down the road, and about, uh, he hadn't been driving, but maybe an hour, hour and 40 minutes or something like that, came upon a crashed car in the middle of the median. Yes. A gal in a wedding dress broke her neck and dead. The car was upside down. Oh, my God. That was scary. That's your version of I see dead people. Yeah, well, I had never done it before. <laughs> yeah, that's your version of I see dead people. There's a lot of stories, you know, about truck drivers and the road. And maybe that's because a lot of people die on the road. This is Ghost to Ghost AM. I'm Art Bell. Take a ride? Call Art Bell from west of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222. The wild card line is open at 1-775-727-1295. And to call Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0900. That's Gordon Lightfoot. I got to interview Gordon, and he's uh, he's a haunting kind of guy in real life. He really is. His music uh, is absolutely incredible and reflective of the kind of person that he is. When you hear an interview with Gordon Lightfoot, it's kind of listening to this song. Anyway... We'll be right back. More Ghost to Ghost right around the corner. Once again, into a Halloween night, 2001. Hi there. What is your first name and where are you, please? Hello? Hi. Yes, hi. Hi there. This is Matt calling from Temecula, California. Yes, Matt. Um, a couple years ago, my wife and I were... A house sitting for her parents now mind you this is the house that she grew up in sure um and what was going on is it, it was late at night maybe uh, i guess about midnight we were in the back office playing on the computer and the internet and all of a sudden we started to hear uh, what sounded kind of like a music box you know ding 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 oh yes and it's but it sounded like it was about a foot away from our faces <laughs> it, you know it, there's music boxes, you know, in the house, not really in that room, but around the house. So we just kind of blew it off. A few minutes later, it happened again. We decided, okay, this is kind of strange, so we're just going to go out in the other room, maybe watch some TV, maybe go to bed. Well, we got out there watching TV a few minutes, and ding, 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 right in front of our faces again. Again. About the same distance. This was just getting a little bit too weird. Um, there had been several other occasions in that house that uh, strange, unexplainable things were happening. But um, we decided, okay, this is too strange for tonight. We're going home. <laughs> you know, we, we got the, the, our baby at the time and uh, took her home. Next morning we came back and scared the heck out of us. What had happened was going upstairs, the door to the attic was kind of on the wall with a latch on it. Right. Well, the door wasn't there anymore. It was laying all over the stairs in about 100 pieces. Oh, my gosh. It had been kicked out or something. It had to have been from the inside by the way that the, all the wood was scattered all over the stairs. <sighs> have no clue what it was. The only thing we can imagine was it was the, the resident ghost in the house, and it was mad. Well, whatever it is or was, you wouldn't want it angry at you. Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> I, I understand. Yeah, once you've seen something kicked in from uh, from the inside, uh, <laughs> then you're going to realize that either it is now with you, or it has escaped, or it's laying for you. That would be easily enough for one night. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello, Art. Hello. I'm Jack, and I'm calling from Fairborn, Ohio. Yes, sir. And I have a story that uh, dates back to right around 1970 
when uh, my family and I were living in uh, a town called Edison, New Jersey. Uh-huh. We had, uh, we had been living in an old farmhouse sitting on 12 acres of land. And I was 9 or 10 at the time, and my brother was 4 or 5, and we shared an upstairs bedroom. Um, this had to be 3, 4 in the morning. Um, I felt like I needed to use the bathroom. And so I get up, put my little feet on the floor, and I start walking out to the hallway. Something didn't feel quite right. You know, you have that sinking feeling that something is just wrong. Sure. I go to the bathroom, finish up, come out, walk back in the hallway, and this black presence art. I mean, it was so black, it stood out against the dark of night in the hallway. As a form? As a form. It was just an oval shape, indistinct, but dark. Not good. Cold. Not good. It slammed into me and said, don't go in. I heard this in my head. Don't go in. Don't go in. I was trying to go back into my room, and there's my brother laying there in the bed, being enveloped by this thing. Holy moly. Uh, anyway. And so what did you do? All the cats in the house started yowling, and we must have had six, seven cats. Yeah, cats know about these things. And three come from upstairs, and... Four come out of the uh, my parents' bedroom. Had a lot of cats. And they're screaming, yelling, the fur is flying, and they're in the room. They're with my brother on the bed, and they're beating the hell out of whatever this thing was on him. Yep, there you are. Um, he, after the after it was over, he says, Jack, what was that? What was it? He had ice crystals in his hair. Holy smokes! So he said, I was trying to scream. I was he trying to scream, and nothing would come out. Not a thing. Did you, a after, after, after uh, sir, be, before you go on, after this being had stopped you and you saw it at work on your brother with the cats around, could you have gone forward at that point? No, I was frozen. Frozen, was, yeah. Oh, I understand I that too. there, stuck to the spot. Yep. And so you went to your parents. I run to my parents' room. And there's something wrong with Dennis. There's something wrong with Dennis. Something's in there with him. Right. Immediately, my father wakes up. And he's a, a police officer in, in the town. He, he grabs his gun and he runs into the room. And there's a, this thing is on the wall. And it slides through the window, not out the window, hmm. through the window. My dad grabs my brother and he says to my mom, he's ice cold. He's ice cold and I don't feel anything. <sighs> Takes him to the hospital. The next morning he gets back and he tells me that your brother was was treated for hypothermia. They're going to keep him overnight. Um, Holy smokes. So <clears throat> I am never without cats. My brother's never without cats. Um, I swear by him. I mean, and I don't know what it was, shadow people or whatever it was, but that lingers in my mind, Art. I'm, I'll bet that'll be there forever we, imprinted on your brain. Well, I'll tell you that. I appreciate the call, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Art. Yikes icicles in his hair, treated for hypothermia. I don't know. What do you think happened to him? What do you think that was? What do you think could cause those kinds of physical manifestations? Probably nothing good. Wild card line, you're on the air. Hello. Boy, Art, that story gave me hypothermia. Yeah. Uh, this is Austin in uh, Flagstaff. Yes, sir. Uh, this particular event I'm going to tell you about happened uh, in 1962. Uh, it was right after I graduated high school. It was the summer uh, after graduating. I was uh, I just bought my first car, which was a 1959 Renault Dauphine. I don't know if you remember those. <laughs> we, we all remember our first car. Oh, yeah. Well, it was, it was about the size of a VW Beetle, except it wasn't quite as stable. <laughs> but being this wild-haired 17-year-old, uh, I, I drove this thing around town like it was a Porsche. Oh, yeah. It's, hey, it's a car, you know. Yeah, well, it was a lot of fun. One night, a buddy of mine and I were cruising around out in La Habra, California, uh, near where we lived. And uh, he said, oh, why don't we go out to Sleepy Hollow? And I, and I said, what, what the hell is Sleepy Hollow? He says, well, it's a, it's a place out in Brea. So the next thing you know, this is right around midnight. We're driving down Brea Canyon Boulevard. This is way, this is in the boonies in those days. It's probably all houses by now. Sure. But he, we, we're getting, we're going down the road a couple of miles. He says, "Hey, that, that dirt road up ahead, turn off to the right." So we, I stop and I turn off onto this dirt road and we start going up into the hills. 
and there's just a few cabins there, and the road is so narrow that if another car had been coming down, there was, we, we would have no way to pass because it's very, very narrow and very rocky, and it's just a dirt road. And you can see everything that's there. It's just a few houses scattered here and there, and there's only one road in, and that, that's the only road out. And finally, we get up to the top of the hill, and the, the road suddenly makes a jog to the left, and we empty into this open rectangular area that's about 80 feet square. And right there in front of my headlights is parked a 1939 Cadillac hearse. Well, I can't even imagine how that Cadillac hearse would have even gotten into such a small passageway. Uh, right. But the hearse wasn't even when I was thinking about it that moment, because right there dead centered in front of my headlights is the, is the Phantom of the Opera. That's the only way I can describe it. If you remember what the Phantom of the Opera looked like in the old movies, oh sure, the sunken eyes, yes. the hollow cheeks, the yes. white tail oh. complexion, and these hollow, these huge black pits for eyes are staring right into my headlights oh. with what I can oh. only describe oh. as unflinching menace. Well, it took me about three quarters of a second to turn that Renault Dauphine around <laughs> in its tracks, yes. and I raced back down that dirt road until I got back to the pavement. Uh -huh. We jumped out of the car. I opened the pop, I popped the, the front hood. I grabbed my tire iron. And by this time, we're, we're, we're starting to recover a little bit from the initial shock. And I said, let's go back and take another look. Oh, figured, no, that's, that's where, all right. And I'm thinking, this has got to be a prank. This is somebody playing a gag. You know, this, this can't yeah. be real. Oh, okay. I, might I mean, I'm that. coming back to reality here. We turn the car around, we drive back up the dirt road, very carefully watching everything along the way, to, just in case we're going to run into this thing prematurely. Right. We get to the top of the hill, we make the left jog, we come into the opening, and there's nothing there. Nothing? Nothing. No Cadillac? There no. is. The Cadillac is gone. Huh. The, and, and, the, and, and now, mind you, this rectangle is completely encased on all four sides by trees and brush. It's very heavily brush. And there's only this one little little entrance in and out. So I pulled into the center of the area. We got out of the car. Yes. We looked around on the ground. I could see my Renault Dauphine tracks in the dirt where we had spun around. We walked over to where the, the hearse had been parked. No tracks. Nothing. <laughs> my friend walks over to me, and he looks me in the eye, and he says, Austin, I think maybe this is an omen about your driving. About your dri oh about my driving, and I just laughed it off. We got back in the car, we started driving back down the dirt road. We got back onto uh, onto Brea Canyon Boulevard. We went about a mile, driving as I always normally did. We hit this particularly tricky turn, and the car flipped over three times. Wow, what a story! You swear that's true? I. I, I will send you signed affidavits from the people who were there, from the witnesses. My best friend, uh, Campbell Stark, was with me. I mean, it's, in fact, this is one of the stories that's going into a book I'm writing. That's a hell of a story. I, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I appreciate your call, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Boy, I've got to think about that one a little bit. That's a pretty stark warning. Phantom of the Opera, right in front of you with a hearse. Yeah, you could take that one as a warning, couldn't you? One thing I forgot to ask. Wonder if his driving improved. East of the Rockies, you're on the... Well, he's still here. You're on the air. Hello. Hi, my name is Rosemary. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Hi, Rosemary. How are you? Uh, um, I'm all right, although the stories are getting a little strange. Yeah, that last one was really good. <laughs> okay, my story kind of has a... A little bit a lot to it, so I'll start with this. Uh, my mom and I used to go down to Branson, and we found this lady that had two bed and breakfasts. Right. And she had one in town on the strip, um, and then she had one out of town in Walnut Shade on the outskirts of Branson. And we stayed in that one a lot because it was um, nobody else would stay out there, and it was private. So uh, okay. one, one uh, morning... I wanted to sleep in, and my mom went into town, uh, and I had gotten up um, after she had left, and I was downstairs in the living room playing on the couch with my Barbie dolls, and uh, all of a sudden the fireplace doors started to open and close. 
open and close. And it was a little windy outside, but I mean, these really opened and closed. You mean, uh, what kind of fireplace door is the type that, you know... Uh, the folding kind. The folding kind, yeah. open and closed? Uh-huh. And this was a... I could imagine one or the other, depending on a draft, but yeah. not opening and closing. And that's what it did. And this was a really old, cool house. And I thought, well, shoot, you know, maybe it was a draft, but no. Uh, I said, if something is in this room, then move the handles on this. I had a shopping bag on the coffee table. Yeah. Then move the handles on this shopping bag. And all of a sudden, it moved the handles back and forth and back and forth. And I scrammed up those stairs to the top bedroom <laughs> like you've never seen anybody run before. I sat up in that room. And I looked out the window over the driveway, and I thought, um, I knew exactly at 1 o'clock my mom would come back from in town. Uh, it, was, it wasn't 1 o'clock yet, and uh, there's a bathroom upstairs, and the toilet kept going off and on and off and on, and these doors between the rooms kept opening and shutting. Oh, my. I thought, well, maybe I'll run back downstairs. But I went out into the hall, and I looked into the stairwell, and there was something that looked like from Scooby-Doo and uh, Orbit, Orb-like glowing on the wall. I ran back into the bedroom, and I waited till 1 o'clock, and 1 o'clock on the dot, she pulled in that driveway. I ran down those stairs through that orb so fast. Through the orb? It was, like, right above me. I, it probably could have touched my head. I just didn't even care. I ran down those stairs, opened that door. I was crying, and she wouldn't believe me. <laughs> I understand. Now... But come to find out that the house in town that this lady had in Branson... Uh, there were many stories that uh, people had seen things in that house, but nothing had ever been seen out in the house. That you, we were re in. you realize, uh, other than this audience perhaps, there are a lot of people who would say, what a, what a bunch of baloney. Oh. But, you, you know, once you've seen it yourself, mm -hmm. you, you don't have any more questions. I mean, you don't doubt for one second, do you? No. I'll tell you something else, Art. That night, because we had another night in that house... Um, Mom snored, so I had to sleep downstairs in the downstairs bedroom, and I heard moaning behind the bed, and it sounded like uh, a woman who would have like a bad stomach ache. <sighs> moaning behind the bed. Yes. No. And uh, you know, there's really nowhere to go when you're stuck out there in the middle of the night and you're trying to get through another night. So I just I went and slept on the couch. <laughs> well. Uh, how come your mom wouldn't believe you? I mean, uh, obviously, as you told this story, she must have understood that you were really terrified, but just figured you had a bad dream or what? I, she just said I had a wild imagination. I was alone and got scared. Yeah, how, that's what they always say. How kids do. Yeah, yeah. wild imagination. Go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the call. Thanks, Art. Thank you. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Please wait. Hello. Going once. Hello? Yes, hello. Hi. That was once and a half, and you made it. Uh, where Where are you, and who are you? My name is Arlene, and I'm from Washington. Arlene. Yeah. Hey, you're going to have to speak up good and loud for me, Arlene. You're not too strong. I know. You're in the state of, huh? Washington. Okay. Yeah. What happened to you? Well, I began living in a rental home, and it was like the weirdest experience of my life there were like voices and sounds you know coming up from the basement and it was an unfinished basement and just like the gloomiest one ever Arlene yeah you didn't end up going down there did you no I completely blocked it off I mean, right. I'd right. sit on my couch Listen, we've, we've got a break uh, can you afford to hold on sure most uh, most go to the basement immediately. That's where the dismemberment usually takes place.
to reach Art Bell in the Kingdom of Nye from west of the Rockies, dial 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies, 1-800-825-5033. First-time callers may reach Art at 1-775-727-1222 or use the wild card line at 1-775-727-1295. To reach Art on the toll-free international line, call your AT&T operator and have them dial 800-893-0900. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell on the Premier Radio Networks. There's been some stories this morning. It's, of course, on mornings just like this that these kinds of stories get generated, isn't it? Halloween. Some might say once in a blue moon. Ghost to Ghost on a... Uh, very early Thursday morning. And uh, Arlene is back on the air. Arlene, go ahead. Okay. As I was um, saying before, I'd hear sounds from the basement and people whispering in there and they banging on the ceiling, I guess. And um, what was really strange was whenever I'd go to take a shower, I'd feel like um, a hand touching me and nobody was in the house at all really yeah and then um and there was how old were you at the time i was 22 somewhat fetching i presume uh, <laughs> you see I, I've, I've always wondered what life would be like as a ghost and surely what occurred to you would be one considered diversion i don't know it was it was just really weird um there was like an, a loft going up the stairs, and every night I'd hear some, someone or something stomping up the stairs and going into these little loft rooms. And I don't... Uh, how? Explain to me something. Hmm. How could you be in the shower and feel invisible hands touching you? I don't know. It was like a hand and, and, was and, touching but, me. But in stay, and stay in that house. Well, I didn't stay long. <laughs> I had a lease and I had to fulfill it, but as long as I understand, as long well, as that was up, I was gone. Yeah, that's that's real life. I mean, people have financial obligations, and I always forget about that part. And and they have to do what they have to do. Really strange. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Take care. <sighs> Hands on you in the shower. In a way, uh, if it's, you know, what we think it is, then it gives some hope about the other side. Now, that, that might not be the, uh, the thing that you would uh, do should you become a ghost, or if you're out there and a guy and understand, it might be. Something to think about. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, this is Mary calling from Salem, Oregon. Hi, Mary. Um, I, this story is kind of about my brother-in-law, Don. Okay. And we were having a birthday party, and um, it was kind of a premonition kind of thing. Um, I I decided to go out for burgers with a friend, and I had to wait because somebody had to move their car. And while I was out in front, we were living in the country by myself, I looked over, and there was this woman in like a, a 1800 shirt waist and long skirt, but I couldn't see I couldn't see past her. I couldn't see her feet. You couldn't see her feet. Uh, you, but you should have been able to see her feet. Yeah, it was there. I should have seen her. No feet is bad. Not as bad as no <laughs> heads, but it's bad. It was scary. So I, I looked. I closed my eyes and I looked back, and she was gone. And my friend came out then, and I told him all about it, and he was like, "Oh wow!" But we left, and we we went for burgers, and while we were gone. Um, something really horrible happened. My, my brother-in-law had gone. They decided to go off in the woods. And while they were going down the trail, this boulder just out of nowhere came and, like, took his head off. Oh, my God. And so on the, we got back, and here's the helicopter landing, life flight, and the, and the um, ambulance is down, and they're performing CPR on him and everything. 
Well, no, wait a minute. You said took his head off. Yeah. Boy. Well, the top of his head. They were they were trying oh, anyway. He died. Okay. I get the picture. He, he di died. He, di he didn't make it. No. Um, but what was weird was it turned out, uh, like six months later, a person that we knew came to us and kind of apologized. And she said that a couple days before, my brother-in-law, as being a Wiccan, was out in the forest doing some sort of ceremony with a couple of his friends. And she didn't know what was going on. So she just, like, came up and la, 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 and put her cigarette out in the middle of their circle. And they got really upset. And all of a sudden, this, this like, horrible dog kind of growling, kind of monster-sounding thing came from the top of the hill. And they, they said, get out of the circle, get out of the circle, and tried to fix whatever it was, but they couldn't do it. So aye, aye, aye. He, was, he was worried, and he wouldn't tell me why he was worried for, you know, like two days before the party. And, um, and so some people think, you know, some of us, think that whatever it was came and got him but uh yeah gave great was... he gave great offense yeah <laughs> uh desecrated the circle bad news oh bad news all the way around thank you for the call you're welcome take care yeah well if you are going to open doors you should be prepared to see what's on the other side wild card line you're on the air uh, hello, Art. Hello, sir. Yeah, this is Roger. I'm calling from Kailua, Hawaii. Welcome. I listen to you quite often on KHVH. Yes, sir. And uh, I wanted to tell you something happened to me. Uh, I got my left leg broken. I was I decided to go fishing one day on my uh, day off. It was at the place we call the Marine Corps Air Station, Kaneohe. Right. It's on the east coast of uh, Oahu, Hawaii. And I was authorized to go in some areas where some people aren't. So what they have, they have a large volcano extinct volcano on the base. In the center of it is the, the Marine Corps rifle range. Well, I was on the left-hand side, or the uh, western side of the uh, range, uh, on the ocean side. And I had walked about a mile and a half from any uh, living quarters. You know, uh, there was any, wasn't anybody around me at all that, you know, that could see me. Right. And a, uh, there was a 35-year-old man and his 8-year-old son following me. They, they carried the lunch bag. I had my fishing pole, you know, buckets, stuff like that. And they were about 150 feet behind me and, well, about 15 feet up on a ridge. And they were just watching me and enjoying the scenery. And I got to this one area. I just decided to stop. I believe it, they used to uh, bury the Hawaiian kings and stuff around there. That's right. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm used to going out there, and I was really enjoying the scenery. I almost forgot about going fishing. And I was on this large, flat, black area about, it's, it's uh, what do you call lava rock? Right. It was flat, maybe 30 feet deep. I mean, you know, the width of it, and 150 feet long. And there was no green, wet moss or anything. It was just as dry as it could be. You could do jumping jacks or anything and never slip. <laughs> so I'm standing out there, really enjoying the scenery. And uh, all of a sudden, whack, my left leg goes flying up in the air. Uh, I'm standing up now and uh, just thinking about it because <laughs> it went above my eyesight, you know. Right. And I had this instant shock and pain, but my arms, you know, I spread my right arm out to the right, my left arm out to the left to hold my balance, and I gently went, fell down to the ground, you know, uh, using my right leg for balance. Meanwhile, my left leg is above my uh, my head, and boom, I hit the ground. So this man, the 35-year-old man, he comes running down the hill with his son over there and everything. He says, are you okay? Are you okay? And, you know, it took him about, oh, maybe two minutes to get to me. And I says, yeah, I'm fine. I says, I don't know what happened. He says, well, that was really a neat kung fu kick. He says, you do that often? I says, uh -huh. I says no. And he says, are you okay? You know, because I landed on my butt. And he says, wow, look at your leg. The back of your calf has a big footprint on it. Wow. And it was black. So anyway, and then my ankle started swelling up, and uh, there wasn't any, uh, well, we took a piece of driftwood or something, and he tied it up on my leg, and, and we had to walk a mile and a half back to my car. Well, it gets better because he what? took me to the uh, Marine Corps uh, uh, hospital there at the base, and I spent about two hours in there. They put a, a full cast on my left leg. But I had to explain <laughs> what to the doctor what happened. And right. it was a, a Navy ensign and a, two corpsmen. 
So they write it in the logbook, and then they type it up on their computer system, and they give me a printout. He says, I can't put this stuff on your log. <laughs> well, he did. He says, uh, you know what? I can't really leave this cast on you. It's an experimental cast. And he starts giving me this story. He says, I have to send you over to uh, Tripler Army Hospital, which is about 16 miles away. I know where it is. Yeah. And um, then it gets, okay, that was at 2.30 when my leg got broken. So this is now about 5.30 at night. They put me in an ambulance, send me over to Tripler, and I'm in there with a, a couple of Army sergeants and uh, an Army captain, and then the full bird colonel comes in, who would never come in. You know, like it was just a little thing as a broken leg, and he just asked everybody to please step aside, and he took complete charge of my leg. And he started to ask me all kinds of questions. So that was at five, oh, about 5.45 continued questioning me, and he says, well, you know what? We have to take this cast off because uh, it's an experimental one. What? He, so, oh, yes, sir. Yeah, he, he took the uh, whole cast off. Again? He long, he, yeah, he took this, uh, one of these power tools, you know. Bleh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> cast kind of thing. And, cast uh, on, cast and off. He continually kept on asking me all these questions. And then he starts out, he says, well, you know, what do you do for a living and all this stuff, you know, and, and what is some of your history? Not the things that a normal doctor would ask you. you know? Right. So I just have enough and hold up. I go back all the way back to when I'm a private all the way up to master sergeant. And uh, you see looking at me, kept looking at me. It got to be around 9 o'clock at night. So that's four hours of intensive. <laughs> and every, every and word. Right now I, your I, leg is ready to fall off. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, I'm laying on my stomach, and he goes in, and they're all taking pictures of it and everything. of the. Uh, the bruise by that time was nice and black and blue, and just the same shape as a, like somebody had hit it with a bare foot. Right. He says, okay, time to put them back together. So they come along with this cast, and I can remember right now when he put it on, you know, how the, this material just gets red hot as it's uh, solidifying on your leg. And it was the exact same material that they put on a Kaneohe. I says, wait a minute, you told me this was an experimental cast. I says, well, that was just to get you over here. We had to double-check everything. Uh, and I, oh, I, I don't know what it was that hit my leg, what it was that kicked me, <laughs> anything else. Uh, Sounded like they wondered what it was. Well, they were really wondering. And, you know, it's, to this day, I have no idea. But there was a, it was a clean break. My leg was broken half. You don't oh, my knee. broken in half. You don't. Uh, I appreciate the call. You don't hear about that very often. A severe physical manifestation from an encounter. You 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 don't hear about that very often. A clean broken leg by an unseen foot. <laughs> East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Art. Oh. Um, happy Hallow's Eve. Hallow's uh, Eve. And to you as well. I am Brian. Yes, Brian. Um, I'm calling from Jacksonville, Florida. I'm really from St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. Um, and I'd like to say hi to Ramona. Happy Halloween. Um, first time caller, long time listener, or I say first time caller, first time I've gotten through. Tried many a times. Never. And I feel blessed that I got through tonight. Yes, sir. Um, I have two real quick ghost stories, and I'll tie them together at the end real quick. Um, when I was a young child, we had a, an abandoned house it was in my neighborhood, and as young kids do, we used to go and explore. There was a shed, um, two-story garage attached to the house. And me and a young girlfriend at about the age of 11 rode our bikes about a mile down the road to get to the house. And we went up into the garage and was searching around. It was pretty much empty. There was a closet upstairs. And on the floor in the shed upstairs was some old, old, old newspapers. She picks up a newspaper and starts reading an article about how this man had taken a pitchfork and killed his entire family. Uh. As she's reading through this article, the door in this little closet upstairs uh. falls open, uh. being pushed open by a pitchfork. Oh. We lost it. Up, oh, we, were, yeah. we were out of there. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, uh, you know, bicycles move, move so fast. Pitchforks, we've all seen the movies. We know right, where they end up. Right. They, they end up in your chest. But I mean, giving you enough time to look down and see that you have been <laughs> stabbed by a pitchfork and you are now dying. 
I see. Yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, it was just, it was amazing because, I mean, this entire place was basically cleaned out other than these newspapers on the floor. And, I mean, what are the odds of a pitchfork being in the closet when you're reading this story? Slim and none. Slim and none. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the other story is my grandfather passed away. I grew up in a restaurant, opened in 1945, a family restaurant, lots of beans and chicken. Um, about two months after he passed away, I mean, my father were running the restaurant. I was in the restaurant working. I'm standing up at a butcher block table carving some beef, cutting a knuckle out of the side of beef. And out of the corner of my eye, I see my grandfather on his tippy toes, as he loved to be at the restaurant, peeking in a pot that was on the stove cooking boiling potatoes. Yes. Um, I looked, I seen him, I looked away. At that time, it hit me like, whoa, no. I looked back and he's gone, of course. Um, yes. But the way I tie these two stories together is that just seeing... What I have seen of, there have been many other incidents where I've seen ghosts and different things happen. Um, tying it all together it has given me a great peace in knowing that there is some sort of afterlife. There is some sort of spiritual life. That does seem to be the net effect of uh, having seen these things. It kind of ties things together for you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Buzz for the Rockies, you're on the air. We don't have a lot of time. Hi. Hi. Good morning, Art. Good morning. Jeremy from Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver, yes. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> This happened to a friend of mine in 1987 in Victoria. All right. You see? Um, she had moved into one of those beautiful old Victorian mansions there. And you know how the houses are divided up into suites? I do. Has their own suite. Sure. She had this wonderful clawfoot bathtub, which I had visited her. It was lovely. So she phoned me a few months later and said that um, you know, she takes a, a nice bubble bath every couple nights or so. <laughs> That she heard the girl next door. I guess the bathtubs are right up against each other in these kind of things. Right. And um, they do that. Of, they do that for yeah. the conv uh, convenience of plumbing. Yeah, and you know the walls are thin. Sure. And she heard her crying in there, um, sobbing about something. You know, maybe she thought she had broken up with her boyfriend or something. Never right. really thought anything of it. Right. Well, she has a bath every couple of days or so, and every time, you know, she'd have a bath, she'd hear her crying in there, and. This went on for about three, four nights. Um, when she started to take her baths, it'd get really cold in the room. Yes. And this was like four days went on, and a really bad smell started to come from the other side. And the smell got worse and worse. So oh, boy. She called the caretaker, and uh, the police got into the suite. Um, unfortunately, the girl had killed herself. She had slit her wrists and huh. neck in the bathtub. Right. But this really spooky thing about it was she had done it two weeks previously. She oh, my God. Oh, my, 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 my. And this is a true story. I don't know if anyone of them in Victoria is listening tonight. So Ease to the Rockies. Call toll-free 1-800-825-5033. And Heather didn't last too long in that apartment. She moved shortly after that. But true story. I uh, I remove the expletive, but I understand its use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, holy mackerel. Yeah. Uh, thank it's you. Disturbing. Thank you very much for okay. the, uh, the the call. And uh, that that expletive probably should have remained in because it was contextual. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> to hear the moaning, perhaps a plea. For the body to be discovered and to uh, to hear that after the person had been dead for that long. I don't know. Well, you have now experienced ghost to ghost AM. Maybe you're an inch or two farther along the way. You know, and understanding that there really is something on the other side, because there is. If you have not personally experienced it, then if you only believe a small portion of what you've heard tonight, that, that should be enough. Anyway, that's how we do it. I'm Art Bell. Riders on the storm. Riders on the storm. Into this house we're born.